morning, everyone. I see there are still people joining very slowly, but we scheduled scheduled the program for nine. So we'll just start. Exactly. We will start with the rules of how to proceed in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, using the, the the Zoom platform. So the first suggestion we we had just an uh, example of what can happen when ma multiple microphones are are open at the same time. Your mic went off. You have to open it again. Okay, somehow exactly I also experienced some problems. Anyway, uh, please keep your mic off whenever uh, whenever you're not speaking. And also we advise to keep your camera on when you want to speak or when you will be uh, you will be exactly speaking. So otherwise, otherwise it should be off and due to a connection which somehow is not uh, perfect. Um, I think that what's also important is that we, when we do the sessions, we will have all of the presentations and questions at the end of those sessions collectively. So already during the, the discussion, during the presentations, you're welcome to put your questions into the chat box. So we can either read those or you can uh, read, read or, or tell those questions by yourselves uh, after, afterwards, but not during the, the sessions. Okay, and I think that these are the main main uh, points regarding uh, the Zoom. And uh, uh, officially welcome everybody uh, once again. And I give uh, the floor to to Paula. Paula Pisitelli, please. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, we are very excited of having you today after a wonderful start that we had yesterday. So it was wonderful to see all you here and also attending the conference via YouTube. Uh, somehow technology helps and also made us reach many people all over the world, which was one of the intention of the network since the beginning and it was allowed by uh, having a conference via Zoom. Uh, we would like you to interact a bit more maybe in through the chat and through the uh, in Zoom and through YouTube uh, comments uh, because this way we can uh, make the discussion a bit more vib vibrant. I'm sure that we're learning a lot. Uh, it's happening to me uh, and to my, my colleagues too. Yesterday, we started with this uh, wonderful keynote lecture delivered by uh, one of our funders, uh, Professor Marcello Balbo and Jimena de la Barra. Uh, I love when she said that um, uh, what's happening today uh, uh, is that uh, capitalism and neoliberalism uh, change, que uh, change um, questions uh, when we know the answers and that was a wonderful way to frame the present moment. We got bad news that somehow we, uh, we knew already, but at the same time uh, there are new certainties uh, that we have to cope with. Uh, for example, the fact that development by dispossession doesn't work that individualism fails, uh, that we have to react to heat through solidarity, and that we need to um, create a sort of new vocabulary based on new concepts from post-colonial um, approaches. And uh, these were somehow also uh, resonating in uh, uh, Marcello Balbo's argument about the way uh, in which he reframed the title of our conference, how to plan in a, a world of uncertainty. He said, the issue here now is how to plan in uncertainty for certainties, for the slight certainties that we have. And this is the point. Uh, this is something that uh, we, we, I think we will keep discussing today. Uh, uh, we will keep discussing about it today. Uh, we also had wonderful um, sessions, uh, starting from uh, uh, the learning panel, uh, 
uh, with uh, with wonderful um, practices coming from uh, from um, many cases all over the world. And I will leave the comment about uh, the the session to uh, Jakub again. So maybe very just really briefly, not to consume too much time. It was a very nice, a very nice panel which was coordinated by our, our colleagues. Uh, Fanasi Sorangiani from with Vaterstrand University and Lucas Elsner from Technical University of Berlin, uh, and we had presenters uh, from uh, concentrating on cases in uh, Latin America and Africa, South Africa and uh, Nigeria. Uh, so we could we, we could if if there was a way to wrap up those, those very rich presentations in, in in just a couple of minutes, we could say that the first three. That they had a connecting point that they looked at, at really the colonial approaches in, in pedagogies and linking, uh, linking uh, to the cooperation directly with with uh, uh, with communities, either either with uh, uh, let's say involvement of of students uh, or directly researchers researchers and uh, and local local communities. So so. Uh, these were all very interesting uh, in that terms because they a little bit reoriented reoriented uh, us towards towards seeing how how uh, learning process can in a way prepare for uncertainties because it's rooted in the in the local practices and local uh, local uh, knowledge and the um, fourth presentation from Nigeria was also also very interesting it more looked at the at specific tools which are uh, technologically elaborated and the role in curricula uh, and focusing on uh, on the way they can actually uh, help students to interact with different different sort of audiences and the uh, session number 2 was more on experimenting, so we wanted to have this transition from from learning, which also involves experimenting, to see if this this resonates also in uh, actual actual interventions or living labs or projects that that happen all around the world. The session was coordinated by uh, Dr. Oliver La and um, uh, Lander Bosch from UN Habitat, who replaced uh, Debashish uh, last minute. Uh, and also, uh, very very briefly, if we could somehow uh, relate to the to the presentations, we had a, a very interesting uh, inputs from uh, six different uh, contexts, and, and uh, we could say that the first first two more looked more broadly on on you know systemic systemic approaches to fighting with. Uh, uh, first, first three actually systemic approaches to fight with uh, climate change through through redevelopment of uh, urban uh, environment, and it was case of a river, case of uh, of uh, parks, uh, a case of uh, of a more dense historic uh, city center in in Cyprus. So the, those those the, those presentations took more a little bit uh, perspective like that, looking looking on long term uh, processes. Then we had a nice presentation about electrification of of uh, vehicles uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Kenya, uh, and it took different angle a little bit because it looked specifically at at how a technology which which uh, somehow might might be seen as as uh, you know very northern and focused on individual people was used in public sector and uh, and. Um, uh, it was used by the actors which are considered normally informal uh, and uh, operate with little resources. Then we moved to, to the uh, two final presentations, which, which also took a little bit different angle and they were, uh, uh, they were uh, really, uh, really shifting perspective, perspective on experimenting and, and uh, uncertainties because uh, they looked at the spaces which are uh, somehow not necessarily, uh, you know, they are multifunctional and they have different functions over the time. So the first presentation looked at, at non-human perspective in using uh, a space and uh, related this to question of aesthetics. And the, the, the last one, uh, last presentation by Beatrice Balducci uh, also referred to a, to a concept of using, using a space which can have a, one function uh, for events of, 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 uh, of disasters. So, uh, this was maybe uh, we don't have time to to speak more about that, but it was also really nice going across across different different approaches and different 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 uh, views on on how to analyze uh, 
uncertainties and and uh, our responses to those. Okay, I will pass now to Paola. Yes, thank you, Kuba. And then we entered into the last uh, session of uh, yesterday's day, and it was about collaborating that we yesterday also explained that we had so much entries in particular for this session that we had to split this in two. So they uh, were very much framed this idea of collaborating related with co-production and also with commenting, which will be today. And yesterday we uh, made the entire session about collaborating for environment, but uh, because we learned very much that a lot of our colleagues are working with this understanding of we have to collaborate to understand better how to, let's say, methodologically also deal with uh, climate change, climate proof um, development. And so the, the, the entire session was very much based on, on different uh, understanding of methods to work with communities to obtain more local knowledge, but on the other side also to understand, uh, for example, how do we deal with big data that we obtain also from, uh, let's say, mainstreamings and, and, and climate change analysis uh, coming from geographies, for example, or just analysis to somehow also bring this down and to, to develop um, tools or even to um, be able to do a research related with this data and this was um, I think very interesting because there we already <clears throat> understand that um, we we are already when we are talking about uh, let's say collaboration we we entered already a lot in our <clears throat> uh, discipline in uh, in the planning disciplines we entered already a lot and this was also one of the comments that we obtained yesterday from the uh, the both sessions uh, moderator, which uh, one of them was uh, Professor Anna Duran uh, <clears throat> from uh, Quito, and the other one was uh, Dr. Josefine Fogdal from the University of Stuttgart, who said that it was really incredible how much really people and our scholars, but also in different communities, we can understand that collaboration for the next crisis that we also learned yesterday that will come, which will be climate change or is still, or let's say it's already going on this crisis, but we can already learn a lot what from what we are learning from the COVID crisis, the actual one for what is coming and for an even bigger crisis, which will be climate change. And therefore, I think this was uh, very interesting. Um, the entries were from um, all over the world, I would say. We had from Europe uh, presentations and we had also from uh, Latin America presentations. So it was a very mixed up and also even from Asia, we, we started even with one presentation uh, related with a micro um, analysis and, and, and micro um, research on, on uh, different uh, urban developments. Uh, very much related also with the issue of, um, let's say, co-production in terms of how do you do you work with these communities in themselves. And I think this was um, the session three, and then we entered into the roundtable discussion, which I believe that what we was really for us astonishing to learn, I have to say, how much already a lot of what we are discussing here in, in uh, let's say, in academia, is already practice of uh, those projects that, which were with us. We had yesterday a, a panel presentation besides our colleague from the UCL, Barbara Lipitz, and also from uh, um, from the Ritz University. Oh, um, from Lagos. From Lagos, exactly. Um, the, it, we had uh, two colleagues also, and or let's say two scholars and uh, also two practitioners with us. One was uh, Dorothea Kallenberger explaining us how they are trying to localize and, and to bring down the, the uh, new urban agenda which was apparently signed down in Quito. And now she's working in this project and uh, to try to understand how she can this really do in implementing it with uh, lots of it thoughts i would say in, in in methods itself and uh so we got there the entire vocabulary that we are somehow doing research on she is somehow dealing with that and is trying to understand how what are the pitfalls but what are those also the challenges and, and it was i think very positive to to understand that um she's saying that 
there is even more will to collaborate actually and uh, so that there is a lot of knowledge actually going on and i would think and maybe kuba you you can add to this discussion yeah. yesterday which was very intense i would say and, and very beautiful yeah, i think that i think that that also we we talk on two levels so we talk talk exactly broadly broad, broadly about crises but then we zoomed in into into current context how how it affects uh, the the work of our panelists and it was it was somehow interesting that uh, on one hand side it seems that everybody's more or less <laughs> of course tired 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 because of those conditions but then uh, all, many opportunities arise because of it so uh, especially for for uh, academia, for 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 University of Lagos, and uh, represented by Taibat Lawanson, and for for Barbara Lipitz, she ma they mentioned that um, some some of the uh, you know some some of the car current situation uh, pushes them to really intermediate between the municipality and communities. So they they take that role, for instance, by by uh, you know using the virtual uh, digital tools, uh, mappings, and so on and so forth. So they actually that 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 pushes them to to uh, to somehow even take a stronger. They they did have this role before, but take a very stronger role in advocacy and supporting uh, communities which which might not have access to resources or or need help. But also, I think uh, Rene pointed out that 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 kind of still uh, routines may be may be uh, kind of the same. Uh, that uh, he sees a need for more intervention of a state uh, in those kind of situations or city that it's 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 too absent and not held accountable. That was my impression uh, from from his uh, from his input. Uh, but then overall. Uh, Overall, I think that uh, that they were both at the end of the discussion. There was both po positive positive message and and maybe a little bit more pes 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 pessimistic. Uh, but <laughs> perhaps it was also my addition that that I was wondering uh, I was wondering whether uh, you know all of all of what we had to do now you know openness even in this conference we see so many people can participate thanks to thanks to that. I wondered if it will if it will last how long it will last and you know whether people would continue to do virtual conferences or are actually traditional conferences in the future where there will be a mixed experience so maybe i was a bit more pessimistic but 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 others seems that say that there's lots of takeaways for future and uh, perhaps we will function in, in this kind of mixed mixed models of 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 uh, virtual actual uh, events activities and, and uh, We'll learn a lot from what's happening. Yes, and um, we ended up then yesterday with this, uh, which I I believe it's a perfect entry also of the day what we have now for today or the program that we have for today. It was this uh, the question of scaling up. So how do we ensure what we have learned? and where we understand that there are still a lot of topics um, where it is still very challenging or it is a challenge in itself to work with uncertainty or maybe where even this uh, uncertain terrain is even increasing, right? Because the conditions in itself are still very complicated. And um, this are also why we framed today the um, the, the day that we will talk about an, a very important topic of inhabiting, it will be of uh, housing in itself. So how do we ensure, let's say, housing rights and how do we um, ensure, let's say, uh, the possibility also to um, somehow overcome market forces by this understanding of collaboration in itself. Then we will also enter in... Um, to the fourth uh, session, which will, re uh, will be related also with policy making, and how do we there also can learn um, what kind of role research and, and policy can do together so that uh, we can somehow um, learn from each other, but also understand what are the needs, which uh, still needs to uh, be required, uh, needs to be covered. And then we will enter into the last session for today, which is on mobility. And in particular, it 
also calls up to reflect on the aspect of the personal mobility. We are talking here about uh, eviction. Uh, we are talking about also the crisis, which uh, of course is affecting, as we know, uh, in, in, in the more vulnerable uh, parts of, uh, let's say, different urbanizations. And therefore, um, the tendencies of um, mobility, of eviction, or of, let's say, migration are even increasing. And this will be also then the last part of uh, our day to day, and then to enter into uh, then our final round and then our wrap up from the, uh, the entire day and the conference in itself. So I am looking to my colleagues if uh, they would like to mention. Maybe maybe what we should mention also that, that this is kind of a last day of a program, but we're still continuing today with some book presentations, uh, project presentations uh, in the morning. And then I believe, I uh, don't remember, so at 11, uh, we start uh, Nair's meeting. Uh, when we will want to select new steering committee for the for the next three years, and uh, as as it as it functions in Nairus, it is a meeting which is open for for everybody to join. So it's not only for Nairus member; everybody can become a Nairus member and join join this meeting and also reflect on the conference. So so I think that's important to mention that it should be quite interesting, and and, and we hope we hope to see people around. Yes, I think everything was said already. Time is up for a long day waiting for us. Uh, are we going to launch the, the video that we showed uh, yesterday already of the University of Berlin where apparently this is happening? You can refer to the YouTube for this, right, Paula? Yes, I'm also hearing here from the colleagues. Are we going to show the video? talking with us to help us somehow to to keep this thing going because i mean we all know that have done zoom videos that it, it requires also a lot of technical facilities and also understanding on that so firstly i would like to thank this um, local um, let's say team uh, Peter Fischer, Arthur Schmock, uh, Nikolaus Potlaha, Johanna Westermann, Carlos uh, and also Vincent, who are with us, and Josefa, that are making this possible, actually, to, to have this conference on uh, making this videos and also making this noises, actually, that you maybe possibly can hear while I'm talking. Then I would also like to thank the university itself ho to host us, Philip Misewitz, who helped us yesterday to frame uh, the, the, let's say, the, the local conditions of uncertainty also that we have here in our city, actually uh, also very much affected by pandemia that you will also see in the video that we will present to you. Then, of course, um, I would like to thank, or we would like to thank the reviewers from uh, our colleagues from the network itself, who has revised a lot of uh, entries that we obtained uh, for the different sessions in itself. I think we obtained something like uh, 60 abstracts or 70 abstracts even um, for this conference. Then um, I would like to thank, of course, the panelists which have, which have been yesterday with us, but also will be today with us, who are in particular people who are coming from the practice and are delivering a bit time for us and are also entering into this kind of 
logic which Naedos has to to be very international and be, and be also very interdisciplinary. So we are talking here about architects to geographers. So a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, <clears throat> critical masses here. So this is uh, also something that it's very important to, to point out that uh, we are learning a lot from those colleagues. And then um, I would also like Cities Alliance for uh, the support that they give us uh, on, on our ongoing project about uh, research policy interfaces for more equitable urban development or for more equitable um, growth in, in, in different uh, cities that we are undertaking actually with them so that they helped us even to get in contact with different networks like uh, Redeus Lack from Latin America. We will have today a representative. Uh, Professor Margarita Green will be with us and uh, we are also working with the Audi network uh, that we will also have Warren Smith with us later on. So this is also something that uh, is for us very important that we obtain the support to work among scholars in uh, different uh, parts of the world and therefore thank you very much. So. I think on that note, also, we should mention the uh, V2B Unilag, which is also a network of, of uh, three universities cooperating with uh, AURI and AAPS. And they supported uh, Nairus in the development of a new website, which is st still in the process of development. You will, you will see it, it will be ready, <laughs> fully ready in coming weeks, but also we, it's great to, we really appreciate that, that support. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, we will now show the video for those ones who could not see this yesterday. And uh, I mean, it's a pity that we cannot be here in Berlin, but maybe this can show you somehow some, uh, um, let's say, situations that we are actually having in the city in, in this um, context of pandemia. Afterwards, we do small breaks that we will do also during the whole day so that we can somehow also rest a little bit and and, and walk around and, and enter into the next session. So the video and then uh, we make a break and then we start with the second part of uh, the session on collaboration, the session number three. But, but I think the video was already shown, right? Uh, no, no, the link to the video is gonna is in the, in the chat and it's going to start now. So please refer to the YouTube link which I copied in the past, in the chat, sorry. See you in a while back here. Enjoy. Nächste Station, Hackischer Markt. 
Achtung, Türen können automatisch öffnen. Okay, so one minute and one minute and we're gonna start. So take a little break and we're gonna be here at 9.35 for the first session, which is uh, cooperation.
Hello to everybody. Now we are back and um, I would like to enter into the session number three, which is about um, co-producing and commoning. And I would like for this firstly to welcome our session panelist Dagmar Pelger from Berlin and Luz, Luz Maria Vergara d'Alençon from Delft, I guess, and uh, also from uh, Horacio Torrent, Professor Torrent, who is with us, who will also uh, discuss with us after the session uh, what are the views that we also can obtain from the session for the ongoing research project uh, DFK CoproInt that um, we are also creating this session. And so these are the, the three, let's say, uh, people who will be now um, guiding you through this session. And um, I would therefore like also to officially welcome you, firstly. And secondly, I would also like to introduce you. And I would like to start with Dagmar Pega. So Dagmar Pega, welcome, <laughs> is an architect and researcher at the TU Berlin, Chair for Urban Design and Urbanization, and uh, from the Hart CU Hamburg. Actually, Dagmar is also uh, working here uh, at the UDK University. Her focus in Berlin, her focus is on cartography, spatial commons, and co-design and urbanization process, and is also defining her involvement in co-op disco, a planning and design practice for common good oriented spatial developments based in Berlin. She taught critical cartography at the Hafen City University at Hamburg uh, from 2017 to 2019, architecture design at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology uh, from 2013 to 2016, did research on landscape transformations at Ghent University from 2009 to 2012, at uh, the Akademie einer, einer neuen Gruppiostadt of uh, the, the chair related uh, here with the Technical University and on regional future scenarios for Karlsruhe to, in, uh, for 2030 at the University of Karlsruhe. She's uh, trained as an architect in Karlsruhe and Delft. She worked at Kafir de Gate, Barco Leibinger and Christian Keres Architects before she co-founded the studio start there in Brussels and joining a co-opt disco, a cooperative planning practice based here in Berlin. Then we also have with us uh, Dr. Luz Maria Vergara d'Alençon. Uh, Maria uh, Luz Maria Vergara uh, is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Management in the Built Environment at TU Dell. Her PhD focused on the role of civil society organizations in supporting low-income homeowners to improve the management of their condominium housing. She's an architect and holds a Master of Science in Architecture from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Luz Maria was born in Chile and resides in the, in the Netherlands since 2014. Throughout her professional career, she has performed functions in architectural design, independent consultancy, research and teaching. Her research interests are related to housing challenges in the Global South, with spatial attention to the role of civil society organizations in the context of deprived neighborhoods and social vulnerability. She is interested in understanding how social requirements can be incorporated in housing urban or urban design processes and management services through participatory and collaborative methods. Then we also have uh, Professor Horacio Torrent with us, who is an architect from the National University at Rosario, Argentina, Magister in Architecture from the, from the Pontificia uh, Universidad Católica de Chile, a PhD from the National University in Rosario, uh, studied uh, conservation and restoration at the UNESCO and Argentinian Council for Monument and Sites Program in 1985, and at the Social Science Postgraduate Program of the Latin American Faculty of Social Science, Flaxo in Buenos Aires. 
1987, Aria Fellowship in 1997, Scholar of the International Institute for Canadian Studies in 1999. He has developed research, uh, he has developed research on modern architecture at the Canadian Centre for Architecture, at the Getty Institute for Arts and Humanities at the National Gallery of Arts in Washington, and as a Gastwissenschaftler at the Ibero-Amerikanisches Institut here in Berlin has taught at the UN, in universities in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Mexico, and lectured in Canada, USA, China, Colombia, Peru, Germany, Portugal, and Spain. He worked as PNU, UNESCO consultant on restoration of monuments, is currently a tenured professor of architecture at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, founding member and president of Docomomo Chile. He organized the international meeting on modern heritage and best practices, sustainability, conservation, management and architecture design in Santiago in 2018. I'm very honored to have all this incredible great people with us today. So I leave you the floor for this session and thank you very much to take this time in particular also from Horacio who is live connected from Santiago the Chile with us with uh, four hours uh, ahead of us. So thank you very much for this. Paula, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, also in the name of my colleagues, Luz Vegara D'Alonso and Horacio Torrent for your introduction. Um, very, very wide and broad. Thank you very much. I think we we feel well presented. I guess. Um, yeah, let's let's start uh, the second, uh, third uh, session around um, yeah the urban practice of cooperation. Maybe you could uh, yeah summarize these two like that. Uh, yesterday we learned already a lot, and today we go on. And uh, as I'm lucky to be one of the few. Uh, physically present persons in Berlin, I maybe would like to open the session with a little um, yeah, uh, introduction for, for the audience, for the participants of the session uh, on uh, yeah, a, a certain view on Berlin, maybe. Um, yeah, we learned yesterday morning already from uh, Marcello Balbo um, that the question is uh, very much uh, for who? the co-production and resilience. He referred it to especially resilience. And I would like to pick up on that and ask with whom. Uh, so I think if we have now the, the presentations to come, this would be one of the guiding questions. And I hope that we learn more about this um, uh, with whom. So in Berlin, um, there is, uh, yeah, as, as in many other cities, quite a movement developing, which you uh, could interpret as, uh, yeah, practices of commoning and um, it's, uh, it's a cooperative practice which is focusing more and more on uh, cooperation between civil society and uh, especially the local uh, governments. Berlin is organized in 12 uh, boroughs districts, it's a city state. And uh, the certain uh, or the different uh, movements to try to fight for a more just city uh, in Berlin are very much focused on this consensus actually that we have to find modes to have uh, a cooperation between the the movement from 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 the city the civil uh, the civil society and the local governments so actually to find a detour around a very much market driven for example housing production but also urban space production and another very important point i think from yesterday was the notion uh, i think Jimena de la barre talked about it but also anna duran after the third session yesterday that it's a matter of uh, yeah providing resources so the question is uh, if there's cooperation with what kind of resources and i think there the, the state or the local government comes again uh, into uh, yeah into question and uh, has to be challenged. And I would like to end with uh, yeah a very current uh, movement in Berlin. There is an initiative on the city level, so not in the local government, but really like the government uh, of Berlin is addressed by this initiative. 
They are organizing a referendum. The initiative is called Deutsche Wohnen und Co. Enteignen. And it's quite exciting because they claim for the city level of Berlin to expropriate the real estate companies. Uh, you can also call them real estate groups. That's a very new uh, wording in this context. Uh, to expropriate uh, real estate companies which uh, have a property of more than 3,000 dwellings. And this initiative managed to collect 77,000 votes last year. And uh, they entered a, a second phase within this process. And the next um, challenge is to, uh, to have actually 170,000 votes. And if this goes through, then the government of Berlin would be uh, forced to work on a law for the socialization of uh, these companies. And maybe as a background information in Berlin, between 1990 and 2009, 220,000 dwellings were privatized out of a pool of 480,000. So approximately half of them. And uh, a, a comparable number of apartments shall be um, uh, yeah, re-socialized, you could say. And uh, yeah, this this as a kind of insight into uh, one of the um, yeah, many uh, processes or also struggles going on in Berlin uh, as some kind of context for our session. And I think that with this example of, of a certain uh, mode of commoning, I would like to uh, open the floor for our participants. We have uh, people from uh, very different um, areas of the world and I think that we start with Giuseppe Faldi, Axel Fischer, and Luisa Moretto from Brussels. You are there? Yes, I see. Yes, it's me. Cool. Um, yeah, um, I think we should stick to the seven minutes to have time for okay. questions afterwards, as Jakob introduced it. So, yes, uh, good luck with this. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to do my best. Uh, yeah, we are, sure. we are looking forward. Okay, I share my screen. Let's see if it's, can you see it? Do you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So, okay, I will remove this. Sorry, how can I remove this? Okay, so thank you very much for this opportunity and, and thank you very much for this organization. My name is Giuseppe uh, Faldi and I work as postdoctoral researcher at the ULB in Brussels. So in this brief presentation, I want to give you some insight about the characters and challenge and outcomes of place-based approach to emerging planning and urban design issue in Sub-Saharan Africa. These reflections uh, comes from an introductory study we have developed for a book that I'm editing in collaboration with Luisa Moretto and Axel Fischer and that is about to be published in a few months. And the book is the result of a conference on the topic of place space that we have organized in Addis Ababa in the end of 2018. And this book draws on empirical studies, uh, empirical approaches and different disciplinary uh, perspective from a wide range of panels. You can see the, uh, here the, uh, the table of contents from both South and North and studies are collected to investigate urban design and comprehensive planning experiences covering a wide range of environment from small town up to larger cities. So what we did in the study, basically on the basis of this approach or, or this contribution, we have explored what place-based approach may practically look like in the African urban context with the aim of contributing uh, to define new theoretical and practical comprehension of such approach. So just to, to, to give you a very little background on why we focus on place-based. So in recent, in recent decades, we, we have seen African cities have experienced the profound mm -hmm. tra uh, uh, transformations and, and notwithstanding their specificities, uh, they display some some common challenge from the uh, from the colonial inheritance of poverty to the weak institutions <laughs> of governance, the growing social spatial polarization, and inequality in spatial planning, 
So, and most of the current evidence show that inability of the dominant planning approach to cope with this challenge and to understand these complexities. And the positivistic conceptualization of a uh, city as a self-contained entity has been strongly questioned in recent years. And since it reveals at the, at the very basis of the uh, uh, topic gap between the planning and implementation. So a growing literature belonging to African studies is strongly requesting a new alternative approach that can look at reality and, and can challenge its preconceived interpretation of African urbanity. So for example, we, are, we put some uh, example of scholars that stress the need for an approach that uh, more focus on the ordinary citizens or that steering chain from the bottom up or that uh, negotiating local and external knowledge or for endogenous uh, development or pro poor inclusive approach, et cetera. So all these scholars basically stress the need for deeper focus on place in planning and design and a deeper connection between place and differences and, uh, and the role of multiple culture in shaping, in, in producing a situated knowledge as Watson, as defined by Watson. And, 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 and notwithstanding this, uh, this increasing sensitivity to, to this bottom-up local play space, uh, still uh, there is a clear resistance of mainstream practices to these play space outcomes. And moreover, it is not yet clear, there is not a clear understanding of what, the, uh, th uh, what are the theoretical and practical characters of this play space approach and what the applicability and challenge of the, of the applicability. So what uh, uh, we did in this introductory study of the book, so through the uh, literature review and um, and the comprehensive reading of our uh, empirical studies in the book, so we have defined five main uh, elements of this place-based approach, which are the value of the place, not only as a physical, but uh, also the social cultural one, uh, entity, your uh, equilibrium, of course, and the inclusion of multiple knowledge in and the system of meanings, the implementation of play space through a direct uh, I mean, participation and collaboration of person or not, and the objective of democratization and empowerment of a play space approach and the leadership role of institution for successful play space. I'm not going uh, um, and through the uh, uh, the study, we have deepened and we have characterized all of these five elements. You can get the uh, the characters and, and outcomes and challenge. I'm not going through all of these. Of course, there is no time. But I, I just want to focus on the third one, which is uh, is about collaboration, which is more like with the session of uh, of this conference session. So going very fast to the sorry for the slide, but it's the last one. So um, most of um, of the contribution from the book uh, uh, allow us to identify some main points related to the uh, uh, to the question of of collaboration in place based practice and uh, uh, here I just put one point about the centrality and limitation of collaborative actions we also study for example the issue of methods as um at the way of uh, is implemented actually so uh uh, I take the example of two cases, book cases like th the first one from Jeanette Lem, who explored the potential and limits of, of community-based practice to adapt to urban flooding in Dar es Salaam. And the second one from, and from Federico Monica, who explored the role of informality in Freetown by focusing on the potential and benefits that slums can bring to the whole urban system by taking a bit of provocative perspective. So. Uh, first point I want to raise about the collaboration is about uh, the potential of self-based practices, both ch and both chapters. In both chapters, and the place-based approach emerges as self-based initiatives of communities to cope with a problem, and often due to a lack of support from the public. So, place-based initiatives can provide these internal capacities by creating and shaping networks, which are crucial for. Uh, accessing resource and mutual support. Second point that you, I want to raise is about the role in, at pitfalls of informality. So in both chapters, informality provides a platform of actions that were to create these capacities and networks where 
a different type of knowledge uh, 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 is developed and should be recognized in a place-based approach. However, and place-based initiatives can provide, sorry, uh, informal practices and might contribute to ignore and problems and relate to lack of service and pollution. If we take a too romantic perspective of informality, and also there is the risk of exclusion of inhabitants on the margin of dominant social groups. Another point that I want to touch is about the challenge of participation. So on one, uh, uh, and when uh, the articulation of place-based practice with formal planning approach and studies stress that could be a gaps between formal level of participation and the way in which participation and operates in practice. And as involvement of community might be considered as a justification for government in order not to assume costs and responsibilities for service provision, then uh, other studies have focused on the more institutional form of collaboration between public authorities and citizens, that is uh, service co-production. For example, the chapter from uh, Jean-Pierre Guillotobosi will explore the motivation of communities uh, to, to, to co-produce wash services in the periphery of Kinshasa uh, under the umbrella of a, a governmental program. Stress uh, the, um, I would say, um, uh, show that the extent to which this co-production can contribute to building consensus and ensuring impacts is is dependent on on a real point of motivation to participate in collaborative actions and for critical aspects emerge in particular first a mixture of material expressive and solidarity motivation at different levels so at the levels of the citizens and levels of the institutions as an engine for co-production and the issue of trust of citizen trust to institution appears as fundamental in this context. And also the protection of personal interests to uh, encourage citizens to engage in collective action. And lastly, I want to stress that uh, institution interest in creating synergies and providing incentives is fundamental to put in operation this place-based approach and strengthen this collaboration. So thank you. I, I, I think my time is over, and uh, if you want to go more in detail, I will happy to do that in the Q and A. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very, very much, uh, you, Giuseppe, you. for being here. The topic about place-based uh, urban planning. Uh, so now I would like to give the floor Stop to. Um, sure. yeah, okay, great. So I now. The time. I mean. Yes. Yes. Okay. No. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. I would like to give the floor now to our next presentation. So please, Andrea Rigon. Uh, okay, great. So the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Um, let me share it. I hope you can see uh, my presentation now. And can you hear me properly, right? Yes. Perfect. Yes. So, um, Urban infrastructure intervention in poor urban settlements in the global south assume that all residents have similar aspirations and needs. However, these localities are some of the most unequal settlements and intervention creates winners and losers. And this paper argues that interventions have to take different dimensions of diversity into consideration through an intersectional and relational participatory planning approach. We all have multiple simultaneous identities, such as gender, class, race, ethnicity, citizenship, legal status, age, ability, sexuality, etc. And some of these are individual and others are collective. And they are fluid and in constant change. And the fundamental way to understand how these identities shape different experiences, needs, and aspirations is the concept of intersectionality. Intersectionality is how the combination and intersection of multiple dimensions of identity create unique experiences of oppression and discrimination. And different aspects of individual and collective social identities play a crucial role in social processes shaping life chances. And the relationship between these different identities are intertwined with power. There are consolidating hierarchies and power relations among these identities, which makes them relational. This includes relations 
between men and women, black and white people, etc. And these unequal relations between identities contribute to inequalities and marginalization processes. But these identities and the relationship between them change in different contexts and over time, which means that they are not natural, but they are social constructs which we can deconstruct. Therefore, addressing this inequality requires a relational and intersectional approach focused on transforming power relations that are at the core of social identities, making the recognition of diversity a political process. And these were the considerations that underpin uh, the co-design process that I'm going to explain later in Barelias uh, in Lebanon. And, the, and we will explain how these considerations were directly addressed with the participant in the project. The other fundamental element is the heterogeneity of poor urban neighborhoods. Over the past three decades, there has been a push for community participation approaches to design urban interventions. However, community participation tends to build on an image of a homogeneous community. The internal inequalities and power relations stemming from different identities do not allow all the residents to raise their interest in these processes. And these community participatory approaches often lead to the portrayal of specific elite interests as the community interests. And interventions are portrayed as being equally beneficial to all uh, members. And the intersectional critique deconstructs simplified collective approaches that deny a plurality of experiences, needs, and aspirations. And working in this context requires recognize, recognizing how people frame their struggles strategically through collective political identities, but at the same time, acknowledging diversity within. And uh, uh, practice has to deal with what my colleague uh, Vanessa Castambrotto and I in a forthcoming book called The Identity Paradox. And this is that the engagement with collective identities enable political mobilizations. However, at the same time, those collective identities are fundamentally predicated on the control of people's aspirations and actions. And we propose a definition of identity, of community identity as a moving target, emphasizing both the fluidity of identity and the simultaneity of multiple identities. And an intersectional approach is a means to engage with the dynamic understanding of identity, its constraints and potential. People continuously reimagine themselves and build their identities within the messiness of life. However, an overall emphasis on fluidity may overlook what are the sediments of identity as they manifest within system of oppressions. So intersectionality points to precisely this challenge that identities are never entirely apprehended, nor they are entirely flexible. And uh, the participatory special intervention I'm going to talk about in Barelias in Lebanon tested the new approach in which refugees and host communities could work together to design infrastructural intervention that would address the vulnerability of all residents. And Lebanon is the country hosting the highest number of refugees per capita worldwide, about a quarter of the population. And this town uh, was a town where the influx of refugees has put pressure on public services, and the town has witnessed rapid transformation in response to the needs of different communities. We recruited seven citizen scientists and 12 other residents, Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese, women and men, young and old. And after training, the main activity was a participatory design workshop. The main location for the intervention was the main entrance road to the town. And through different methodologies, participants study their context and its vulnerabilities, reflected on the principle underpinning potential interventions and the impact of any changes on different individuals and groups and on the relationship between them. And they build collective visions highlighting the differences, but at the same time identifying how special solutions could address the vulnerability while simultaneously get closer to their collective visions. And we have presented details of the methodologies in a report and in a two parts documentary, which is available freely online. And you can just email me for that if you are interested. And the proposed intervention were shared and discussed in public exhibitions at different stages and then built by the local residents and contractors. Uh, the final intervention including public space for gathering, the area contains play futures for children and art, benches and trees were added, the sidewalk is 60 centimeters high in some places, so ramps were added, 
uh, speed bumps installed, uh, floor games were painted on, on the sidewalks, a park uh, was rehabilitated. And there are two intertwined ways in which the intervention transforms social relations through the impact of the physical interventions and through the social process of co-design uh, itself. Uh, many interventions were made to create an environment where all felt able to participate. The design workshop and the overall process created a disruptive space of freedom for participants, as well as uh, of personal transformation, which for the first time, Lebanese, Syrians, Palestinians of different age groups, genders, education level and class were able to work together as equals. A woman revealed for the first time that she felt she was not just a mother, but that her voice was considered to carry the same weight as that of others participants. Also, the project hired women in the construction process, disrupting a sector dominated by men. And for Syrians, the process allowed them to become part of the town by contributing to shaping it and to some extent exercising agency and urban citizenship. This created a feeling of inclusion, but it was also a means for them to reciprocate for the hospitality they had received. And participants realized that the intervention for most vulnerable can also benefit less vulnerable groups, thus being a win-win solution. So one of the ways we, to deal with internal conflict and different priorities was to explicitly focus on the most vulnerable. And the physical intervention converted the public space into a social space, breaking barriers across nationality, gender, and age. This road was the only public space used by all people from all nationality in a town with strong spatial segregation. And in October 2019, Lebanon faced a wave of unprecedented social protest that spread across the country. And this infrastructure created through the participatory intervention became the focal point of the protests in Barelias. So the participatory process had created the infrastructure for the revolution. And the experience of Barelias showed that an intersectional relational participatory design approach not only contributes to the design of infrastructures that respond to the residents' needs, but it can also transform social relations and more importantly, can build a human infrastructure able to negotiate and activate important change processes while diffusing social tension. Such an approach is especially important in unequal and conflictual settings. It can create an urban citizenship, a participatory citizenship born out of the community building element of the participatory design. And such citizenship is able to reduce social tensions and build new solidarities between different groups while constructively engaging with authorities. It is the exercise of this urban participatory citizenship that enhances the agency of all residents by breaking invisible social and spatial borders that segregate society across a number of identities. Thank you very much. And some of this stuff is in, uh, in an upcoming book that I've just advertised there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea Rigon, for, for these insights into a participatory planning approach in Lebanon. Uh, we would like to continue. Beatrice Galimberti, you are there. Hello. Um, hello. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Try to stick Please. to the time that we have time for questions. Tell Please tell me if you can see the, the screen properly. Okay, so thank you so much. So good morning, everybody. I'm Beatrice Galimberti. I'm a PhD student from Politecnico di Milano, and I work on the role play by uncertainty in the design processes of public space. And actually, uncertainty has become one of these last year buzzwords. And among the very many reflections that have been gathering around uncertainty, um, well, I believe that three concepts of design potentially particularly interesting for co-design. So care, preparedness, and anti-fragility that I here propose in forms of action. So taking care, being prepared, and getting anti-fragile. In this presentation, let's say that I will start from taking care. Uh, in particular, let's start from Heavenly Andrid Garden in Kiev, Ukraine, which is an example of taking care of a memorial as a neighborhood's public space. Um, located in a residential neighborhood in the very heart of the city, it was a fenced vacant lot, as you can see, used as an illegal rubbish tip. And during the Ukrainian Revolution of Dignity in February 2014, civil protesters dismantled the rubbish tip fence to build barricades against the police repressions, where more than 100 civilians uh, were killed. 
So immediately after the end of the revolution, the neighborhood residents and revolutionaries began to gather around the former Rabbi Shtip, deciding to turn it into a memorial for the victims, the heaven and the hundred, celebrating them with a place uh, that the neighborhood could live and take care of daily. So together with the designers from the local NGO, Mr. Sad, they began a process of co-design, starting with the cleaning of the area, fundraising for its transformation, design and construction phases. So now the area is a neighborhood public space, also a memorial, a lively playground and a neighborhood vegetable garden. So um, what can we learn about that from that? Well, in uh, let's say that in recent years, two valuable uh, exhibitions mainly talked about taking care. The first one, taking care uh, at Venice Biennale in 2016, and the second one, critical care um, in 2019 in Vienna by Fitz and Kresny. And this last one related the meaning of care in architectural and urbanism to the transdisciplinary 30-year-long uh, uh, scholarship on caring, and particularly for the um, uh, curators of the exhibition, uh, caring in design is cross scalar based on a local planetary interconnectedness. Okay. Sorry, okay. Uh, based on local planet inter interconnectedness, in the connectedness through care can, for them, counteract the developer-driven and capital-centric design operations beyond the idea of what the client wants, and even beyond the green or sustainable design, um, fulfilling the basic tasks of sharing responsibilities for caring for our world and all its forms of life. And then passing to um, the next concept, preparedness, um, let's let's talk about pig toilets for 13 schools in Mindoro Island, Philippines, which have been the driver for a prepared response to COVID-19. Particularly Mindoro Island um, is an island which may, with many scattered villages, uh, which are difficult to access. Some of, some of them are only reachable on foot. Uh, there are 13 primary schools with very poor basic infrastructures and several Filipino associations called an Italian NGO uh, called Quito to build new toilets. And actually they started a co-design process and um, local with both local and uh, uh, women and men, uh, which were actively participating to co-design and co-building. So since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic arrived, uh, the building sites have been suspended, but its activities have not stopped. They transformed, let's say, so the women's team who usually weaved the panels for the toilets immediately began sewing masks, where the man uh, who uh, used to um, transport construction materials across the island began transporting and distributing the masks as well as first aid necessities. So um, the community involved uh, during uh, in the process is now aware that Thanks to the process in which they are that they are co-creating, they are building not only an hygienic infrastructure, but also they are organizing uh, a network, a network of capabilities and contacts amongst the most remote villages of the island. So a self-help resource, which will be easily to reactivate for the next unforeseen shocks that might come, hoping not too early. And so what is preparedness, which is also one of these conference keywords, this is a type of approach to emergencies. Um, these are two books which are talking uh, particularly very clearly about these issues. Um, this, this approach differs from other approaches to emergencies as preventions, precautions, deterrence and prevention, because um, preparedness repl replaces the search for a fully predictive uh, and preventive control of the situation with the dealing with uncertainty. So not avoiding it, but modulating it. And as Balducci said, that we will hear him later, uh, preparedness uh, also aims to build a broad response capacity to deploy in the most diverse and unpredictable situations. And uh, so very quickly, the third uh, and last concept, uh, the anti-fragility, getting anti-fragile. So the case of Ersilia Lab in Milan, uh, which, is a, which set up an anti-fragile strategies in building inclusion with two Roma communities in the city. So it is a project by the NGO Architetti Senza Frontiere Italia, and I'm also part of this association, that gathered two Roma communities, an Italian and a Balkan one, both located on the edges of a neighborhood in southwest uh, outskirts of Milan, 
and also with the neighborhood main associations. And the relationship between these three communities were very tense and full of reciprocal stigmatizations. And so uh, after two years of um, debates between communities, uh, workshops for both adults and kids and events, indifference and fear gradually smoothed it, leading to the establishment of a mixed group um, of co-design that drew up together a temporary pavilion called the Library of Relationships in the Neighborhood. But actually a few weeks before the realization, not the municipality, but the local council of the city area began to harshly oppose to the pavilion of the media. So legally the project could have still been built, but in such a climate of hatred, it would have become his target for violence. So the co-design group put aside the construction of the library to protect the people involved. And uh, nevertheless, the obstacle allowed the group to imagine a better opportunity. The solution came directly from the Romani culture. So the pavilion would transform into a carriage, which being mobile, would have been more difficult to attack by violent people. So the mobile pop-up carriage was co-built. And during the following months, the carriage and its mixed group have crossed not only the neighborhood, but the entire city's main public space to promote Romani culture and dialogue on diversity throughout exhibitions, public workshops, and so on. So something which would have been impossible with the pavilion in the peripheric part. Um, so somehow, thanks to local council opposition, let's say. And uh, so in an expected and certain situation, the co-designers were able to stay with the threat and even benefit from it, using it as a constraint to figure out, using these constraints to figure out a better idea. And uh, this is anti-fragility, using the Taleb neologism. Anti-fragility, which is the functional opposite of fragility. Mm. So if a fragile system gets damaged by uncertainty, crisis, shocks, etc., an anti-fragile system, system does not just um, uh, resist to them, but benefit from them. So uh, there's not time to explain the difference with resilience now, but they are cousins, let's say. So in design and planning disciplines, the reflection that fosters the, the design relevance of anti-fragility are increasingly spreading in papers, but also uh, plans, the, as the, one, the two that you see here um, in Italy, uh, use it as a sort of aim. And there's also an intriguing clusters of interests, which, are, which is organizing around the relationship between anti-fragility and of course, design in critical context. So just to sum up very briefly, mm, let's say that uh, these three concepts are all three forms of action that work by staying with uncertainty. Um, one of them does not necessarily presuppose the other two, but let's say that these specificities are that taking care is an ethical action. Being prepared means being mindful on the long term, of the long term, and getting anti-fragile is the drive for improvement. Uh, so the three combined, of course, are an explosive mix, let's say. So just to leave you with an open question, uh, what does it mean to be a designer when everybody designs, echoing Ezio Mancini, and in particular, if all participants are co-designers, as well as agents of care, sentinels of preparedness, and anti-fragile strategies, what does the business designer become? But this is just an open question for you all. And thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Beatrice. I think that you, 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 you are ending now with a very good question to, to add into our debate. And now I, I want to give the floor to Caroline, Alain, Alex, and Harry, that they, they will talk about the case in Brazil. Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's start. Can you, can yes. you see my screen? All right. So I'm Caroline Fejera, and I will present our work named Challenges to Research Co-Production in Informal Settlements in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this paper was written by me, Aline Isgarbi, Alexa Bico, and Harry Smith. Uh, our presentation is divided into two, into four parts. So let's see. 
Everything started in 2017 in a project named Resilience or Resistance, carried out in Medellin, Colombia. And in this project was developed a methodology of community-based landslide, landslide risk management between the community and the local government. Then we had a second project in 2018 named Upscaling Resilience, carried out in two communities in Medellin and in one community here in Sao Paulo. It was again about community-based landslide risk management. And it was divided in three steps risk perception, participatory monitoring and mitigation, and agreement seeking between community and the local government. So to have this project uh, carried out in Sao Paulo, we needed to find a community to work with. And the process in finding a community it was a bit challenging because despite the amount of landslide risk areas in Sao Paulo, the research team faced some difficulties and that's what we, I will highlight here in this presentation. Talking about co-production strategies, we believe this is a task to be done by multiple hands. And also this is a political strategy for vulnerable groups because they usually are underrepresented in politics. Uh, and this is the city of Sao Paulo in the Southeast of Brazil. Sao Paulo have, has 12 million people and 400, and seven landslide, landslides risk areas. And most of them are irregular settlements with few infrastructure. This is the location of the communities we tried to work with, Morada do Sol, Parque Santa Madalena, and Vila Nova Esperança. The first community was Morada do Sol. It was mapped as susceptible to landslides. And there was a community leadership and no repossession order. In Morada do Sol, there was a retaining wall over on a slope with several problems related to lack of maintenance. At the first moment, the leadership and some residents wanted to join the project, but for several days, sorry, for several weeks, there was an intensive police activity in the community and people were very scared. And when the situation calmed down, they were not motivated to go on and they stopped answering our calls. So another picture of the slope. The second community was Parque Santa Madalena. Again, it was mapped as a risk area and the number of houses on the slope were increasing. And there was an episode of landslide in 2016 when um, Mount of trash went down the slope, blocking the main street. In Parque Santa Madalena, there wasn't established leadership, but we found some residents who wanted to join the project. But before we could start, they, these residents, they were threatened 
by the organized crime and they were afraid to engage because they feared to be removed from the community. The third community and the one that we could work with was Vila Nova Esperança. Vila Nova Esperança had a strong community leadership, a long-term experience working with researchers and NGOs, and also a, a history of mobilization. The leadership clearly saw in the project benefits of engagement and our research project contributed to the understanding that mitigation and the community monitoring could be strong arguments to overcome the barriers to the regularization they were looking for. And our conclusions were that violence and the limited social cohesion can militate against participatory process. Uh, we also found that to have a leadership, to a community to have a leadership doesn't mean necessarily that they have power of mobilization and that the community engage when they see a clear benefit uh, for them and when they have a sense of group. So that's it. Thank you very much. You are, are mute, uh, Barma. Thank you, Luz. Thank you, Caroline, very much for this insight on three different um, communities. We will go on with the next presentation. I think Amin Kingsley is with us. Ani or Kingsley, I don't know exactly which is the first name. Do you want to uh, put on your camera in your microphone? And then I would like to give you the floor for your presentation. Hello, welcome. We don't hear you yet. Is there something wrong maybe with your microphone? Because you, you don't seem to be muted, but we don't hear you. What can we do about this? Would, would you like to, now you're muted actually. So if you unmute again. One option might be to uh, log out and log in again. Or oh, Paula, you have an idea? Uh, I, I'm hearing here, she, he needs to unmute. Yeah. Once again, Ani, please un, yeah, and now if Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, hear fantastic. you. Great. Can you hear me now? Great. <laughs> please, uh, please start I'm your presentation, hello. Now you're muted again, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think I have some problems with the audio. Okay, my name is Kingsley Ani. I'm presenting on behalf of my other colleagues. So I'm um, a lecturer at the University of Nigeria in the campus. So I don't know if you can see my screen. I tried sharing the screen. Is it on? No, not yet. Ah, no, it starts. How about now? Yes, you see it now. Okay. okay. Okay, so the topic is on participatory design as a sustainable approach to inclusive housing in developing economies. So we have this um, peculiar challenge in Nigeria when it comes to housing delivery and housing uh, provision. 
our case here is so peculiar for a country with a population of over 190 million as of 2017, we have a housing, housing deficit of over 17 million. When I mean over 17 to 20 million, and this um, housing deficit increases by up to 900,000 annually. And this has to do with quantity. We've not started talking about the quality of the houses, houses that have already been provided. Some of the challenges of um, this house, uh, housing in Nigeria include access to land, high cost of building material, absence of um, viable social housing schemes, the lack of flexibility and adaptability in design, then exclusion of end users' opinion in the design and development of public housing. So our aim for this, um, 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 for this uh, project was taken from the number five and the number three, which is the absence of viable social housing. End users. end users here are the direct beneficiaries of most government um, housing scheme. So the aim was to evaluate the impact of participatory design strategies in inclusive housing. It will be good to understand that inclusive housing is actually like a tall dream here, but we hope, this is where we hope to get to. But for now, there is little or nothing about inclusive housing in government housing provision around here. But we just needed to understand what is inclusive housing. Okay, so inclusive housing is housing that provides all the residents with adequate housing and access to all the basic services, such as transport, transport and recreation, and give the residents a great sense of belonging as they participate actively in the process of developing their community. And in Kingsley, excuse now, this me. sounds utopian. Excuse, okay. excuse me for one second. Would would you like to enlarge your screen? And I think your connection is a bit unstable. So if you would switch off the video, we could hear you better. Okay. Is the screen good good now? It's it's yeah yeah now it's perfect. Yes. Okay. So I was talking about inclusive um, housing. So initially I said is that. And um, aspiration, which we're trying to, which we're trying to get to. Okay, these are some of the guidelines from our research on inclusive um, housing. Like I said, we are not there yet, but we're looking at how to get to that point. And what do we do? We try to review government housing policies in Nigeria to see if they can actually help us to achieve inclusive housing, or what we can do to achieve those inclusive housing, knowing that there is really a problem in terms of the quality of housing being provided. I already mentioned earlier about the quantity. The housing deficit is so way above the normal. It's so way above the universal standard. When you have close to 17 to 20 million housing deficit in a country, that is talking about the quantity. Now, in terms of the quality, the quality is something else. It is also below the international standard for housing. Most of the houses are below, are not sustainable in quotes. They are not sustainable. So how do we do that? We try to review the housing policies and to see the gaps in them. Why are they not achieving or why, uh, why have we not been able to achieve those um, lofty goals? that have been set in some of these um, housing policies. This policy started as far back as the 19, after 1960, when the country had its independence. We have, um, during the 1980 to 1985, there was this uh, Shagari low-cost housing, where government intended to build over 130,000 low-cost housing units across the country. But this implementation was below 25%. Why? because there were a little inclusion in it. You also have the 1991 housing policy, the one in 2004, and even the most recent one in 2012. Through critical appraisals of the housing policy, the authors were able to deduce that social housing schemes in the country have um, some of the problems can be related to non-inclusion of the beneficiaries or the direct beneficiaries of, of this social housing scheme. Why is this so? We use this um, top to bottom approach in housing delivery, whereby the people that are supposed to stay in those houses are not carried along in the planning and also in the development. So what you get is 
the government tried to use one solution across board to solve the housing problem. And because the country is divided into various regions, and this region has different peculiarities in terms of um, religion, in terms of culture, cultural difference, but you are using the same solution across board. So what is what might work in the north might not actually work in the south, or what will work in the, uh, in the east might not work in the west. But the government policies did not take into peculiarities those differences. This leads us to the issue of participatory design. We try to see how participatory design can actually come in as a solution to help us achieve inclusive housing in Nigeria. So participatory design is an approach in planning and design that involves all contributors and beneficiaries in the planning and in the design of a project. Beneficiaries here talks about stakeholders and the stakeholders can be employers, partners, customers, citizens, and end users. But for the sake of this work, the stakeholders we're referring to are the end users, the direct beneficiaries, those that are going to benefit from this government's housing scheme. Are they being carried along? Are their inputs being heard? Are their, um, their ideas or their uh, way of life being carried along in the development of these uh, schemes? So the ultimate goal is to ensure that citizens have power to determine and influence development outcome through their participation in the design and planning process. Yeah, the table shows the hierarchy of users in participatory design. You have this um, level one shows manipulation where the people think they are being carried along, but ultimately they are not being carried along. But what we try to aspire to is number eight, where citizens have total control, total control of what is being done for them. That way the citizens are carried along and it gives them that full sense of control that this, this project, these uh, schemes are for them and they take total control of it. Effective participation in design and planning should be anchored on principles such as prom pro promotion of accountability and transparency, allowing for participation at all levels and ensuring participation is accessible to all stakeholders, valuing diversity, ensuring participation is voluntary and cohesive, encouraging stakeholders to create their own ideas and problem solving techniques as the case may arise. We've had situations whereby in an area that is dominated by slums, instead of governments to ask the people what they actually want, governments will go ahead to start a new housing scheme. When in the, in the real sense, if the people were carried along, what they might actually need is for government to upgrade the existing houses to upgrade, that is to improve on what they already have by either providing other basic amenities like roads, uh, water, and um, sustainable transport system. But government will abandon the, that existing and try to create something new. And before you know it, the one they are trying to create will not see the light of the day, while the slum will continue to degenerate further. Some of the recommendations we try to look at is on the housing policy. After we reviewed the housing policy and saw the gaps in it, and one of the gaps is that non-inclusion of the end users. So we try to see how this can be tackled at a policy level. If you tackle it at a policy level, it can now be enshrined in, in, the, in the housing policy, whereby participatory design will become part and parcel of housing delivery in Nigeria, both by government and also private sectors participants, whereby for every housing development scheme, social housing development scheme, the people are carried along from the design process through the planning and also the implementation process. Implementation here, during construction, you can also see how you can um, take from the locals their available skills in terms of available material and also construction techniques. In doing that, the people will have that sense of feeling that this is their own this is their own word, housing, and in a way, it becomes sustainable. It becomes sustainable because one, their needs are, are considered, and the, their needs are considered, and what will be uh, delivered at the end will meet their requirements. Also, we try to look at uh, land price regulation. Earlier, I said that land is one of the major problems of um, housing delivery in Nigeria. What government can actually do is to also regulate the price of land. 
Then development of self-help housing. If people are carried along, also there is that place whereby people can, uh, government can, government scheme can produce some uh, things like a shell construction, whereby over time people can now modify these houses to suit their either their way of life or their income level or their family size. As the family grows, the housing type can grow. So it's no longer the issue of prototype housing for everybody like we have presently. The issue of slum upgrade. We have this situation whereby most slums, you just abandon them. You want to create new uh, utopian housing scheme. We could actually upgrade those slums by providing the basic uh, amenities needed. So housing policies should make participatory design in the planning of mass housing a compulsory requirement. In conclusion, a growing number of architects and planners are turning to participatory design and placemaking as a sustainable approach to put citizen engagements at the heart of the design process. What, they are, what this would do is to create a sense of belonging and also to help achieve inclusive housing. Inclusive housing is very, very important. You cannot talk about sustainable housing development without talking about inclusive housing. And participatory design will help. Participatory design will help us to achieve inclusive housing, which in turn will make most of the government housing scheme viable. Thank you very much. So, thank you, uh, Annie, for your pre presentation and for and for bringing up the topic of uh, inclusive housing in housing mm -hmm. policies. So now we want to give the floor to our last uh, person. Presentation, so please, Ernesto and uh, Daniel, and the floor is, is yours. Uh, you need to stop uh, sharing a uh, screen, uh, Annie, please. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, inviting us to this uh, interesting session. Um, um, I hope you can see this now. Uh, give me a second, please. Um, this is the one. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. We here present the case of um, the Movimiento de Pobladores y Lucha en PL from now on, this means the movement of settlers in a struggle in Chile. Unlike similar experiences in Uruguay, Argentina, or Brazil, Chile's MPL adapts a neoliberal environment to develop housing projects in Peñalolén. This is a peripheral territory of Santiago uh, where ha families have been actively defending since uh, the 1960s and uh, avoiding displacement. For the last 20 years, land and housing prices have consider considerably increased in Peñalolén. As upper middle class gated communities gentrify this place, housing and land are scarce resources in Peñalolén for the poor who attempt to stay and live there. The only alternative is participating in collective applications to subsidy and more importantly, managing these resources strategically during the building process, okay? Uh, MPL is a strategy. It means a strategy from the margins. Uh, uh, this is the margins of neoliberal, ne neoliberalism, the open flanks left by an institutional housing policy that seeks to legitimize the state subsidy system uh, that produces this, we could say, anomaly. Um, sorry. Um, MPL socio-technical innovations imply efficient management of the demand, namely their own families, relatives and associates, but participant agents do something more than being just mere associates. They become political actors and work in concrete activism in the local level political sphere. In other words, MPL represents a practice that emerges from the cracks left by the neoliberal model in its current search for increasing social participation as a way to legitimize the working of capitalism and give more stability to it. Uh, part of MPL's innovation have been institutionalized. We think as a way to expand the neoliberal system uh, possibilities. Um, th this is the outline of of our um, of our um, um, uh, presentation. 
um, we should uh, see some uh, neoliberal policy innovations up to now in Chile. The first one is private savings, it's expression of people's effort. The second one is that the marginalized ones are integrated into the banking system. Uh, then there are sophisticated focalization technologies in the 1970s, this was the characterization survey to in the current time. This is the, an integrated database. And the fourth uh, innovation is that municipal management uh, has led to uh, sort of private accompaniment of subsidy beneficiaries by private sponsoring entities. So what uh, NPO's major innovation means is creating their own sponsoring entity. So becoming themselves a private enterprise uh, which is we consider this is very innovative i mean uh, it's being ultra neoliberal this means for a political movement uh, i'm going to skip this this is like mpl's view and i would like to focus on this flow chart um uh, this is a decision flow chart that summarizes uh our case analysis on the mpl According to this model, there are three key decisions a housing organized group needs to make in Chile in order to be successful. First, the decision is about whether applying to the housing subsidy programs or not. Uh, in principle, people have two alternatives from this. The first one is not entering the housing policy system, therefore squatting land, uh, which has been severely punished from the time of the military dictatorship in Chile. So this is really, really, unfeasible to do. Uh, even though the present COVID time, uh, the number of land, land squatting has, has increased. The second alternative is to enter the housing policy system. Since the 1990s, the Chilean state accepts collective applications to housing subsidies. This is to avoid this person already established communities by sending people out to completely different spaces of the city. Um, so joint applications should comprise a close group of associates who have a legal personality, and this is recognized by the municipality. Also, there is a third alternative, which is applying, applying to, to the uh, uh, individual subsidies, which means displacement because uh, the, the amount of the subsidy is by far too, too, too low for coping with land and housing prices in Peñalola. And so the only rational choice is to be involved in the collective application to subsidies. But then there is a scaling question. Uh, this organization, the MPL, scaled up uh, uh, their practice. Um, and since the late, the late 1990s, housing committees in Peñalola have been formed by neighborhood level groups, coping the special logic in inherited from the movement of settlers in the 1960s, 60s, who drew on an idea of absolute space. Uh, now the MPL draws an idea of a relative space and they created a federation of different uh, housing uh, homeless committees from different spaces of the country and the city. So they have widened up the range of possibilities of finding land not to squat, but to manage the housing, the housing project. So this is a, a very important technical innovation. Um, uh, what, what we see in this in this in this uh, uh, flow chart is that they uh, respond to the different uh, uh, questions that the housing policy uh, system presents to them. Um, if they don't uh, want to be involved in the housing production themselves, they can rely on uh, giving subsidies to a private sponsoring um, sponsoring uh, uh, firm. But what they did in the MPL, and this is the, the, the second te socio-technical innovation we see, is that they created their own uh, self-managed sponsoring entities, which means creating a private company, a legal private company. Um, okay, I, I need to speed up. Um, next. There are um, the stages of the MPL practice and the, the stages of the MPL model. First is assessing demand uh, and, 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 and applying to the subsidies and searching for an economically feasible land plot. This is not really easy for them to do because land is really scarce. 
uh, and it's very expensive to recondition land. So part of their subsidies need to go to recondition that land. Second is the definition of the project assembly. And this is a political move because the most engaged ones uh, belong to this assembly and they manage the control of the project. And then they, they design the project assisted by professional, external professionals like the cases we, 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 we early saw in this session in other places of the world. So these are first meetings by the assemblies at the beginning of uh, MPL projects number one and two. There are five projects already uh, delivered by this organization. The third stage of MPL's practice is the alliance with this small scale constructor. They don't rely on large scale construction firms because they are too expensive for them. So they have to cope with a small scale. And they, this issue of the small scale is important because the only housing state delivered delivered so far by the MPL, which uh, was larger than 100 units, uh, it was at the end, uh, they have to rely on a, on a private uh, sponsoring entity because they weren't really able uh, 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 to cope with this large size project. So from MPL 1, which is a much smaller scale project, onwards in MPL 3, 4, and 5, which is the different projects uh, uh, this, this organization has delivered, uh, the, the, the scale of the state is much smaller. So this, this issue with the scale is something which is very politically relevant in this case. This is a large scale of MPL's achievements. This is MPL 2. Uh, and this is the small scale achieved by MPL. And this is the way that this organization wants to follow uh, for future interventions. So this, at the end, the fourth stage in this quadrant analysis we are doing, the fourth stage means expanding the political work, expanding the political influence, because co-producing housing, we mean co-producing with the state, against the state, but from the state institutionality. Co-producing housing this way means engaging and broadening up uh, the political sphere of a uh, political organization. As a final discussion, uh, we see a paradox here, <laughs> taking over uh, the cracks of the neoliberal framework, framework implies practicing autonomy uh, and reshaping one's relation with the state. And this is something uh, one of the theorizers from MPL claims, Henry Rena in 2014. Uh, but this is very similar to what Eric Holland Wright wrote before he died, I mean to defeat capitalist rule with uh, really feasible ways, not creating a new, total new environment, anti-capitalist environment, but using the cracks that the neoliberal system leaves for the, for the organized uh, grassroots to achieve their goals. A second discussion is we see a radicalized form of social, social co-production, which is socially, um, uh, I, I, I will end this very quickly. Uh, is socially more efficient than the market supply. These are these social agents practice their political autonomy and become political agents. I mean, this be beyond creating enterprises. This is practicing uh, politics uh, in the market, we may say. Uh, Chile's settler movements no longer about land squatting, like Manuel Castell saw in, the, in their early book, but the legal management of scarce public resources Entrepreneurially, uh, it's like an entrepreneurial rationale we are seeing here, which is very paradoxical. And Chile's social agents now uh, experience have learned from South to South communication vessels. I mean, uh, the, the learnings from Argentina and Uruguay models have been really important for the Chilean grassroots. But now we see maybe it's the time to South to North and then to South again learning. I mean, this is the reason why we really appreciate that you received us uh, and allow us to, to present in this session uh, in order to press the uh, cooperative uh, relations. Thank you very much for you. Thank you, Edesto, for bringing this case of inno innovation in, in a context that, that we know that is quite complex uh, to develop this kind of uh, approaches. So, um, well, I, I want to thank you all for the 
presentation. I think that it has been very inspiring to see many cases around the globe that uh, show uh, global and local opportunities of co-production. Uh, well, just I'm going to make a brief summary. So we have, we have discussed the relevance of uh, the process itself and what, the, and what this, this process gives uh, to the community back. We have also talked about the topic of me mistrust in inst institutions and community en engaging, um, the co-design co in an uncertain context, which is quite important also for us right, right, right now. Uh, also how to in integrate co-production and housing policies, also how co-production co ha have been used as a political e strategy by groups to make uh, their voice heard. And, but, and last but not least, the, the importance of, of place-based uh, planning uh, and new debates beyond the north center approaches. I think that this, uh, as you also said before, uh, this north-south, south-north cross de debate is much uh, needed uh, to enrich the, this debate and to avoid simplistic approaches to production. I mean, we all know the opportunities that we have and also the opportunities and also the need that for alternative ways to relate and to uh, create or build em environment. But we also we need to be aware and also uh, to, to be aware and also to have the local knowledge and challenges that we need to overcome during the implementation of these uh, processes. It's also to, and also to, to see how we can scale up these local and social initiatives. Uh, I think that we I want to give uh, briefly the floor to have uh, to answer some of the of the the question that we have in the chat. Um, Dagmar, do you have them uh, right there? So maybe you can ask the the, the, the question with the, the floor, and then we close the the session with Horacio. And I want to uh, ask you, Paola, because we started a bit late. Uh, so how much time extra do we have to? To close this. Yes, I, I'm actually dealing with the team. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow I think um, 11, 10 might be <laughs> the, the longest that, that I think we can um, extend. So we, but then we will be with the next session 15 minutes or 13 minutes late. I okay. think that's feasible. Okay. For we'll, the we'll try to be very, very quick then. Yeah, maybe just as Luz proposed, I see uh, two questions in the chat, one um, to Andrea and one to Annie. Maybe uh, we start with Andrea. Uh, a question for Andrea. I hope you, ah, yeah, I see uh, your name. A question for Andrea on community identity and social participation. What I understand, writes uh, Harry Smith, from the presentation was that the approach taken was based on openness to a diverse range of groups within the communities. Both how, uh, but how did the intervention address the power relations and struggles that go on between different types of community leaders and activists within the community? Over the years, I've seen different approaches being used by external interventions, ranging from engaging with the existing power structures to get things done, to actively replacing these through, the, through to creating new power structures in the relationship between the community and the interventions. Okay, no, thank you so much for that question. I think that question has been very much at the center of my practice for very long. So I'll try to be brief, but there would be a lot to talk about and, and, and a lot of what I write is about precisely this so that we can have that conversation later. But one important point to say is that this intervention is part of a long-term engagement. So again, this engagement with citizen scientists, the process that were recruited together with a lot of local organizations uh, is important. The fact that this is not a one-off is part of a long-term issues is also important. Uh, also the issues of being explicit about the conflicts, one working with the, with the community was important and this also in the practice. But just make a small example. So for example, on the gender issues, the first things that municipality told us when we came when we started to work with them much in advance of this was uh, as we, we are happy with every project as long as it doesn't deal with gender relations. We don't want a project that comes and try to change the gender things. In, you know, we have our Muslim strict traditions and this is quite conservative part of the country and, uh, and, and, and that's it. 
But then, of course, that has been tackled in different ways. So, for example, this project was done in cooperation with the, with a number of people and organizations, and the only three people who spoke Arabic and worked directly with people are three uh, Lebanese female architects who were quite young, who were actually managing these men-dominated public works uh, officers in the council and dealing with the mayor. And so the whole of the city saw this kind of role modeling. And at the same time, then the involvement of women in, uh, in the construction process was very powerful because it's really challenged what were the, the normal power relations there. So there were lots of ways in which through the practice this could be challenged, but it was also constant reflection. So for example, there was a powerful family who didn't want a ramp in front of their house. And if you don't have a ramp in a ramp systems on the, uh, in the sidewalks, you basically defeat the purpose of the inclusivity of all the ramps. So there was this huge conflict with this powerful family. And so all the participants, all the citizenship had to, to deal and recognize, well, actually this is happening and, and, and talk about that. So I'll, 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 I don't go more into this, but I just want to say in the conclusion of the upcoming book that I advertise, not only as a result of our project, but as a reflection from lots of different projects, we summarize what are the tactics to deal with, uh, um, with uh, these power relations in working with community in participatory planning and design processes. So there you can find a good summary. Thank you, Andrea. It's a lot about negotiating the rules of these overlaying practices. I will read two more questions. Uh, the second one was by Marcello Balbo to Ani. Your presentation is interesting, however, I believe and suggest that instead of taking such a wide perspective using rather abuse keywords, you should go into created and deeper details and look at specific case in Nigeria. Um, and there is a second question which actually follows to this um, to Ani. What is the most dominant housing typology in Nigeria? So it be, would be nice to answer Marcello's question with the answer of the second question by Aftakali. Uh, if you're still with us, Ani, would be nice to know what is the most dominant housing typology? How can we imagine this? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to Marcelo. I appreciate the honest comments. Okay, the housing um, typology most times is um, dependent on the income levels of um, individuals or family. But basically, uh, you have um, the single unit, um, the single family units that can be bungalows or duplexes. And these are mostly owned by middle income or high income. Uh, and as then you have the block of flats or terrace building also people within that um, income categories. But for the urban poor, you have an undefined housing typology which ranges from shanties and um, slum or squatters and settlements. So I think that answers the question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ani. Thank you all for the question. I think that um... It's already 11 2, so I think we should go to the final part and to close the, the, the session with the, the comments by Horacio. So, Horacio, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for, for the organizers, Lagma, Luz, and Paola. Thank you. Uh, I have three ways, so just a little. Uh, I base on my own contribution, some comments on the presentations, and a new question about the question of the announcement. Um, well, about my own contribution, as Paola uh, said, I, I'm related with Eritash. Uh, so the co-production became a good orientation for the rehabilitation of the modern housing complex uh, in one way, because of the heritage conservation and rehabilitation process have an near inherent complexity. In Chile, modern architecture uh, has been incorporated recently as, as heritage um, because mostly because the, the 
there are some uh, the complex uh, phases, a speculative process of the land use, and uh, some in some cases uh, because of the real estate operators. So the people, the inhabitants, have requested the, the declaration of monuments uh, to protect them against this threat of the real estate business and also to recognize they are paradigmatic in the quality of life the complex provide. The declaration as monuments allows the complex to be kept out of the speculative process of the urban land, but that not ensure uh, funds for the conservation and maintenance. Uh, through a series of cases, we study the relation between conservation as the spatial uh, and the ideas of spatial co-production, uh, as well as the value of self-organization and self-management of the community as part of the resilient strategy towards heritage. The inhabitants have seen in the form of heritage preservation a way out of the difficulties of maintenance and above all to defend themselves from the real estate business and preserve the way of life consisting of comfortable scales and population densities. They have recognized the role of the conservation area as a good opportunity uh, since by admitting the existence of official protection. It allows them to receive uh, subsidies or supports from the states or from other organizations, and it became a resistant action against the process of urban speculation and the organization for this purpose uh, as a resilient action. Uh, that is mostly why uh, the, the, the uh, co-production ideas became very related with the form of architecture and its significance, because the people must organize in, in a way to uh, uh, maintain a, a huge area, sometimes, uh, what can I say, are 1,800 families involved, so there are a lot of people to manage a process of co-production, mostly for the urban spaces that are in these uh, big complexes. Uh, the second is, uh, well, the, the, the ideas became paradigmatic in, in this sense because uh, this housing complex can improve uh, the habitat in a more inclusive way also. Uh, in the second part, uh, uh, there are some comments on, on the presentations. I think uh, the presentation of Giuseppe, Axel and Luisa uh, put on the table the idea of the diversity related with the power and how are the, the emerging challenges uh, posed by often contradictory, unconventional, apparently chaotic, and, and irreductibly, I'm quoting, of course, uh, unicity of the African built environment. I think uh, Andrea put, maybe the, the term in, in this part of the session should be identity. Uh, Andrea recognized the different micro powers inside the communities. This is a thing that we are very uh, elusive in, in, in mind when, when approaching a co-producing uh, process. Um, I think it's, it's very important because it's a kind of interpreter of the different identities and the aspirations and dreams of the, of the residents. Uh, Caroline, Aline, Alex, and Harry, uh, they, they make a very interesting emphasizing the, the, the lack of community cohesion 
and engagement, violence, and other concerns. Uh, they must challenge they, their work uh, like a difficult in finding a community. Uh, this is very important because we, we mostly think on a community as a kind of homogeneous community. And inside every community, there are so many identities and so many problems to, uh, to face with the co-production ideas. Also, Andy, Ani, Odo, uh, put the the same but this is i can i, I have a different uh, approach because i think the challenge since seems to be the number the stock needed uh, anid uh, spoke about uh, 17 million uh, houses needed and the possibilities of the co-production in that sense is seems to me very difficult uh, uh, also for an inclusive housing. Uh, I, I cannot imagine with what kind of instrument you, we can approach the co-production management of, of uh, uh, so many uh, numbers of, of, of house needed. Um, I have uh, here, okay, uh, Beatrice, Beatrice. Uh, I think the propose uh, she, she, she uh, shows is very, very suggestive. Uh, there are three very interesting topics, but how to get an operation, operational level with these three concepts. Uh, we need to upscale to extend the power of the concept to global instrument. I think it's, it's very suggestive and it's very challenging that the three, three uh, keywords can uh, get inside the idea of the co-production and, and give a, a more, what can I say, a more suggestive uh, movement around. Uh, at the end, uh, the Ernesto and Daniel, I think they they show a very interesting. I know very well the EGIS, uh, the self-managed sponsoring entity. They say, and I think it's it's the real way to interpretation to to have an interpretation of this kind of action in the neoliberal model. And I think it's, it's a kind of a new step of the self-construction proposed by John Turner in the 60s. Uh, it's a, what can I say, a more evolutionated idea. It's not the people doing uh, the, their own house, it's the people organize it, and managing the the building, the construction, and all the movement around the the, the house. Uh, I think they are really really interesting. Uh, then my third point is about the 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 question the question how to plan in a world of uncertainty. And I was uh, thinking about the plan. The plan became during the 20th century, the instrument to give certainty. Uh, so to avoid uncertainty in some way and to get the, the cities growing and developing in, in the way they can uh, prevail. Uh, in Latin America, some said that uh, the have always been a crisis and too much more from recent, the recent times. There are some countries that have uh, economic crisis frequently uh, and large part, large part of the territory without planning, it's also 
a way to promote a new crisis every time uh, without with the resource. Um, I should perhaps remember that some of the planning instruments are still necessary to face injustice and for the defense of the public life. And uh, mostly uh, the idea of the, this paradox is because uh, how we must deal with the claims of certainty that communities and societies demand from the technical or the planning knowledge in time of uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Horacio, and, and th thank you all for this uh, debate, for the presentation, and I think that we have to move, move, move on. We are five minutes, we took five minutes uh, extra. Um, so yeah, so just as I say now, we will, will go to a session about housing policies, growth and equity. So thank you. So pa thank you very Paola, much. maybe you want thank to you very continue. Much for this. Yes, I want to thank you, the presenters, but also the session's moderator, my colleague Horacio Torren for this uh, incredible session that I think the wish that we had to bring together, let's say, that we call the Global South and the Global North, I think it's a thing that is very important so that we can understand that a lot of things are, we are, we are talking about co-production 2.0, I would say, that, uh, and we also know a lot, I would say, from our own uh, architecture and urban design and urban management uh, history also about this term, as uh, Rasio also was mentioning, James Turner, and but it's different, right? And I think this is the moment there. Um, I think this session helped me very much and we keep on talking about this. What does it really mean to work with the state, against the state and for the state, because we cannot be out of that. But uh, that's a very interesting, so a big challenge. And thank you very much for this session. Thanks to you all. Great work, <laughs> colleagues. Thanks. So I think we go to the break, a very short break, three minutes, and then we open up the next session. Thank you. Bye.
I'm afraid uh, that the three minutes have passed while we wait for Professor Babo and his espresso. I agree that it takes more than three minutes. Uh, I will entertain you by introducing panel four, Inhabiting, uh, which includes not only housing, uh, but it has um, uh, been given since the, be the beginning a broader meaning, including also policies growing and equity. Even before COVID-19 crisis affected urban populations around the world, it was clear that inequality would be one of the biggest challenges facing global cities in the 21st century. So this is one of the certainty that we already had and that was um, underlined. There is a need for more attentive knowledge on the links between public goods and services and equitable growth. Uh, I would add between public goods and services, uh, uh, even in the virtual realm where we are currently working, uh, above all after yesterday's uh, uh, roundtable debate. Uh, so, and how to support these processes locally and globally is the question. The panel is coordinated uh, by Dr. Uh, Hassan El Muhali. I hope I pronounce it well after having practice, whom I would like to uh, thank particularly because uh, uh, he accepted to um, uh, lead the panel despite the little notice. Uh, we, gave, we asked him. Uh, uh, there is another version of the of the conference program that. Uh, that is circulating, I'm afraid. Uh, it's an older one in which uh, uh, Alexandra Linden appeared as the panel coordinator. Uh, she's a, a dear colleague and a friend uh, from the GIZ uh, and a member uh, of the network uh, since a long time, since a long time ago. Uh, and she was um, impeded, prevented from uh, leading the the, the panel for uh, personal reasons. So I would like to thank again, uh, Hassan for being with us. Um, Dr. Muheli is an architect and an urban planner and a postdoc researcher and lecturer at Berlin Technical University at Urban Development Department and at the Habitat Unit. His interests in include culture and urban informality in relation to aspects of urban development and governance in the global south. He coordinates and acts as a principal investigator for several projects in different interdisciplinary topics, mainly informal urbanism and urban management. And also he participated as an expert and consultant for international cooperation organizations in activities related to the global south urbanism, including uh, countries such as Egypt, Tunisia, Tanzania, Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, and India. So Hassan, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Paula, for, for this. Um, uh, informative introduction about the session and also uh, um, about uh, me and um, I would um, yeah like to start like according to the program um, we have um, Tracy Sydney Commodore and Louis Cousy Frimpong from the University of Ghana um, and they will be talking about livelihoods, environmental pollution, and climate change, exploring the nexus in a slum community in Accra, Ghana. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome. So, thank you. So I'll be sharing my screen now. Yes, please. Just a quick reminder, uh, till it appears, you have uh, 10 minutes maximum, please. Yes, please. We are already out of time. Please, can you, share, can you all see my screen? We just see the the window where you have to where you are trying to open the the file. 
I think it's better to stop sharing. Okay. Then open the file first and then start sharing. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that again. Okay. So. Mm. Um, my internet connection is quite slow here. I I hope it doesn't give me problems. No, no, so far so good. Mm -hmm. uh oh let's Sorry. still try to tracy let's start let's see if you can still connect with your presentation and if not i suppose we should have a backup okay um i i'll, I'll try again please is it better is it, can you all see we only see again the same window well, with you. Um, okay. I. When you press share screen, then um, several yeah. files would appear. You just double click on on the presentation. Okay. The yes. after the, yes now it is. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, good morning once again. My name is Tracy Komodor and I'm a second year PhD. Uh, can you please uh, enter full screen? Okay, yes, please. Please, is it better? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, I'm a second year PhD candidate at um, the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, University of Ghana. And um, as part of my PhD thesis, which is on renewable energy and livelihoods, I conducted a pilot study on livelihoods, environmental pollution and climate change. And the focus was to explore um, the nexus um, between these three themes in the Islam community in Accra, Ghana. So Louise is my advice, and I'll be presenting on both of us. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. So by way of introduction, I'll touch on the three themes, give a very brief overview. Then I'll move to the purpose of the study, which is the objectives. Then I'll move to the study area, the methodology, mention some key findings on the field and, and give some recommendations as well. So in discussing slum communities in Accra, this first slide is to show some images of slums in Accra, Ghana. And, and the second picture is um, to show or to um, give us the, an aerial view of a known slum in Adwebloshi, which is, which, which is, I mean, I'm sure those of us who have been to Ghana would know this suburb. And it is important to know that the um, slum neighborhoods in Accra are exponentially increasing and about 265 slums at different stages of development have been identified in Accra alone. And a um, majority of the urban poor in Accra live in these communities. And according to the UN Habitat, these communities are described as lacking security of tenor and not having durable housing, as well as have poor access to basic services. And interestingly, 60% of all urban residents in sub-Saharan Africa live in slums. And the extent of deprivation in these communities are very severe. Meanwhile, studies have shown that slums are created for many residents across the continent, mainly because they provide shelter. Therefore, there is the urgent need to address the concerns of slum dwellers, especially with regards to livability in their communities. The paper, my paper discusses the nature of livelihoods in these communities. And as we know, livelihoods are the capabilities and assets and activities required 
to make a living and it is known to be sustainable and resilient when it can cope with and recover from shocks and stress. Now, um, livelihoods among the urban poor in Accra tend to suffer and are hardly sustainable due to the element of deprivation in these slum communities. Therefore, the um, states or the, condi the conditions in the slum communities um, warrants the need for critical attention to ensure sustainable livelihood development. So um, due to the characteristics of slum communities in Accra, as I, I mentioned in my previous slides, environmental pollution is very evident and environmental um, studies have shown that environmental pollution does not only contribute to climate change, but is also worsened by it. Meanwhile, um, environmental pollution, particularly air pollution, comes from energy use and production. Now, fossil fuel is a known contributor to climate change, yet it is a widely used source of energy in slum communities in Accra, mainly for domestic and commercial activities. And we know that burning fossil fuels releases gases and chemicals into the air, and this contributes to environmental pollution. Now, in Accra slum communities, the contention has been how to sustain livelihoods and at the same time ensure the well-being of the urban poor who depend heavily on these fossil fuels. Since the path to sustainable livelihoods and well being rests on the use of energy sources that are first environmental friendly, secondly efficient, and thirdly sustainable. Therefore, the purpose of this of the paper um, is to first explore livelihoods activities within a slum community in Accra and also show how they contribute to environmental pollution. Second is to explore potential mitigation factors needed to address environmental pollution associated with livelihoods. And lastly is to explore the potential use of renewable energy sources in supporting livelihoods so as to reduce environmental pollution in slum communities. So moving to my study area, the, um, the, the pilot study was conducted in the old Fadama settlement. And um, this is a common set, um, slum settlement in Accra, and it has about 100,000 residents. And um, it's known um, to provide the vulnerable with a place to live and a way to gain income, despite the numerous livability challenges faced in the community. Um, basic services such as toilets, facilities, electricity, water, housing, et cetera, are under pressure due to the high population within this area. And it would interest us to know that the main livelihood activities of men in this community are scrap business and that of women is head portrait. So just this is some images of the livelihood activities of men and women in the old Fadama community. So moving to my methodology, a qualitative pilot study was adopted for this research and um, data was gathered from both primary and secondary sources. Also, transit works as well as both formal and informal interviews were the main research instruments for gathering primary data. And um, with regards to the sampling technique, a purposive sampling technique was used in selecting about 15 to 20 respondents for the study. In addition, formal interviews were also conducted among key personnel in this community. And interpretive analysis and SPS, SPSS were the main techniques for analyzing the data. So moving to the key findings from the paper, it was observed that most livelihood activities in the old Fadama community are dependent on fossil fuels, such as charcoal, firewood, and gas, hence contributing to environmental pollution as well as poor health. Um, also, men in this community are exposed to lead and other toxic material, metals arising out of the constant burning of scrap, scraps. And as I mentioned earlier, scrap business is their main livelihood activities. So they are exposed to um, lead and other toxic metals due to 
this livelihood activities of theirs. And this has a wide range of effects on their health. Um, also, aside the use of firewood for domestic chores at home, women in this community also use the firewood and charcoal in cooking foods for commercial purposes. I mentioned that the main livelihood activities in this community is head pottery, but some women mentioned that in addition to the head pottery, they also cook food on a large scale to make a, a living, and their main source of cooking is firewood and charcoal, and this also has effects on their health. So the study realized that health issues such as poor vision, asthma, cancer, lung and heart ailments are common among residents in these communities, even including children. So this, um, the study recommends that alternative energy sources such as solar stoves, ovens and grills, um, plus windmills should be introduced, especially to women, as these energy sources are environmental friendly and adaptable, that is, if subsidized to residents in slum communities. Also, the study recommends that more grassroots organizations and community-based organizations, that is the CBOs, should be set up in the community since they can encourage the adaptation of alternative livelihoods, such as uh, manual jobs, which include carpentry, masonry, etc., among men in this community. Most importantly, um, collective action um, is seen when these grassroots organizations and um, CBOs are engaged, since the voices of the local um, the residents in the old Fadama community are considered in decision making. So in this case, they they would be part of um, they will be part of the measures that will be taken to address their livability challenges. Um, also, a collective action is instrumental because resources are pooled to effect change. So in this case, um, petitions can be made to the government. Um, as well as NGOs or other private entities concerned through the CBOs or grassroots organizations to subsidize costs and provide training um, in order to make these new energy sources that I've mentioned earlier feasible and accessible, especially among, we, among women in slum community. So in conclusion, Environmental pollution, climate change, and livelihoods is critical, especially in planning in a world of uncertainty. And also, it is very important for policy since it, this is an everyday issue, especially in slum communities. And um, renewable energy resources will help safeguard the environment from climate change that is less deforestation for firewood, acid rain, as well as pollution, such as emissions of harmful substances in the air through the burning of coal to produce energy for cooking and the, con the constant burning of scrap metals in the old Fadama slum community. Um, drawing from the fact that energy which, which is very essential for livelihood development is a major contributor to environmental pollution and climate change. And um, I think it is important to adopt very safe and environmental friendly energy sources. And in doing so, the health of humans are protected. So the health of slum dwellers um, in this community will be protected. And lastly, it will reduce government expenditure on such energy related health issues so as to channel its resources to emerging health crisis or disasters such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I look forward to hearing your contributions as well as um, your questions. And um, I, I hope that um, your contributions will fine tune and um, would help me write a very good paper. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. Tracy, for uh, for uh, explaining and, and presenting your case study, um, actually linking between those um, important um, 
entities uh, in the discourse of the nexus, I think pollution, climate change and livelihood is a very interesting topic. Um, and I, I would say, like, uh, according to the uh, regulations of the of the conference, the questions would be postponed to the, till the end of the session. So yes, please. Please questions, um, like write them down in the chat or post later. Thank you, Tracy, again. Um, Thank you so very much. We go to the second um, presenter, uh, who is uh, Dr. Deepa Joshi from uh, Coventry University, UK. Um, she's a political ecologist. Um, and uh, together with um, Josefa Safala Aranguez, sorry for the wrong pronunciation, um, who did a bachelor and master's in sociology and currently enrolled in the Master of Art and uh, of Research Training Program in Social Sciences at the Humboldt University Berlin. And actually also um, this paper is based on the joint project between Cities Alliance and uh, NIRUS, uh, Equity Services and Economic Development in Cities of the Global South, Engaging Research in Policy Making. The, um, they will present um, the title, The Interfaces Between Urban Research and Policy Making. So please. Um... Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is uh, Deepa Joshi, and uh, I would like to correct my introduction. Actually, um, I have done a, a master's in urban management from Technical University of Berlin, and at present, I am working uh, in a research project uh, with the Habitat Union. So I would like to uh, share this presentation with Josefa. And uh, Josefa, are you there? Okay. Yes. So maybe I, I, I will start the presentation now. I, I share my screen. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And I will start to, to go with the presentation. In the meantime, you can share the screen. Thank you very okay. much all of you for your assistance in this block of the 20th version of the NIDUS conference. As Hassan already introduced, my name is Josefa Zavala. I'm a research assistant at the Habitat Unit of the TU Berlin. And together with Deepa, we are going to be presenting some of the findings in the framework of the project that we conducted for the joint working program for equitable economic growth for Cities Alliance, and which is currently in the final report phase which we hope will provide insights derived from what has been an interesting conference so far. So with no further ado, I would like to begin by telling you about the objectives of this presentation. According to the purposes outlined, they've over two years of joint work with a number of academics from the NAERUS network, Audi and Radeus Lack. And in an effort to synthesize the results we obtained throughout this joint project, we would like to here to dwell on the discussion on equitable economic growth in the urban domain, as well as to deepen the analysis of what we are understanding by what has been called the interface between research and policymaking from the perspective of urban planning. Also to reflect on the role of research networks in addressing the existing gaps and obviously to have feedback for subsequent roundtable discussions or how to proceed with research in the framework of equitable economic growth. So we have organized these presentations. Deepa, can you go like a slide before? Yes. Okay, we have organized the presentation around these thematic modules. I will start the introduction to contextualize you about the project we conducted. And then I will give the floor to my colleague Deepa, who will mention the main discursive keys and results. Next, please. So the project entitled Equity Services and Economic Development in Cities Engaging Research in Policymaking had as general objective to evaluate, contextualize, and operationalize existing research in the framework of what has been called this linkage between public goods and services to address equitable economic growth. As you might be aware of, and, 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 and as and it has been reaffirmed in the presentation of colleagues Today and yesterday, a large part of the challenges in terms of spatial and social equity are in the regions of the Global South. Based on this, we generated a project partnership that we carried out via collaborative work since 2019 between researchers from Audi, 
the, 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 the African network, Redeus Lac, the South American one, I mean, Latin American and the Caribbean, and Naerus together with Cities Alliance and the Technical University of Berlin. Next, please. So the model below here aims to show you the timeline associated with our project and what were the main associated work packages as well as their respective methodologies and products. As you can see in yellow, the first part corresponded to the operationalization phase, as well as the startup of the project. The work package one does work on the conceptualization on equitable economic growth. And uh, they made a desk research on, on, on this concept of equitable economic growth and what, what could dialogue with the work of the work package two and three. Work package two, what you can see in green, conducted a preliminary study during uh, 2020, where we surveyed about 20 collaborators and stakeholders from our three networks based on an exploratory online survey that aimed to do a gen general thematic mapping, so to say, or a state of art of the current state of this interlinkage between equitable economic growth for research and policy making. And along with a series of webinars that we developed throughout the project, the World Package 3 was in charge through qualitative methodologies to delve into the mechanisms in which this interlinkage takes shape in these three regions, based on a series of in-depth interviews. And finally, we are in this phase of recommendations and inferences where the publication will aim to put the results obtained in the light of the realities of each region from the voice of our academicians and collaborators of each research network. So right now, Deepa will tell you more about some of the results obtained both in our preliminary study and in the final qualitative field phase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josefa. So I start with the, basically our work on WP2 and uh, the theme was our research and policy interface. So we took these discourses, we started from the discourses uh, as our theoretical background, such as cities as engine of growth and promoting a narrow growth agenda undermines prosperity and equity. So we argue that equity in economic growth can be best achieved when various stakeholders participate collaboratively collaboratively, and in this constellation, a key role is played by the researchers and policymakers. Then we do this two perspective of policy versus research. So in where in politics, it is manageable to promote inclusive economic growth through public services, while on the other side, for the researchers, it's highly challengeable to fix inequality and segregation. So from a researcher point of view, we focused on what do we know and what can researchers contribute. Then uh, as we understand this uh, uh, interface as of relations connecting stakeholders and actors who translate their knowledge into specific policies and practices at all scales, we build up our research, key research question that is, what do we understand under an interface that address EEG? So we, uh, we took this uh, uh, key two uh, um, objectives, like first to explore EEG initiatives, uh, especially in context of urban planning and uh, uh, the, which deploy, uh, employs the collaborative methodologies. Uh, in addition, to collect examples and practices and strategies uh, on how to bridge this gap. Then uh, on the, uh, the next phase of our work, in, uh, especially uh, in uh, work package three, we took this key research question, how do these uh, synergies take place based on the empirical research? So the empirical research was focused on the synergies created between these three spheres, that is academia, policy, and local communities. So for that, we have uh, these three key objectives. First, to identify alternative paradigm to EEG uh, between science and policy. Second, explore the institutional conditions for an enabling environment for EEG and 
Third is to understand the dynamics behind knowledge co-production between policy, science, and local communities. <clears throat> then I would like to summarize our understanding based on the WP2 work. So first, uh, in the point of like the potential component, what we understand. So we found from our understanding and observations that institutions are as a key entity in shaping the interface and institutions are various scales and levels. So we found these key five category of institutions who are involved in research exchange uh, in uh, especially exploring this, uh, this topic of research policy interface. Besides, in the area of EEG, we also uh, recognize that uh, uh, mainly these uh, research exchange are involved in, uh, in the sphere of the global initiatives, such as SDGs, uh, UN cooperation strategies, and in addition, uh, new methods like uh, transdisciplinary co-production processes. So, so we understand that uh, these interface it, itself motivated by these global agendas and common goals. The next point we, we understand that these engagements in empirical knowledge generation, so we try to map these knowledge generation processes and what kind of patterns and what kind of topics. So out of the survey, we come across various policies and topics such as housing, land, transportation, capacity building, city management, public spaces. And these topics are especially in context of the urban planning. So we, as a researcher, we understand this uh, uh, new pattern of knowledge generation, such as developing the framework for collaborating strategies and research methods, and even institutional's own operational framework and strategies towards the practical input in urban planning, and then testing these strategies on ground and, and co-developing this dialogue spaces uh, between research and policy makers uh, for global issues and topics. Our next uh, understanding uh, was focused on the role of researchers, uh, spatial knowledge transfer. So out of survey, we come across these three perspectives about the role of researchers, these three patterns like researchers as political uh, alternative and research as a consultancy and intermediary. But uh, from a research side of view, and, and we critically uh, look at uh, the researcher's role because we understand that often researchers are engaged with the uh, academia and, uh, and, and the role of academia has a key place along with the researchers in knowledge co-production rather than knowledge transfer. And, uh, and in particular, in knowledge co-production, in what type of like, uh, in particular, to understand the nature of the issues and uh, problems. So, uh, I would like to uh, invite Kasafa again to, to summarize and conclude our in inferences from our work. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. So, I will, I will sum up in, in honor of the time that we have, this uh, inferences and discussion that we obtain based on the results of both the World Package 2 and the Work Package 3. As, as Tipa said, there is a lot of topics, methods that we obtain in this exploratory phase. And I would like to start with this emphasis and open up the discussion with, because it's going to be part also of the reflection that we are going to do for this final phase and the digital booklet that we're going to publish at the end of this project, we are currently on this. So I will go with this um, bullet points that we made based on the results of the work package too. So in the assessment of the current interfaces of research and policy ma making, survey results show the need for defining research type of engagement in the interface and their role in translating knowledge into practice. Researchers that we consulted underlined the necessity to increase researchers' presence in all the project phases, going from co-production to co-design, co-creation processes, to improve also communication between research and policymaking spheres, namely new language, communicative tools, platforms, etc. 
to open multisectoral transdisciplinary spaces for action research experiences and research-based policymaking, and to put citizens and communities' needs as key assets in the negotiation for new context-dependent interfaces, research policymaking. So all these participatory dynamics embedded in the interface are central for researchers. And new interfaces need to be platforms for a real inclusion of public institutions, private actors, and third sector in knowledge uh, production processes through multi-level and multi-sector approaches. In this sense, a redefinition of the relationships with the political spheres emerge as a key concerns. Uh, for instance, the politicization of the interface reflects the necessity of rethinking cooperation mechanisms between research and policymaking. Next, please. Okay, and to, to finalize, I would like to comment on some of the reflections obtained from our empirical work based on the synergies investigated in the work package three, which as I mentioned was the last part of our project uh, through uh, a lot of very interesting in-depth interviews. Um, and in this part, we research not just the synergies, I, I mean like the mechanism um, to, to address this linkage. Also, we uh, research um, the topics of which other alternative mechanisms of co-production exist to address these equitable economic growth issues. And one of the cross-cutting themes that appear in the interviews is related to the value that social capital acquires in order to meet the specific needs of the communities. And very key in this part, and I, which I personally find very interesting, is that on this point, it's not enough to talk about social capital per se, not about increasing it, but rather to attend to the qualitative ways in which this social capital takes shape in order to meet local needs and requirements. The dynamics of social capital in communities often act, act as a thermometer of the synergies that occur in the field when establishing links between public policy and research, especially for the reflection when observing this equitable economic growth in practice. And another of the keys obtained here is the reflection on boundary objects. The work of our colleagues in this research project indicated a critical aspect of the process to attain equitable access to public goods and services, which is the knowledge co-production. However, this co-production has different outcomes, and these are the ones on which we would also like to reflect on. These boundary objects can be concrete objects, which also in the voice of our interviews, recreate a concrete experience in the way this knowledge is co-produced in each of the regions studied. Therefore, the study of the synergies associated with interlinkage must also look at the tools in which the different forms of knowledge are integrated. With this, we close our presentation and the study that we conducted, thanks to the intense collaboration of our partners of the Redeo Slack network, Audi and Aerus, and of course, we remain attentive to any questions, thoughts, if you require more information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Josefa and, and, and Deepa, for your presentation and informing us about this interesting uh, project uh, linking between academia and practice and, and um, from knowledge to policy making. Um, and I would like, uh, again, to apologize for Deepa. I actually misinformed myself about you, so I'm sorry for that. And no, it's okay. Thanks. So um, again, uh, the questions would be postponed till the end. So thank you again. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> going to the uh, third presentation of this session uh, would be presented. Sorry, I can just interject. We need to uh, finish share screen that is happening still uh, because we don't see what's happening. So yeah. Are... please stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Kuba. Um, okay, so the third presentation for this session um, uh, will be presented by Ivona Ofoso Kowake, um, and she is a deputy director for uh, uh, Urban Regeneration, Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs from uh, KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. 
Uh, on behalf of uh, also her colleague, uh, Mabali uh, Matt Brown, who is a, a deputy director of um, Pro Provincial Infrastructure Monitoring and Oversight, Department of National Treasury, Pretoria, South Africa. The, uh, Ivona would be presented uh, planning for possible risks, integrated land use planning in local uh, government for informal economy actors which presents um, uh, South African cities during the COVID-19 pandemic. So please. Ivona, you're muted probably. We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, well, my colleague has since moved from her, that unit. She now is in the unit called um, Neighborhood uh, Development Program. Yeah. Anyway, um, just a very short presentation. Um, I just have a hobby of writing papers, and so I'm not an academic by any means. Um, so we, we're looking at how our um, local authorities deal with the issue of inf um, the informal economy. It's, it's been a subject of debate of, of probably over the last 10 years, and you still seem to be grappling with um, the, the issue at hand. But this paper just looks at a very quick um, overview on how they are integrating um, the sector into um, their land use plan and specifically on the schemes. So the next, um, okay, I'm just trying to move my slides, okay. The outline, just um, a quick introduction, but it's quite a lot of um, items, but they're very short, so shouldn't worry too much about it. So we look at um, whether special equity is still possible in South Africa. Uh, what um, the balance and efforts are in terms of getting an integrated land use management um, system going. Then our case study, which is Peter Maritzburg, um, the capital of the province of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, what the series of events were in terms of um, catering for the informal sector um, during the national lockdown and the informal trader, uh, traders trying to negotiate space um, in um, our urban areas, uh, just a few pictures and um, yeah, we just conclude on some um, observations that um, were made. Okay. So we're saying the, the whole idea of urban resilience um, has it been taken seriously when it comes to our planning um, arena um, in Africa and for that matter, South Africa. And we're saying that most of our city officials probably, uh, I don't know, but maybe lack the foresight when it comes to accommodating the needs of um, a section of our urban actors who are the, um, those in the informal economy, specifically informal traders. And we probably need our uh, policymakers to, to revisit um, this subject and start to come out strongly in, in the strategies um, and plans that they prepare and hopefully we'll be on our way in um, promoting the principle of spatial equity and um, getting the economic transformation agenda um, come to play in our spaces. So it's, it's spatial equity uh, possible in South Africa. I mean, uh, looking at the, the history of South Africa coming from apartheid and where planning was used um, as a tool uh, for segregation, it, it becomes very difficult to see how one can now negotiate its way out of this um, historic um, demeanor. And we're saying, well, whose responsibility is this? Um, I believe that planners have a responsibility to create sustainable spaces, um, integrated spaces, um, ensure that at least we have some acceptable level of um, equitable land use. Obviously, um, the issues of the land market comes into play, but we, we have a role to play using the instruments that we have at our disposal. 
Then at a policy direction, um, the provincial growth and development strategy is very clear on what the strategic uh, goal and objectives are when it comes to um, spatial equity. And it, it looks at um, promoting integrated um, land use in a, a local government settings. And they are the local government is actually the, the mandated institution to, to look at that. So they need to set um, the pace in terms of that. And, but then also we have to deal with the influence of the country's history where land becomes, or land is a highly uh, contested resources, um, which has been influenced by um, apartheid capitalism. And, and also how do we get our um, informal sector actors to claim their space um, in the context of um, spatial equity? So uh, our view is that it, 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 this is a balancing effort, okay? And from this quote that I got from Annie Mark and McLaren, it says that ideally our land use management system um, should encompass, it's a various, it's, it encompasses various sectoral interests that are balanced against the overall um, development objectives. And it gives a pictorial view of what land use management is the land information that we need, the policy and the law that governs. So our discussion is mainly about the policy and the law here. And then also how we implement it um, to achieve um, sustainable um, development. So just, uh, uh, um, just to orientate you where Peter Marisberg is. So we have South Africa here and the province of KwaZulu Natal on the east coast, and then we have Peter Marisberg, which is um, just about 45 minutes from the city of Durban, uh, which is the coastal town. So, Peter uh, Durban is our main economic hub with the harbor and a couple of things, and Peter Marisberg is actually the capital of the province. So, it's just about 45 minutes inland of, of Durban, and it services quite a large area of, of the province. So the series of events um, that we had to go through. So in March, um, towards the end of March, we had the national lockdown, um, the disaster management regulations were released, and then there was the need to cater for essential services. So the CIPC, which is the body that um, does re uh, registration of businesses and so forth, decided that they could issue special permits, but it was limited to formal businesses because that is where their mandate lies. They do not deal with um, the informal um, sort of economy. So there was an outcry from especially informal traders because remember this is a survivalist economy that um, is prevalent in most of Sub-Saharan Africa. And therefore getting them cut off from their source of income and livelihood was, quite a bit daunting. So then the local authorities um, stepped in um, to issue some special permits um, to these traders. And what had happened was we had people who were trading. So they actually qualified for those special permits and those who could renew their permits and so forth. But then there was also an influx of um, new um, applicants because some people um, weren't sure how, how their next uh, meal was going to come. So because the informal sector is almost like an um, easy entry, easy exit sort of sector, a lot of um, new applicants came, but obviously most of them, like, they were turned down um, for these special permits. Then after that, provincial government had to step in and say, well, um, we know you want your traders to be back um, to earn a, um, a living, but there are health protocols and as a responsibility um, for the disaster management regulations, there was a need to issue a secular for them to adhere to the health protocols, mainly social distancing, um, the supply of PPEs and so forth. But once the secular went out, we started to get some um, communication back to say, well, Yes, we acknowledge your secular, but unfortunately, we do not have 
alternative um, spaces where we can accommodate um, the spillover because by um, us um, accommodating traders using the 1.5 meter um, sort of distance, it means that we will need more space to accommodate the Romanian traders and we do not have um, that. So we, in, in, in terms of this, we, 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 our discussion looks at how, how do we get our informal traders or the people in the informal sector to, to navigate or negotiate space um, in our urban spaces. Um, firstly, we say that traders operate within the ambit of um, local uh, locational convenience. So where there's a lot of foot traffic, pedestrian traffic, that's where they're mostly um, located. So in Peter Marysburg, you see that a lot of our traders are around um, where they are formal shops. So they set base in front of a shop, probably go into some informal negotiation um, with um, the shop owner and they're allowed to trade there. But on a more official basis, the municipality allows them to trade around our taxi ranks. Those are our bus, mini bus ranks and uh, that is where they are actually um, catered for, even within the land use scheme. Then also, um, before COVID, I mean, the closeness of traders in terms of how they locate, I mean, distancing between traders has never been a source of um, contention until um, COVID-19. And then this new space requirements now becomes something that one had to think about because clearly um, our local authorities did, never thought that such a risk or uncertainty would arise. So um, they were caught with their pants down when it came to um, making sure that informal traders were accommodated within the urban space. Okay, so in, on this slide, you see um, the green outline is, actually um, demarcating our area where there's, there's a very high concentration of um, informal traders and other informal activities that take place um, in the CBE. And this is also an extract on the slide. There's an extract of the land use scheme for the, for the city. So I overlaid um, the boundary that I had drawn. And in looking at the land use scheme, there were mainly two zones. So all the dark blue and the, the royal blue that you see is actually, so this is the heart of the city, okay. There was um, a zone for coal mixed use, which says coal mixed use one, and it looks at um, a, a high range of, or commercial activities with high intensity. And then the next one was the medium impact mixed use. So just um, outside of the key, um, intensity areas was the medium. So in those areas, you find um, some um, mechanical shops, um, auto mechanical shops are very sort of not too intense activities. And you find some of these um, traders there um, in these areas. But in all of these, um, I looked at the, the permissible and um, consent users that are allowed in these zones and none of them even mention informal trading as an uh, as either a permissible use or a use under consent. So clearly they, they, they were not even part of the equation when um, they were considering uses that could be in the court. Meanwhile, uh, the, the concentration of our informal traders are in the CBD. Okay, and then it gives a very um, sort of questionable definition to what informal trading is. It says it means a predetermined area within um, where informal activity may be permitted in accordance with municipal policy and bylaws. And I'm wondering what is predetermined? I, I'm still trying to figure out what predetermined um, is. And these are just photos of um, some of our areas where we have. So obviously you see people on the sidewalks. So there's this uh, sort of um, mixed use happening 
on our sidewalks. So concluding um, observations, um, we say that traditional zoning for formal commercial activities to boost uh, business um, is a norm, but certainly not for um, our informal businesses or informal traders. The allocation um, of land uh, for informal trading is mainly probably an afterthought, mainly by even the definition which is predetermined and doesn't necessarily give a definite definition to, to that. You know, so, um, and it's just relegated to locational availability for the actors themselves. Okay. And they normally, or most uh, local authorities regulate informal economy using trade and bylaws, uh, which are often vague and are mainly on the regulatory mechanisms such as permitting and enforcement, but they haven't been catered for when it comes to um, the concept itself and the framework within which the economy needs to um, operate. And um, in this time of um, uncertainty, uh, we realize that uh, ris a risk assessment uh, probably is never done. And then um, the scheme is just based, the informants are based on the traditional um, aspects that we know of. Hearing the voices of our uh, informal actors is very important when it comes to our policy development and decision-making practices, which I believe is a starting point for the spatial equity debate. Um, I believe that a little bias towards um, economic informality is, first of all, an, an acknowledgement of your presence in the urban space and uh, their inherent contribution to economic growth. Um, integrated land use management must demonstrate its integratedness through adequate consideration for both objective and subjective principles. Risks and uncertainties must be part of the thought process um, in dealing with uh, space requirements and uh, for our informal actors. And also to the need to understand the inherent uh, transactional linkages between uh, formal and informal economic actors and therefore uh, setting the tone to promote shared spaces um, in the urban fabric. And also, most importantly, uh, the local government mandate is to create an enabling environment for business to thrive. But clearly we see that the business here, it's in quotes, um, formal and does not relate to uh, informal businesses. So there's quite a lot that needs to be done when it comes to um, incorporating the views and voices of informal traders um, in the urban space. So I got these two quotes. Um, Oduwaye and Olajide say that uh, informality is a phenomenon which was not created by the planner, but which has to be managed through his competence. And I don't really agree with that because um, David Harvey said, the right to the city is far more than the individual liberty to access urban resources. It is a right to change ourselves by changing the city. It is more of a common rather than an individual right, since it is um, this transformation inevitably depends upon the exercise of a collective power to reshape the process of urbanization. And he argues that ignoring this or neglecting this is actually neglecting um, human rights. So in this case, we know that the human rights of a certain group of people within the urban fabric is actually being neglected. Um, within the so-called integrated um, land use um, management that we have in, um, in our cities. On that note, I say thank you and um, siabonga in Zulu um, to our listeners. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Yvonne, for your uh, presentation and, and, and giving us like insights from, from practice. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, incredible. I mean, if you are in that position and you are aware of, of what, what are the, the um, points of strengths, what are the, where are the weaknesses and what, what is needed to be done to improve the, the, the practice, I think this would be, I mean, this is the best that we can get uh, through this dialogue between academia, again, and 
practice. So thanks again. Um, uh, questions at the end. Thank you. All right, then, chat. Um, so now moving to the uh, fourth uh, presenter, um, uh, Juana, no, Juana, Juana de Mesquita Lima. Uh, she's a PhD candidate from, um, in, in the field of urbanism at the Research Center for Architecture, Urbanism and Design, uh, CIED, uh, University of uh, Lisbon. And she would be presenting, leaving the one behind, heartless in the access to the city. So the mic is yours. Hi, wait. Uh, yes. Sorry, I'm trying to open up here. Hi all, um, wait. are you seeing anything? No. We can see you. Yes, yes, sorry. I'm trying to, sorry, it's not allowing me to share. Um, so if you've got the, for some reason, it's not allowing me to share. Apologies for that. I'm the having host. issues with. Can you give Juana the the option to share her screen? We could try to look for the presentation, but it will take a minute. So. Uh... Apologies for that. If Juana, if you sure. need to recheck, but in the meantime, when I'm looking for it, maybe you can try to 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 still share the screen and let's see what I can find in our files. Yes, I'm trying. I just um I just turned my other one off, and for some reason, it's not working. The screen sharing should be enabled for everybody, so I'm not sure. Yes, no, I'm tr I'm trying to share apologies. It just says that um there are. We are also good in time, Joanna. Sorry? We are good in time, so. Okay. Okay, so I think that and le leaving no one behind, right? Let me try to yes. let me try to do that. There you go. Can, can yes, you see it? Precisely. So yes, you will, thank you will you. need to tell me when I when I'm supposed to change the slide, but I hope it's not a problem. Okay, okay, I'll just <laughs> okay. So apologies for this. Um so just very briefly, so we don't run into time. Um so this is part of my PhD dissertation, my, my PhD research. And um, I carried out some interviews locally in Timor, in uh, East, uh, Delhi, in the capital city. And uh, this, uh, this presentation is mostly really about figuring out some of the issues that, some, only some that came out and the interaction with the local research um, and policy, um, possible policy interventions here. So if you can change. Can change the slide. Okay, thank you. So this is just to give you a perspective. It's a post-conflict city. It was hit by conflict in um, 99 with a referendum for um, independence from Indonesia. And um, so the city has been still in a bit of a chaotic state. And in 2006, again, it was hit by civic conflict. So if you can uh, change. So it gives you, this just to give you an idea that the city is really caught between mountains and the coast, and it suffered huge fa fast growth rates um, with people moving from rural areas to urban areas and very deregulated. There's a weak regulatory framework. There's, a, there's still a lot of uh, complex land legislation as well that's being developed. There's quite a conflict between different types of ty types of titling and um, infrastructure has been developed at different scales. So there is infrastructure developed by the, at the national level but there's also on the ground more at the sub-municipal even because municipal uh, local governments are still being put into effect, but there are small on the ground projects that are being developed and with community input, although there are some issues with transparency. So there is some positive interaction there already. So if you can change. 
So and um, this we can just move forward because basically that's the grounding of the um, of the perspectives that we're trying to kind of like Marcel Valdo said yesterday, trying to bring make sure that we have citizens uh, citizens have access to the city. So um, here's just really an image that there has been uh, there has been an increasing concern with making the city more accessible to everyone. Um, there has been infrastructure development. There has been concern in terms of access for all safety for daily movement and consideration for those who have difficulties and mobility. And part of this has come out of work done by small advocacy groups who have been part also being supported by research and um, by international development partners who have worked with these advocacy groups. And it's also been uh, supported or even included with some of the veterans for the resistance movement. So during the, the conflict between Indonesia and Timor, there was the resistance movement and uh, those of the veterans of this war also still have a lot of um, strength and force. And so um, through the force of these people, there has been some increasing consideration in terms of what is needed for public space and accessibility and mobility. So if you can change. However, there are huge problems with this as well. And um, there is a lack of maintenance and upkeeping and although there are concerns that have been transmitted, this happens with a lot of the infrastructure. This whole is just a kind of a characterization of this. And one of the issues that has come up, um, and I think in a way it also addresses, uh, it links nicely into, into what a um, colleague who just presented also put, is actually the informal economy. And one of the questions that is, that is put a lot by the communities is actually in terms of safety within these sidewalks. We have a lot of the street uh, vendors um, aggregating on the sidewalk, and this creates some safety issues, particularly for young girls walking on the sidewalk or leaving the, the bus route. And although the government has on occasion said, okay, no one, no more people here, we need to move them out, they've also not really given them um, solutions in terms of where to go. So this is, um, these are all part of um, significant issues that are occurring in the city and that haven't pulled out by communities, by small groups, by small, small advocacy groups that haven't been transmitted into policy yet. So if you can change. Okay, um, it's, it, this map here shows the different bus routes of the city. So there are 12 and it's something that's been formalized recently. Now, even though the center is fairly well served and this works also signifies also in terms of public spaces, um, this is uh, a big issue in the city that you see the center is really, really very well served, but the areas of urban sprawl, the areas where more people are moving into, they're increasingly um, densifying, but there's still no real movement in terms of creating better conditions for them. And this is something that concerns, particularly in, in terms of um, safety. And I, and I and I and I guess it also refers a little bit to what we said in the previous um, in the in the previous panel by Andrea Rigon that um, actually you have groups of people, groups of youth in particular, who are getting together and they have different functions. To, uh, in Timor, the the some youth groups are very important, but they're also association with martial arts groups. And what um, civil society has also tried to to say in their collection transmitted to the government that you need more public spaces, you need more space for the communities, for these groups to actually uh, engage in their activities without actually using the public space for it and without actually creating that tension with the population uh, of that area, with the other communities of that area. Because this has also been leading to some tensions and in, in occasion has led to some conflict between different groups and different, different um, communities. If you can change. And so this just uh, to give you a perspective on um, what the city is like in the areas of urban school and also some densification in the central area. So one of the things that local researchers are also discussing now and, and, and trying to give access to is that they're looking at the types of materials that these people are using. And what they have said is that you need to create a better connection between the production of uh, materials at the moment and um, those that, uh, and what people are actually accessing and producing. So it's very, very sensitive on this, on, on this issue. So you can change. Um, 
we can change slides, please. Thank you. Okay, and, and in terms of this, um, in terms of the actual housing and provision of housing and, and programming, there have been um, projects in terms of um, addressing housing. Well, some uh, in terms of responses to the 2006 crisis, and there are issues in terms of the designs that were presented. Now, the critiques have been done and what, uh, what people have been um, discussing and, uh, and has been transmitted back to government is that trying to build models for people, model of housing for people, is not working if you don't work with the people. So uh, a lot of the housing models that were developed, uh, both um, in terms of bringing people back from refugees, from uh, refugee ca out of uh, IDP camps, sorry, and also uh, presenting housing solutions for more vulnerable communities have not been culturally adequate. And so you have local researchers saying, there hasn't been, uh, an international researcher, sorry, there hasn't been really this connection between the community and the designers. So there has been a huge problem with that. And there has even been problems with um, providing housing in land that is customary or occupying land for other big infrastructure that hasn't really been considering um, the communities and community needs, including building roads where communities need to cross through and lead, making, making them have to go through different areas. And um, in terms of housing specifically, what has been found and what local re what uh, pressures have, ha have occurred and has actually led to a change in policy is also supporting housing directly. So um, actually very recently, there has been um, through different projects um, if you've, to, to kind of address the issues of, of people who have lost housing through floods, they've actually provided support to, through actual uh, materials for housing. Okay, so there has been a change in the, in the policy there. So if we can change. Okay, and just to, to go through these um, quickly in terms of reflecting. So obviously we have common goal, that's not, that's not an issue. Um, one of the issues that has come through um, is in terms of international technical support. So even though it is very important and very welcome, um, there, is a, there is still a sense that there is international technical support coming in and there's no real involvement from um, the local level. And so you have local researchers and educational institutions and even civil society saying, well, we need to be more involved, we need to be more engaged. We need to be called in because we have the knowledge from the ground and we have the connections with the communities. And, um, and so there is a call for that. And there is that, there appears to be that space. And in addition to this, there is, um, there, there is also a call for this to happen, also to bring in and to be able to um, put graduates, recent graduates to work and in the technical um, department. And you see that recently as, as this has begun to really occur in the past few years, you do see also a shift in the terms of the technical offices and in the connection between um, people and actually being able to move forward and implementing um, some projects and programs. Um, also in terms of um, data, uh, this is an issue. At the moment, data is still very compartmentalized in terms of institutions. So you see that some civil society has data and they try to put it out and they try to share it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a flow between institutions, especially coming sometimes from the public institutions where this public information isn't so um, available, which also hampers the ability of some civil society organizations of being able to do, to do some work with the communities. So there is really a pull out to have this sharing of information. And you know, just anecdotally, anecdotally telling you that, for example, the GIS groups that have been created several times, but very much through individuals. And the fact that there has been this limit between institutions wanting to share information and making information more public has meant that these groups have fizzled. And so when we're seeking out information, it becomes uh, a big issue. And, but on a positive note though, there is um, the two more less studies association group, which is um, quite a, it has quite a momentum and it, and it brings people from different parts of the world who do study team or less. And through it, they try to make an, a linkage and a network between people working and they try and they bring together uh, people working, doing research at a national and international level on Timor. And they link them up with 
NGOs, civil society organizations, and even advocacy groups. And I try to link them up also with the government counterparts, so people, the departments that are relevant. So to try and precisely promote this flow um, of information. And yeah, uh, if you could move, okay. And just to conclude, try and and keep with the uh, with the time. Um, what this and just reflecting on these hurdles and on the and on these limitations of access to information and data, what this actually um, has brought through, and I think would be interesting to discuss, is actually to bringing actors together and to translate them. So actually bringing together all these different actors and stakeholders so that they can actually start moving forward and help in providing um, information into policy development. And um, this really becomes the basis for um, evidence-based policymaking, which is very much needed. And um, lastly, and I think this is particularly relevant in a post-conflict context where we need to realize that there are things work on uh, almost on two clocks. And I think this is something also that was referred to yesterday. And then that you have the formal and institutional, which takes a very long time to, to build and reconstruct, especially in a, in a post-conflict context when you're kind of coming up from a ground zero. But you have this reality of the very fast growth in terms of, urbani of urbanization. That happens very fast. And there's a lot of production of the city, shall we say, that's being done there. And that needs to be supported and that needs to be kind of built up in a, in a somewhat of an incremental way that there can be this um, movement between the community and what the community is learning and what the community is doing and what the government is then being able to respond. Also thinking that there is an, uh, also a bit like uh, the conclusions that were being said yes, um, in the earlier panel, that you still need this formal, it's, it's very good that you need to work from the community base, but then you also need something coming from a more formal base. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh for your um, sharing your your experience in such um, very local specific case and and I think I would um, pick one one statement from your presentation um, you mentioned a model for people not housing and um, I think this is very interesting I mean the, the approach itself the methodology you're, you're you were not intending I mean in that case it was not intended to provide housing rather than providing a model that people can learn from and maybe they can replicate and follow to improve the quality of their housing. And I also would reflect, like the reflections you mentioned, the capacity of local academia, one of the, of the points you mentioned, and linking this to the uh, supporting the civil society. I think this is very important, like enhancing the, the capacity of the local community themselves, the institutions like NGOs, um, CBOs, and yeah, and data also, of course, is very important and how this would be reflected on the policy at the end in your conclusion. So thanks a lot. And uh, the questions uh, would be uh, posted later. Um, thanks again. So now we move to the fifth uh, presentation uh, in this session. Dr. Vicente Sandoval, actually uh, is a like, old colleague of mine. Um, he did his uh, master's in urban management at U Berlin and then his PhD from the UCL Development Planning Unit, DPU. And currently he is a visiting postdoctoral researcher at the Disaster Research Unit, uh, Free University in Berlin. Um, he would uh, talk to us about living with uh, precariousness and uncertainty, bridges to good urban disaster risk governance in informal settlements of Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, showing us some um, cases from uh, different countries, including Colombia, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, and Peru. So, Vicente, please. Hi. Thanks, Hassan. It's very nice to see you. Yeah. Um, again, uh, you, do you see the presentation, right? Yes. Great. Um, okay, thanks for, for the introduction. Um, um, I, I wanted to start with this picture from, from Flores de Mancaes in Lima that I took years ago, but to, to, to talk to a little bit about before, to, to about their, our project, um, about the, the, the magnitude of the issues uh, that we are facing in the region, in the Latin American and the Caribbean region. 
um, especially because this COVID pandemic and, and many organizations have pointed out, especially the UNDP that will be around 30 or 40 million people moving back to informal settlements in the next years because the COVID. And, and, and that poses pause, a lot of pressures to the cities, uh, Latin American cities uh, in several sense. Um, so um, I, will, I will try to summarize the, um, the assessment um, uh, that we conduct in this region uh, with Juan Pablo Sarmiento from the Florida International University and also an interdisciplinary team in which we were involved uh, trying to basically assess the effectiveness and sustainability of um, eight uh, projects, programs, the, uh, that use the neighborhood approach developed by USAID in, in the 2010 after the Haiti earthquake for informal settlements. Um, that project that were uh, funded and run by NGOs in this region. So after three, four years of this project, we came back to them and tried to analyze, to assess the effectiveness and the sustainability of these interventions. Uh, the whole uh, report can be uh, consulted in, in the URL, in the link that is put in the corner of the screen. And also this, um, uh, we, we had a very strong component to, 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 to compare these interventions and these um, approaches in different cities. So uh, we have to deal with a methodological challenge and also because we want to incide in the, um, approach that USA, USAID has in, in the region, what probably you know is one of the largest, if not the largest donor um, in, in, the, in the region and worldwide um, in humanitarian assistance. So we developed this um, evidence-based catalog for them. So this is uh, just a list of the cities and the neighborhood that we were uh, dealing with, and the list also of NGOs from uh, many of them from the, uh, the global north, working in the global south, um, but also very relevant. So um, I want to share some pictures about the kind of intervention that we were assessing. Uh, this is the case of uh, Anse Foulier in IT, in North IT, um, where um, it was regularly uh, a settlement, um, a small city affected by floods. So uh, the USAID through the NGO um, developed uh, in very close, using the neighborhood approach, if you're not familiar with that, is a, is a very localized approach to develop the project. So most of the fundings go directly to the uh, NGOs and the uh, local communities and local government. So there's no treatment with the national government or regional government. Um, so it, it's also, uh, there are several components. One of them is, is a strong component of, of, of um, co-production, participation of the community in the design, development, and decision-making of this project. Um, naturally, we, we need technical that finally build this, this app, but many of them are um, developed and workers from the community. And this is, these interventions were not only um, um, the effect of this uh, intervention were not only in the field of, um, uh, of technical, that you will see a sewage canal and also a community garden in, 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 in Colombia, in Medellin, or a tambo in Lima, um, but also um, create the spaces for other things in the, in the city. One of the pictures in here in the corner, how the people in, in IT use the channels, the all the structure to as a foundation for a for a for a for a small kiosk. Uh, obviously, in terms of, of, of hazard, this is it's, it's not appropriate. But you see how the communities has been using these interventions in their own ways, and this happened regularly with most of the intervention that we observed. Um, the, the case of Lima were very important this uh, evaluating these um, uh, stairs because of course they facilitated uh, transport um, in, in, the, in the stairs, but uh, uh, there are all the interventions that were not so physical in, and it were not easily to link to disaster risk reduction or mitigatory measures um, like, like these uh, uh, community murals. But it was very important to create um, to propitiate this cohesion, a uh, social cohesion within these communities, and also to um, enhance the uh, 
culture of prevention. This was related to a huge fire that uh, these uh, settlements suffered uh, years ago. And it was a way to teach the kids the importance of keeping um, good practices. The other kind of projects in, in Colombia and in Guatemala from uh, just the, 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 the handrails in a, in, a, in a sidewalk to a complete house in, 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 in the case of Guatemala. Um, uh, other projects related to plantations uh, that create a green belt that facilitate that several projects. They are linked, of course, to sustainable development. As you know, probably I've heard about the discussion that the new urban agenda, the sustainable development goals, and also the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction need to be integrated. So the, this kind of project are very aware, especially the NGOs are very aware of this necessity of integration. So they work in projects like this, that on the one hand help to uh, the, the environment, of course, clean air and so on, but also reduce the fall of rocks uh, that came from the, the slide and also impede the expansion of the settlement, which is a big issue in the case of Lima. Um, because the, the migration and also because they are illegal um, um, developers, uh, you know, uh, profiting with this. And so because we were working with a, a, um, a large organization like USAID that uh, worked very um, pragmatic in the sense that they need to, to, to see how we will compare these things and how we are going to integrate sustainable development governance things and, and, and other elements into a one measurable, um, accessible way. So we developed several index. This is the case of informality precariousness index that is more developed in the, in the report you can look at and where we go beyond what the UN habitat and the new uh, urban agenda uh, propose about how to uh, assess informal settlement, not in the physical and legal way, of course, but also in the social world way we went into the social access to, to, to assess this for instance the access to social infrastructure like health education cultural um, facility, uh, facilities and activities and so on and, and many others and also we did the same things for other um, elements like uh, co social cohesion index that is more common we, we didn't create nothing new about that but also we uh, introduced these disaster risk governance index and, and others and basically we had a, a picture, um, an estimation. This is not so, uh, uh, it's very important to say that it's not the fact reality, but it's the numbers give us a, some as um, um, uh, um, an overview to see the level and how the program from USAID in the region is working on after several years. And, and, and we found many things that we, uh, um, we will visit in, in, in the report. And also, I would try to highlight here. Um, but uh, the, the the objective of this presentation is to go to something that is 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 not uh, in the core of the report, but is is very important from my point of view. Is the role of the NGOs plays in in all in all this um, process. So we found that they're they're enabling and impeding factor for good urban and risk governance. Um, um, so one is, is, is very important, we found through the focus group and interviews that the commitment from upper levels of local government officials, I'm talking about the mayor or the, um, um, the city manager and members of the um, uh, council as well, if we have found that they are not really convinced that um, integrating the disaster reduction with urban development and, and other elements um, of, of, of the precariousness of this settlement, um, it's very difficult to advance even when if they have the resources and the support from uh, from groups from think tanks or whatever it's, it's very important so the NGOs play a very important role in create and facilitate this commitment from the upper levels uh, official the other also we found that the lack of trust of dealers in local governments and authority what is very common in informal settlements uh, there is a gap between them, so the, the, the NGO plays as a bridge. And also we found the limitation of ex existing legal framework for disaster risk reduction and urban development that was argued mainly by local authorities. Uh, they, they, they feel that they have the tight hands and, and, and certainly 
um, informal settlement, I, I will not into the more detail, but you know these um, um, issues uh, make the things more complicated. And the other thing uh, is the turnover of municipal officials. Uh, there is a loss of capital and know-how regularly every time the new government came into the local, come into office, um, there is a loss of, um, um, of course, the mayor, the city council members uh, go, go away, but also tend all the, the, the chiefs and uh, director of certain department also move, including the technicians. And, and that's create a huge gap also in knowledge and know-how and also the, last, the loss of capital. Um, and I'm going to finish with this. Um, so we found that these physical works that you will saw these dams and, 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 and channels, um, in reality works as a catalyzer of participation and more importantly to ownership. We also measure ownerships, how people appropriate these this, um, interventions. And we found that as much as the, the participation is, is, is higher, that you, you, you get more ownership. So the people is more willing to are more open also to collaborate with other actors from the local government as well. This, um, this is was very important. Also in the process of the NGOs is bridging the gap between the municipality and these marginalized communities is the articulation of different actors from private and academia as well. It, this, this is a very important, a key role that um, NGOs do. And finally, um, um, uh, so beyond such factors, the, 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 our study found a circumstance that we refer to as a concatenation. Um, a concatenation consists of the capacity uh, of DRR project to advance on the achievement of other initiatives. This is what we define it. IT, for instance, uh, offer a good example. One DRR, DRR project uh, provides uh, an excellent quality pipeline uh, from the source of the water to the town. Subsequently, the World Bank built 10 water tanks and then the municipality built a distribution network. That happened in a time span of, of five years, more or less. And there was not intended that different organizations, humanitarian organizations, not the municipality, but interact between them. Nonetheless, it happens. And, and well, we, we claim that uh, this needs further research because we found a very interesting and very a powerful opportunity to, to make better interventions in um, neighborhoods. And I'll finish with that. Thanks Thank a lot, Kent, uh, for your uh, like managing to present uh, like such a huge, um, like working in different countries and uh, I mean, showing the importance of evaluation and, and like the assessment and, and doing this work. I think it's important and, and also especially um, the way, I mean, using photos visually, I mean, you are known as a very good photographer. And I think this is also important in, in the matter of knowledge transfer and explaining the cases for, for the audience. Um, yeah, I have some other points, but maybe I have to postpone them till the end. So thanks a lot. And um, yeah, so now we the um, sixth presentation. Um, by um, Mariano Scheinzohn. Uh, he is um, a professor of urban sociology at the School of Social Sciences, University of Buenos Aires, um, Faculty of Social Sciences Institute of Urban Planning. And he will present to us, um, the title of his presentation would be an analysis of the translation and displacement of knowledge categories between the academic field, public policies, and social organizations. The city of Buenos Aires between 2002 and 2020 regarding inequality and urban informality. So please, Mariano. You are muted. You are muted. Just please press the mic. Can can the host unmute him? <laughs> I can only ask him to. Yeah, now he is. Yeah. Now, now he is unmuted. Yeah, that's the same problem that happened before. Now we can hear you. Hello? Mariano? 
Yes, you hear me? Yes. Please put it in the full screen and go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, Aber, I don't know if. Hmm. Should be below, Mariano. Yes. You can you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Well, uh, my name is Mariano Jameson. Uh, I am from Buenos Aires. Uh, thanks first. Thanks for all of you and for the organizer. Um, this work when I presenting now is uh, for my my authors and Cecilia Cabrera. Uh, she is a professor and researcher from. Kai Institute of Urbanism, uh, Territory and Environment from University of Buenos Aires. Uh, I'm going to to speak sometimes in Spanish, um, but my PP is in English. So uh, the finding that uh, now presenting is about the research project. Uh, in the social science school, in the Spanish is resemblando las categorías de habitat formal e informal in the ciudad de Buenos Aires. Um, the, the empiric reference is the case of Buenos Aires City. Um, this, uh, the focus uh, period is in, in between 2002 and 2020, uh, but uh, later I, I talk about the uh, genealogic analysis. But the uh, case of Buenos Aires City is uh, 14 million inhabitants, around 10% is informal dwellers. Um, the empiric base of the research is uh, 250 documental and bibliometric analysis and uh, more than 30 interviews with actors and key actors. The, the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires have more or less uh, 1,000 informal settlements. Uh, into the settlement life uh, lives just uh, over 1.2 million people. Um, in this uh, map, you can see the metropolitan area and the localization of the informal settlements. Uh, more or less three types of informal settlements in Buenos Aires. It's asentamientos, villas, or villa miseria, and uh, some kind of uh, more precarious, precarious uh, uh, informal settlements. The principal hypothesis of the, the project, of the research, is that uh, an ideological space in the specific speciality regime produce an assemblage of academic discourses and knowledge, public policies interventions, and social organization actions that reinforce a persistent inequalities in Buenos Aires. Uh, this is a focus the uh, our analysis and the methodological strategic uh, was a genealogic analysis about the informal habitat in Buenos Aires. Uh, we found uh, three principal precedents in Foucault, Foucault uh, terminology. Three principal precedents or narratives about informal habitat in Buenos Aires um, since uh, 60s, more or less, to nowadays. Uh, one is legalistic, uh, that uh, narrative is about uh, dichotomic in, into legal and illegal, or inclusion or exclusion. Uh, the second one is dualistic, like a, a logic of uh, enclave or bolsones de pobreza uh, in, in Spanish in, in Argentina. Uh, y, uh, many policies uh, engaged to this uh, narrative is a renovation or upgrade or upgrading. Uh, and the third one is the structuralist, 
uh, the central focus is around the critic urbanism or, uh, and the marginality, no, so a concept of marginality and the policy of uh, urban movements. Uh, I think this uh, kinds of uh, narratives uh, uh, exist now uh, in, in action and interventions and in the knowledge, in many uh, research, in many academic discourses, and in the, in the policies, public policies interventions. And this, this imply an, a perform an ideological space and then in the paisajes, the paisaje de informalidad, landscape of informality, that reinforce a category of inequalities. This is a, a little provocative. I hope that you understand me. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, since 2002 in Buenos Aires, uh, we found that more informal habitat in, in many evidence of uh, empiric evidence and uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, data, and more informal habitat with expansion, consolidation, and densification than uh, uh, historical uh, informal uh, settlements and the new informal settlements. In other hand, more public policies intervention uh, since uh, 2004, maybe, with deep and technocratic interventions. Uh, the model in, in, in Buenos Aires is the plans of reurbanization, uh, is uh, planes de reurbanization, with uh, more budgets and than, than ever uh, to make intervention, direct intervention from the local state to the, to the villas, to the barrios, to the villas neighborhood. And in the third hand, the more social organization actions. So, uh, this plan of urbanizations uh, uh, exists thanks to the resistance and contested and insulted urbanism. Um, in this configuration, in, in this este scenario, uh, we make, uh, we, we look for the more persistent inequalities. Uh, the focus of our research is linkage, uh, uh, into, uh, linkage within formal and informal uh, habitat and uh, informal habitat and inequalities. The linkage and the interdependence between inequalities and uh, uh, informal habitat in the case of Buenos Aires. So if we have more informal habitat, more public policies intervention, and more social organization action, but uh, more persistent inequalities and more deep. So, uh, this need a critical analysis and critical point of view, and maybe insurgent research, I think, uh, with a critical reflection about practices, discourses, knowledge, and interventions. Uh, our conclusion and recommendation, recommendations in the short uh, and synthetic presentation is about beyond dualistic categories, uh, que esto pone el acento, el centro de indagación en la interrelación y en la interdependencia de lo formal e informal en la estructuración social del territorio. Second one is the critical tackle of representations, discourses and practices. Eh, 
to get under focus the ideological space that we uh, uh, use and make. And the third one is beyond to metonymic prison, like uh, Padura said. Uh, well, I think you understand me and thanks to all of you. And for the end of the conclusion, uh, this uh, uh, I'm going to say in Spanish, this is in, in, in English, in the, in the second paragraph. Dice, la evolución de estos conflictos en el actual escenario de incertidumbre interpela necesariamente sobre el modo en que se han desarrollado el conocimiento y las políticas urbanas, sobre el hábitat informal, y nos plantea la necesidad de reflexionar acerca de su futura evolución. Many thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mariano. Um, um, I think um, your theoretical approach um, from the social, uh, like from the sociological perspective, I think it's important and it adds a lot to the discourse, um, especially, um, yeah, I would pick up also some points that were personally interesting for me, like the interrelation and the in interdependency between formal and informal. Actually, you said this in, in Spanish, but I could understand it. Um, and the production of, of representations. Um, and yeah, again, the, this discourse, I mean, adding to this course, knowledge, practice, interventions, how all these different mechanisms can, or um, entities can function together uh, for the sake of, of a better quality for our livelihood for the communities. So I think it's, uh, it's important always to, to have this uh, back and forth dialogue between different um, uh, actors and stakeholders. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot. Um, and now we go for the questions. We are already actually out of time, but we still, we can have like five minutes for discussion and um, reflections, comments. There is one question posted um, by Marcello Balbo um, uh, to Vicente. Um, he says, I may have missed some aspects of your interesting presentation. I wonder whether one of the factors you have evaluated is the quality of the local government in the different cases. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's not the case. No, we were not evaluating the quality. Uh, but uh, the level of involvement with these communities. And we measured it uh, in several ways. One was um, how many fundings or programs they were running in, this, in, in the municipality inside the neighborhood. And, and we use other indicators, I don't remember well, but uh, they were also complemented with the interviews we had um, with the in, in many cases with the mayors and the city managers and also officials from the specific department, the urban development department, or the, in some cases, some municipalities had have the um, disaster risk reduction department on, on, on office or someone that it was in charge of that. Um, and, and we tried to evaluate the, the level of involvement uh, of, the, of the government, but basically that you know, wasn't the quality something that's not possible to measure. Yeah, commenting on this, I think the, 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 the index that you have shown, like bringing even the, the social uh, aspect, but you meant here the social infrastructure, like the services. Yeah. So um, I think this is uh, interesting in, in, in transforming the, the qualitative data into quantitative. I think with those um, numbers that were... Yeah. Um, I, I, I assume that the data is not available when it comes to uh, like numbers or statistics. And so it's not based on statistics, right? It's not based on statistics. We apply a little bit more than 350 surveys with 80 questions each 
in all these places. I mean, is this the overall? And, and, and certainly you have numbers there. When you apply a survey, you get the, the figures and you ask, for instance, if they feel, because it's a, um, uh, it's a perception survey, you know? So the people tell you if they feel they have access to an education facility, a school or something, or also the same a, a consultorio, a, a, a health um, building or service nearby. Um, and, and we also uh, correlate this surveys with observation made by um, um, uh, GIS, the position of the hospitals, for instance, or if we have public transports going around and, and, and yeah, things like that. Thanks, Vicente. Um, okay, um, well, any other questions to any of our uh, speakers? If someone has a comment or question, we are about to finish. So just <laughs> to close it. I see Yvonne here. You have a question or? Okay, no questions. Okay, so um, I would say, uh, I, I would first thank all the speakers and I think um, the presented topics were very relevant uh, to the session and and when it comes to um, like in like some some keywords that were very common and repeated in in all of the uh, speakers presentations uh, and inequality um, uh, public services and of course the, the this complexity of stakeholders and um, and how knowledge can lead to um, uh, specific policies or urban policies to improve, the quality of, of uh, spaces or um, cities, I think, um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a very very common in most of the cases, especially in formal settlements. I mean, most of the presentations were talking about informal settlements, uh, and also some of them focused on the COVID nineteen. So we're talking about like the most vulnerable groups within cities in in the time of a pandemic. And they suffer already uh, from like bad quality of infrastructure, including services like health services. So they are more um, uh, vulnerable to to like any uh, uh, either um, health hazards or even disasters or risks. Depends, of course, on the case. And and this leads to like the urge. I mean, we always say this. It's it's very uh, stereotyped to mention that more research has to be done, more collaboration between stakeholders. And uh, at the end, I would say this willingness to cooperate, it cannot be only coming from one side. So if, if we're talking about political will to incorporate and, and make use of the, the resources, like the universities, um, uh, researchers, whoever can support, I mean, it has to be done from, from, from both sides. And the same for the civil society. I mean, if the academia wants to help the civil society and the civil society is not really um, convinced that they need such help, this will not lead us nowhere. So more discussions and more uh, like um, round tables uh, between those different stakeholders to convince everyone that, well, we have to cooperate. and. Um, it will not become any better if we don't do this. Um, yeah, I think we can stop at that point. And um, thanks again for inviting me to moderate the session and thanks for the speakers uh, um, and thanks for the audience, the organizers, of course. Yeah. So I want to thank you to you too, uh, also Hassan and Paola for the conference and well, both Paolas. <laughs> For the, for the opportunity. They are the organizers. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you very much for helping us to uh, conclude this session in this way. And also thank you very much for all these um, contributions, which I find very interesting when we are talking about collaboration in the next step, let's say. Let's put it in that way. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you also for the wonderful uh, summarization summary from Hassan. Thank you to all the speakers and see you at two. So we have time for, for a lunch break. Okay, see you later.
rest yourself. We are now going to uh, the last uh, panel, panel five, moving. Uh, the sessions respond, response to the need of fostering a fresh understanding of the compl complex multifaceted interaction between ecological issues, mobility and urbanization, starting from thinking of the consequences of increasingly stringent borders and the effect of globalization, uh, the effect of global and local policy on migration and environmental migration. For the first time in the urban age, we are collectively experiencing eco-apartheid and it clearly goes to the detriment of the most vulnerable populations all over the world. Ecological crisis at least planning to develop different urbanization models drawn on more just, inclusive and sustainable mobility patterns and modes in which stasis and mobility can finally be conscious choices rather than constraints. So I'm happy to uh, welcome and thank the panel coordinators, Dr. Wolfgang Scholz and Giovanni Vecchio. Uh, Wolfgang Scholz uh, is currently a guest professor for international urban development at the Faculty of Architecture in Darmstadt and conducts research on resilient urban development in Manila. He has more than 15 years of research experience in the fields of urban infrastructure and mobility and in the field of informal urban development in the global south, as well as teaching experience in urban design, planning theory and theories of spatial development in both the so-called global north and south. He's also the editor of the book Transport Planning and Mobility in Urban East Africa, which will be presented tomorrow in the morning uh, together with uh, Nadine Haplans. Giovanni Vecchio instead is an assistant professor in the Institute of Urban and Territorial Studies at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. His research focuses on the social implications of urban and transport planning, focusing on social spatial inequalities and urban policy. So the floor to you, thanks, and enjoy the panel. Yeah, thanks a lot and welcome to this afternoon session. Um, we will have only five presentations, not six if I got it right. So the first one uh, dealing with Bangladesh and deindustrialization will not take place. And therefore, we can go straight to Martina Bovo from the Politecnico di Milano, um, at the, from the Department of Architecture and Urban Studies. Um, if I got it right, Martina, you're still studying, right? Or are you working at the department? Uh, no, I'm a PhD, so in between, oh, okay. <laughs> in between Sorry, students. I, I would say student for sure. <laughs> Sorry, I was just uh, using Google to get some inside <laughs> information. So Google is not updated. Okay, um, as in every session, we have the, ru the rule that the questions will come afterwards. So when we give all five presenters 12 minutes, then we have time for discussion. And please write it in the chat whom you like to ask and then a precise question that you are able to answering. Yeah, Martina will deal with the migrant landing in the lo lockdown, uh, which applies to all of us now, and the access to basic service, public action, and the preparedness. Yeah, Martina, the floor is yeah, sorry, open to you. Sorry, Wolfgang, uh, just uh, to say that uh, apparently we also have the six or rather the first uh, presenters. Uh, ah. I see at least a couple of uh, authors from the... Yeah, we are presenting Vulgan. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. I... <laughs> I will just uh, wait. There is no yes, problem. Then we <laughs> okay, the, thank you, Martina. This is the order. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I haven't seen it uh, because the paper was not uploaded. Okay, then we go straight to Bangladesh and in the world of uncertainty, the industrialization and deindustrialization in Kulna City in Bangladesh. And Mohamed Ashid Rahman will present. You're currently in Kulna University as well. 
Okay, then the floor is open to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Rufgang. It's good to see you after almost two years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the dialogue one. So uh, today, uh, it is a joint venture between University of Durham and Kulna University, the research project. And one of our research students, Maria Akhtar, she will present on behalf of the team. So I'd like to request Maria uh, to present our research. So could you please share the PowerPoint and start your presentation, please? We have with us uh, Dr. Felix Ringel from University of Durham as well. So Maria, please carry on. Thank you both for giving me this platform. So good evening everyone from Kulna City of Bangladesh. I am Maria from Kulna University on behalf of my team. And I would like to say thank you to Wall for this platform. Today, we are going to talk about the uncertainty of Kulna City due to the industrialization. Our major focus of today's presentation will to show that how an industrial city like Kulna declined over the time due to the industrialization. Therefore, we would really like to highlight how different forms of uncertainty people are facing due to the industrialization and urban declination. So why we are talking about Kulna city? Because Kulna was the largest industrial city in Bangladesh and the industrialization process started in Kulna during the Pakistan period in 1950s. At that time, the major force behind such industrialization was using different indigenous raw materials such as jute, cotton, etc. Therefore, we could see that the major income of Bangladesh come from jute. If we look at 1950s, sorry, 1970s, we can see that 81.1% of total export revenue was from jute. But the situation declined during 1980s as the revenue from jute decreased and went down in $46.8 crore in 2006. So we could really say that 80s and 90s, actually the most devastating years for the industrial sector of Bangladesh. And Kuna City was not an exception in this regard as well. While talking about the industrialization, we conceptualize the industrialization theoretically from the notion of the industrialization and its impact that was observed in global North cities. And as we have not found enough literature that could really focus on the industrialization and urban decline process in global South. However, we have identified a close relationship between the industrialization and urban decline. Therefore, in our study, we really want to see how cities in global South actually respond to the industrialization. While answering this particular research, we investigated the case of Kulna and see that the industrialization process was introduced in a very comprehensive manner by the inauguration of Chalna Sipo, as it is near to Kuna City, so which was a major influencing factor to start huge level of industrialization in Kuna. As the city is located close to Shundarbans and surrounded by rural areas that produce jute and other raw materials, which actually propel the industrialization process in Kuna City. And therefore, in Kulna, we have seen several types of industries, which are mostly jute industries and new spring and hardwood industries also. Therefore, the industrialization-based urbanization was observed in Kulna. The city was booming during 1950s and 60s. A lot of migrant workers came to Kulna from different parts of the country. And depending on them, a huge level of urbanization occurred in Kulna city that actually reshaped the structure of Kuna city, especially in the part we call Kalishpu industrial area. And that become, that become the central industrial zone of southwestern part of Bangladesh. But it did not last long. It lasted for only 20 years because we have seen the waves of deindustrialization in Kuna as well. In 1970s, the government of Bangladesh implemented socialist policies. Therefore, all the industries were nationalized but they failed to produce the amount of production that used to produce in 1950s. So the first wave of deindustrialization started in 1970s due to the nationalization process. 
Then we have seen the next phase of deindustrialization with the privatization scheme, which was advocated by World Bank under structural adjustment program in 1980s, assuming that this was the blueprint for dismantling duty industries. If we look at the timeline, then we could see that different waves of deindustrialization actually affected the jute mills in Kalishma industrial area in Kumasi. Similar things also happened for Newspin and Hardboard Mill. Especially when the Shundarban declared as World Heritage Site, it actually provided a ban on the supply of raw materials for the production of Newspin and Hardboard Mill. As a result, production went production cost went really high and these two mills were not the profitable one. And because of that, it was started out following the structural adjustment program. If we want to theorize this total process of the industrialization of Kuma City, we can see that their specialist thesis and failure thesis was very much prominent for the case of Kuma. The trade position of different industries deteriorated over the time and Due to the globalization and structural adjustment program and many other things, most of the industries were unable to compete in the global market. So if we talk about the global South City context, then we could conclude that the specialized and failure thesis really applies for understanding the industrialization process in global South cities. If we look at the factors, we can see that we privatization, a lack of proper implementation of national policy, corruption, mismanagement, lack of government support, et cetera, the main factors of deindustrialization for Kuna City. Overall, the government's issue that could really cater the industries for being profitable. This deindustrialization has also several adverse impacts. If we look uh, at economic impact, we could see that a lot of people become jobless in Kuna City. They're struggling to maintain their everyday life. Some people got engaged in different informal sectors like pulling rickshaw, walking as a day labor, et cetera. So their income source was degraded that also create impact on other business class people who depended on these working class people as their business also hampered. There have also some social impacts as well. Like a lot of people have involved in different criminal activities because the provided a rate has increased a lot in this area. And now people are not feeling safe in the particular area because of the total social structure was demolished. Now talking about the most important factor that really related with urban decline, which is depopulation. Due to deindustrialization, we have observed a trend of depopulation. If we look at the statistics, we can see that in 2001, there was around 1.2 million population in Kuna City, which was decreased to only 0.7 million in 2011. But the, this impact was very much prominent in the Kalishpur industrial area, where in 2011, Kalishpur accommodated around 39,000 households, whereas in 2001, more than 50,000 households living in Kalishpur. So the depopulation was very much significant impact for Kuna City. There was, uh, therefore, we could really conclude that there is a very direct impact on urban decline. After that, uh, physical impact is also very prominent because the value of property was decreased over the time and the workers living in the area, they are living now uh, a lower grade structure as well as the local commercial space also lost their glory. The people from different parts of the city need to who are used to come in Kalishpur for different purposes, but now are not coming here anymore. So if we look at the pictures, we can see that most of the industries have turned into ruin. So the Kalishpur industrial area, which used to be as vibrant as Ibajar, which is the most celebrated place in Bangladesh, but now become a lifeless land. And also if we focus on living condition, we could see that the housing are not suitable for living at all. So the overall impact is very much great in Kalishpur industrial area. So what could we really do? We haven't full enough response to restore the industrial sector of Kuna city. In terms of NGO, we could see that few NGOs uh, were providing very few training and that are not 
suitable and sustainable solution to create alternative livelihood for these workers. In terms of government response, the government did not introduce any effective policy, only introduced some sort of policy, and that was really problematic for those industries. One of these uh, policy was no work, no pay policy that actually demotivated the industrial workers as they only got jobs on a daily basis and not got any other facilities. After that, government was trying to lease the land for other purposes. But these responses are not labor intensive, where the industries were used to be. In terms of policy response, uh, the Development Authority of Kulna has a no planning document on the total industrial estate. And also, in a recently published digital area plan, there is not any particular plan and acknowledgement for the existing industrial estate of Kulna City. And now the government has shut it down while the public jute industries due to the structural adjustment program, which causes a huge permanent and temporary jobless situation. People are now moving from uh, other, uh, from industrial areas to other areas of Bangladesh to get jobs. Even the local elected representative is assuming that the number of voters will be decreased as well. That signifies the probability of more depopulation from this area. So if we conclude this whole case study scenario, we could say that the city of Kulna is experiencing the industrialization that quite similar nature of global North cities due to lack of state willingness and the city is not experiencing any planning effort to address the challenges of the industrialization. But there were some legal dynamics also. They are economic agglomeration and dependency on ecological resources. So if we really want to promote another wave of industrialization in Kuna city to revive the city economy and to address the challenges, we could really consider this local dynamics. However, the city is now becoming a very declining city and Kuna industrial area turning into a desert due to this massive deindustrialization in Kuna city. Every day we are reading different newspapers and can see very demotivating news about Marina. the industry in the city. Your but, time is almost but over. But the city is designed as an industrial city. And being an urban planner, we would really like to see a vibrant Kuna city again. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And sorry for interrupting you too early. Yeah, so. Thanks a lot. And please write down your questions to this interesting case that something in the global south happens what we experience already in the global north. And I think stories like this will continue as well because the global world is always changing and there's an up and down of production. Thanks a lot. And now we can continue finally to Martina. Uh, I will share my screen. Sorry, just one second. You used already the green button below and then a window should appear and you select the correct presentation. I'm very sorry. Uh, I'm here again and I should be able now, but uh, okay. apparently I had to change something in the... Okay. Okay. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, I'm very sorry for this <laughs> interruption. Um, okay, so um, uh, thank you for this uh, first presentation. Um, I will move a little bit <laughs> to the Mediterranean area uh, and uh, I will um, uh, 
relate uh, to the to the topic of planning in uncertainty uh, by focusing on uh, migration processes and uh, especially arrival or uh, uh, landing. Uh, and uh, this is indeed the, the framework I'm using for my uh, PhD um, research. Uh, uh, so about uh, arrival and arrival spaces uh, uh, within recent uh, migratory uh, processes around the Mediterranean. Um, what happened is that uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I uh, happened to do my empirical research uh, between March and October 2020. Uh, and uh, and so uh, first at a distance and then uh, actually working on the field, uh, I um, observed uh, arrival spaces in Palermo in southern Italy uh, in this very particular uh, moment uh, in between the two uh, main lockdowns that happened in Italy. And uh, this, of course, um, made me question uh, about the role that the pandemic outbreak uh, had in amplifying uh, certain dynamics, uh, but also in rendering more visible, uh, in a way, the response capacities of, of these arrival spaces. And in this sense, uh, I, um, I propose to relate this observation to the concept of uh, preparedness. So uh, just to give um, a little bit of a context, Palermo is a city in southern Italy. Uh, and um, as you can see, it's very central in the Mediterranean um, Sea. Uh, and it has indeed been a, a very pivot point for um, the most recent uh, migration trajectories uh, interesting this part um, of the world. Uh, and. Um, so if we uh, zoom in, um, basically uh, starting from the different uh, everyday practices of uh, landing migrants, uh, we can identify in Palermo a system of different arrival spaces. And so starting from legal procedures, uh, all the practices instead linked to healthcare, dwellings and so on, uh, we would encounter the police immigration office, uh, different help desks, uh, especially concentrated in the city center, uh, the dorms, of course, uh, different kinds of, uh, of public spaces. So uh, within this context, what, uh, what could I uh, observe uh, during these, uh, these months? Um, first of all, and uh, at a very general level, um, we can defini definitely say that the pandemic uh, had uh, shocked <laughs> this, uh, this system a lot, uh, and it has indeed amplified a lot of unbalances and, uh, and dynamics that, um, uh, that, um, on which the this, uh, this system of arrival spaces uh, is based on. So, for instance, we saw that many uh, public actors and public services uh, were completely unable to provide access um, during the, the lockdowns and even in between the two lockdowns, uh, while, for instance, uh, third sector uh, actors proved to be uh, absolutely crucial, especially in certain areas of the city, as actually we see in many other cases in Italy. Uh, and sometimes they, uh, these kind of arrival spaces um, risk also to completely substitute uh, basically the public, uh, public presence on, uh, on the ground. Um, however, as mentioned, I, uh, I think that what is interesting um, is really digging into uh, the response of, of some of these arrival spaces. So really looking at uh, what happened with the organization of the space uh, and, uh, and also with the, um, uh, up to the procedures and practices that, um, that happened. And um, in this sense, uh, I will, uh, I will um, go through uh, three of, uh, of these spaces. Uh, the first is, uh, is uh, the General uh, Register Municipal Office, um, which is basically the office where um, refugees and asylum seekers have after having obtained a residence permit, being it permanent or temporary, uh, need to go to uh, officially register to the, to the municipality in the city. And this then allows them to access uh, other basic uh, and public services. So uh, what happened in, in this office is that in order to follow all the uh, di distancing and restrictions, basically all the activity, the main activity that, she, that is waiting actually, um, has been completely moved outside the office. And uh, of course, this has been done with uh, quite chaotic and uh, questionable uh, rules and organization of space. Uh, but um, also procedures uh, changed. Um, so uh, we have seen how um, 
people were asked to book their appointments and uh, in a first uh, moment, all the services uh, targeting migrants were actually impossible to be booked online. So basically people would uh, keep uh, um, being in line until the very early hours of the day and this rendered the whole access um, very, very, uh, very, very hard. Uh, and um, uh, this, is, this is just, of course, a short description, but uh, what I noticed is that uh, here uh, the choice was to very strictly implement rules and regulations. And this choice, uh, I believe it was a will in a way, um, resulted in, a, in a hiring uh, the threshold of access to this service. So uh, basically they were not really adapting to these unpredictable changes, but they were just choosing to um, really strictly and literally implement all the given, given norms and this resulting in a very, very hard access to, uh, to this space. And this is, of course, not the only example. Um, but then I think there is a second example which uh, I find very uh, interesting because it's still a public um, service, it's still a public arrival space in this sense. And this is a general health clinics. Um, there are a lot in Palermo and uh, some of them uh, are allowed to provide also basic uh, essential cares also to irregular uh, migrants. And, and so in this sense, they are uh, very uh, crucial arrival, arrival spaces and references um, in the territory. And uh, basically what happened here is that uh, the General uh, Territorial Health Agency asked all these clinics to close down uh, during the lockdown. And um, however, uh, the doctors and social workers working here explicitly asked uh, their chiefs <laughs> in a way to stay open. And uh, what they did was basically reorganizing the indoor and outdoor space, uh, but also the uh, opening hours uh, so that basically this service could um, keep being uh, provided provided. And uh, what I want to underline here is that uh, norms were not just um, implemented in a way, but they were uh, a little bit reinterpreted and, and worked around. So of course there were uh, still distancing measures and everything that was needed, but they didn't uh, just uh, shut off the space. Uh, but uh, thanks to the availability of some subjects, of some people, um, they were able to uh, sort of be more responsive and, and more prepared to the changes that were um, occurring. And, uh, and then I'll move to um, the last example, uh, which is no more a public um, service, a public uh, space, uh, but uh, it, it is this uh, help desk um, service provided by uh, this uh, third sector association is the closed uh, door on the ground floor that you see in, in the picture. And uh, they also provide legal support uh, to uh, migrants, um, both regularly or irregularly staying in the city center. Uh, of course, this service uh, manages to be a reference uh, for, for migrants because it is always open and always present physically <laughs> on the ground. And uh, in this sense, the first lockdown was uh, hitting uh, this activity very much. And uh, however, once again, they, they, of course, they closed the space at the beginning, but uh, once again, there was a reinterpretation of, uh, of the norm and uh, they turned this space into a storage for uh, food packages that were then distributed to people in need in the neighborhood. And uh, in this sense, uh, I think that once again, what is interesting is that um, regulations were not just uh, simply and literally uh, applied, but there was this attempt to sort of reinterpret the context. And uh, here, once again, um, or actually in this case, more than in others, um, it's clear how they were able to, per, to, um, to perform this sort of negative capability. So the idea that when uh, coordinates and uh, old meanings are to be reset, they managed to still give a meaning to this place and to still uh, be um, a reference uh, in this sense. So um, I come to a conclusion and um, uh, what, uh, what I can say is that on a general level, what all these different um, spaces uh, showed is that indeed the COVID-19 had been a sort of jump forward and has showed us uh, what the risks and opportunities of, uh, of uh, our current situations are. Uh, and in this sense, I think that it also made us think a lot of this concept of uh, preparedness. So how to be prepared, who was prepared and who not. 
And um, when zooming in these uh, three different places, I think that uh, this issue of regulation uh, was uh, clearer. And of course, when we talk about regulations uh, mixed to arrival and arrival spaces, uh, there is this huge debate on formality and informality. Uh, so um, about formal and informal actors and spaces. Um, however, I think that in these cases, um, the capacity to respond to these unpredictable changes was not really linked to formal or informal actors, but rather to the extent to which any actor, being it formalized or not formalized, was able to reinterpret and to implement in a loose way uh, the rules that were that were given. Um, and so this wasn't, uh, of course, the case of the, the first example, where actually the, the choice to implement the rules very strictly was probably producing a result that was in a way wanted, and differently in the other two cases. So uh, what I'm saying here is that what I noticed in, in this response capacity was not really that what mattered was not really having or not having Having norms. We know that also informality, of course, does have norms, but it was more about the use uh, that was made of, of these rules. And so uh, I'm closing here just uh, asking whether this issue about regulations that here, of course, is still very much on the making uh, might add something to the notion of uh, preparedness. And uh, I thank you very much and sorry again for <laughs> the initial uh, interruption. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Martina, so um, I see already in the chat that some questions are coming up. So maybe also then for you. Thanks for this interesting case. And after having one of my former students as a presenter, now it's one of my former colleagues, <laughs> Eva Dick um, or Dr. Eva Dick from the German Development Institute, and she's doing research mainly on migrational issues. Um, in Germany, but also in the global south. So now she's heading us for Kenya and welcome Eva for your presentation. Thank you very much for your nice welcome, Wolfgang. And I'm still trying to share my screen. It's coming. Is it there? Yes. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for the introduction and I'm Could also very... This? Sorry, could you go for full screen? Please, yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks um, again for this nice introduction and also for having me at the conference. I'm very happy about this. And um, I will now start with my presentation, which is on local refugee integration policies in terms of tea. And I will talk about experience here. Yeah. So before, before, I should say that um, the present paper is part of a larger program development in which we we analyze migration and policy processes calling for the global to the local level. So um, maybe what Martina just uh, was just referring to, the issue of reinterpretation in ours, which is also quite important. So it's always um, being able to take up issues, even though we are looking at the topic really from a different angle. So um, it thought, um policies traveling to um, the, uh, the local and um, the global norms and policies I'm referring um, at today are global refugee policies and norms to refer uh, to two in particular uh, events in particular, uh, to the New York Declaration migrants um, and refugees in, uh, which was happening in 2016 and um, an agreement Compact on Refugees, uh, which was adopted by the United Nations in 2018. Sorry if I'm interrupting um, you. <clears throat> your connection is not stable. So maybe it helps if you switch off your camera and we only see the shared screen. Let's try it this way. 
If not, then I can share the screen from myself and you have simply the audio and tell me how to continue. But let's try without your screen, your video first. Yeah, this is what I did. So, um, is it, I hope it's working better now. Yeah, but, but we do, cannot see your screen or shall I share your screen? Uh, my screen and uh, with your presentation. I try again to share my screen. I've um, just selected it. I hope everybody can see it now. Yes. Yes, okay. So sorry for this, I change into full screen. Okay, um, talking about global refugee norms and policies. One of um, the, or the key recommendation basically coming out um, of the Global Compact on Refugees, um, for instance, which was building on the New York Declaration, was um, that the international um, community, uh, the United Nations, um, should now in the coming years particularly foster the local integration of, of refugees in hosting countries and communities of which um, the majority are located in the global south, um, it has to be said, and also should foster refugees' self-reliance. So um, this was a mere declaration, and um, um, subsequently there were countries which committed to implementing um, these, um, yeah, this changing sort of paradigm of local integration, and Kenya was among them. In 2017, Kenya, as a, the national government of Kenya, spelled out commitments um, for um, uh, an improved access to infrastructure, education, and employment for refugees, and also um, to include refugees in national and local development planning. And this was really novel in a way, because un until then, um, refugees were more than anything looked at um, from a, an emergency per, um, perspective and not really in terms of development and um, in a more long-term perspective. Now, again, the research question I'm now particularly interested in is um, how effective um, or, um, and how is it going? Um, how is effective is the localization of the Global Compact on Refugees in Kenya? And um, now specific, um, of specific interest to my presentation today, how does the COVID-19 pandemic influence policy processes and implementation? Now, just a few words about uh, the situation in Kenya in terms of um, hosting country of refugees. It's, uh, it's one of the main refugee hosting countries in Africa. Um, presently, um, there are about 500,000 registered refugees in the country. They are mostly um, staying in two camps, um, which are quite known actually. It's Kakuma on the one hand, on the far north, in the far northwest of the country, and Dadaab in the east of the country. And um, so there are about 400,000 of these 500,000 registered refugees staying in the camps. But then also a very sizable number is staying in the larger cities, in um, Kenya, particularly in Nairobi. And this is due to a, to a very strict encampment policy of the Kenyan government, which has not been abandoned. And, and that's an important point also of my presentation um, later on. Now, where do refugees come from? They come particularly from the region, from neighboring countries, or yeah, at least countries from the region, particularly from Somalia, um, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. And most refugees have been in Kenya for a very long time. That's an important point, also in terms of looking at long-term and development-oriented solutions, because it is not, um, about a sudden mass influx of people happening at a certain point in time. I mean, this also happens in the context of regional crisis, but um, the um, situation of many ref refugees staying in the country is one, is, is really a long-term situation, and um, which um, at least has been going on um, uh, for, for three decades. Okay. Now, 
I said before that the Kenyan government committed in the context um, of its yeah, commitments to the Global Compact on Refugees to enhancing the local integration um, of refugees and enhancing their um, integration in development planning, both at national and local level. And um, this is particularly manifesting in one, in one large project, as I am, um, yeah, it, it um, needs to be said, it's actually a, a development um, and humanitarian um, project, um, which is called Kelobeye Integrated Socioeconomic Development Plan, Kisidep uh, short in Tokana West. Um, and it's a long-term project running from 2016 to, um, to 2030. Its objective is to promote local economic development for refugees and hosting communities also looking at the issue of social cohesion, um, yeah, of reducing conflict, a potential conflict between refugees and hosts. And its target groups are on the one hand refugees, which are staying on the one hand in Kalobeye settlement, which is a newly created settlement in the context of that project, and also in Kakuma camp. In Kakuma camp, um, yeah, this camp has been there um, for three decades, um, approximately, and there are about 150,000 refugees staying in Kakuma and presently about 30,000 in Kalobeye settlement. But then the project is also targeted to, to the so-called local population of um, Tokana West. It's a sub-area of the county of Tokana and the population is of 320,000. Who are the lead organizations or actors in this um, project. It's um, the county and local government who was um, actually the initiator of the project, then UNHCR and um, the National Department of Refugee Affairs. Moreover, there are many, many humanitarian development organizations involved and um, active in different components, which are listed here in the table. So it's um, health, education, WASH, spatial planning, private sector promotion, but also protection issues. And the important aspect is that this mirrors actually sectors of the county's integrated development plan. So um, the idea is not to treat um, the refugee population, yeah, not to, to to um, calculate the re refugee pop, um, population in the county's um, development. So, yeah, that's um, the idea and the positive thing. Now, now my question, how has COVID-19 influenced the implementation? Um, first of all, um, and not so much about implementation, it has affected migration patterns. So refugees, who um, of, of whom a large number has been living and working informally, mainly in Nairobi before, they have come or come back to Kakuma and to Kalobaye, um, in fact, um, because they could no longer um, maintain their, um, their informal livelihoods in the city. So that's been um, a quite, um, apparently um, quite an important effect of the pandemic. So these um, shifting migration patterns. Then there were changing interventions on the, on the side of organizations in terms of a prioritization of emergency measures, what um, is immediately easy to imagine, but at the expense of more structural changes, um, important legal reforms who've been discussed before have been postponed, um, such as um, the inclusion of refugees in the national health system, such as um, the legalization of refugee-led refugee organizations and issues like that. So delay of structural changes is really an important point. And um, I said prioritization of emergency measures, particularly in certain sectors, such as health and WASH, and um, also adjusted activities um, in terms of training, um, such as training um, of refugees and um, also the, for the host population in producing masks and um, other activities um, like producing soaps. I mean, yeah. So, uh, been micro changes at the project level. 
And um, moreover, there were um, there was an adjustment of planning and communication modes. I mean, this um, was highlighted many times at the conference. Since in-person participation processes were impeded, um, there, um, yeah, there, there was um, quite a large barrier, first of all, um, to, um, to do participation or to, to implement participation and uh, consultant um, consultation activities in the first place. But then also there were intentions at least to shift to alternative digital tools, which in the camp is not um, easy at all, or it's um, it's not really it's not really a, 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 a good possibility. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I um, talked to a few um, informants or people, and um, science of remote programming um, was actually more an idea of um, yeah, um, or uh, an expression of intention. It would be important actually uh -huh. in please order to take, make. Please yeah? take care of the time. Yes, it's uh, only one slide missing. Yeah, um, to to more even more col collaborate with refugee-led organizations, with um, the civil society or a community-based organization there, and then a general call for to um, a call for um, emphasizing and focusing on resilience planning in order to ensure that uh, the settlements have the capacity to respond adequately to future disasters, including health pandemics. But these are, yeah, it's uh, great ideas and intentions, but then the question arises still, okay, what is uh, the overall picture of localization and translation of the global compact on refugee, refugees under COVID-19? And I would say to wrap up, Kenya, um, this has to be recognized, is among the few cases of translation of the GCR um, in terms of local integration in local development plans. Um, and um, it's also one of the few cases where local stake um, stakeholders have really had an instrumental role and quite successfully so. However, obviously this process is highly uncertain and um, the pandemic adds to this in a, ver a variety of ways. Um, some of them neatly negative, some of them um, more maybe with a more hopeful note. So um, the pandemic has reinforced refugee spatial segregation, even though it has maybe also contributed to, um, to, to enhancing the shared use of health facilities between refugees and hosts, as the latter have been going into the camp in order to use these facilities. Then interests in terms of um, political support um, um, to refugees has always been limited and now is even lower, but at local level it continues. And then um, in terms of functional demands, obviously the emergency situation um, contributes um, to many, um, many constraints in terms of funding and um, but might in the future also a pressure for new modes of functioning. And here again, um, this idea of remote programming and enhanced collaboration with uh, community organizations and refugee-led organizations. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Eva. <clears throat> and now uh, the quality was much better, so now it works. Okay, I will hand over to Giovanni to introduce the next two presentations. Yes, thank you, Wolfgang. Before we move to the next presenter, I would like to remind all the participants that the chat is open for questions to the presenter, so you are warmly invited to uh, write, share your questions, and we will have at the end uh, some time for uh, questions and answers from the, uh, from the authors of the papers. So now I would like to invite Menatula Endawi, uh, doctoral fellow from the Max Weber Foundation, the Orient Institute, in Beirut, Lebanon, to uh, present her work that uh, will show how, uh, how not only people, but also ideas and concepts and more are moving. So showing how the, com uh, the complexity of uh, the, the work that uh, labeled the session. So I invite uh, Menatula to present. If I am right, she has no presentation to share. Yeah. I, I have a presentation 
picture, so okay, I'm great. sharing my screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Minna Tulohindewi. Uh, I'm currently, as Giovanni mentioned, like I just finished actually my fellowship at the Orient Institute Max Weber Foundation, and I'm um, I just submitted my PhD thesis last week in Technical University of Berlin, and I'm also affiliated to Ancient University in Cairo. So actually, my presentation today is basically one of the outlook uh, future research that's um, that became very clear uh, as a threat to uh, dwell on later in my PhD dissertation. And I'm going to speak about this kind of what I call as local urbanism, invisible politics of uh, global dynamics and local context. Uh, I'm going to speak first about a, a background of my uh, PhD project, and, and then I will give a very brief overview of my dissertation and how I reach it to my understandings. And then I will present my um, proposal for a positionality on a, in a globalized and mediatized world. And in that, I will present some incidents which um, made me kind of arrive to this positionality. Uh, first of all, before I start, it's important to note that this presentation is very conceptual, it's very uh, philosophical, uh, in a sense that it, um, it stays an, in an abstract and theoretical level, and um, it, it's, it's basically also built on my own um, understanding of the construction and production and transfer of knowledge and science in a uh, globalized uh, world. Um, so in the beginning, my PhD dissertation was um, in, in a part of the Leibniz uh, Gemeinschaft funded project by uh, on the mediation processes and urban planning and changes in the public sphere. And in the project, we worked on the intersection of media studies and urban studies, and we tried to question um, this interrelationship, uh, and we viewed it as a two-way relationship in a way that planners and planning uh, are affected by the use of media in planning, and also media changes um, in a, uh, an urbanized and globalized and inter, like a transnational urbanism world. Um, in my dissertation, I tried to look at planning visualizations as facets for political economy. And in that sense, I looked at uh, five uh, cases of planning visualizations in the case of Cairo. But later, I will explain how I uh, tried to look at Cairo as a local yet global context in a mediatized world uh, setting. Um, so I tried to look, for example, very briefly on street billboards and the agency of uh, uh, and the geopolitics of billboards of being located in an in informal area, while at the same time, for example, uh, uh, promoting for a gated compound, a kind of an elite compound. I tried to look at, at also the language in the billboards in a context which is basically Arabic speaking and has high, high lit illiteracy rates. I tried to look at the press news on uh, state projects of uh, mega urban projects, and I tried to look at the local narratives and how the uh, contexts are actually affecting the, the culture and the entanglement of culture and uh, real estate advertisements. Um, to give you a more uh, detailed overview, I had a cumulative dissertation consisting of five research papers in which each paper kind of builds on the one before. Um, and I started with planning education, being very inspired by my uh, graduation project and how the use of uh, planning visualizations in my projects for, for me, like by looking critically at it uh, about five years later, I thought that um, it actually reflects uh, dynamics and structures of powers and injustice in the society. And I tried to look in this paper at the case of planning curriculum and how and which city is actually made visible in planning educations for planners who become later the um, uh, si future city and professional planners. And in that sense, I, I in the second paper, I looked uh, specifically on planning professionals and how the use of um, uh, billboards actually construct a certain role for planners to become more visualizers rather than planners in a mediatized world setting. And then in the third paper, I tried to go further in the public sphere to look at which city is made visible in the press uh, for the general public and how the use of, um, of visual politics in order to reveal kind of a short term uh, urban planning uh, plans, although initially planning is about long-term planning. And in my fourth paper as well, very briefly, I tried to look at which city is made visible to those who use uh, public versus private transportation. And in this paper, it was shown that there are in fact two parallel cities within the city that can be experienced very differently according to 
um, which means of transportation is used, which in fact reveals the um, socioeconomic background of the users. And in that sense, in my fifth paper, it relates to this image of uh, using the marriage narrative in order to um, promote real estate and, and having this kind of very entangled relationship to an extent that the marriage process itself becomes changed by the use. I will not say by the use of media, but, but by this entanglement in a way and how they are both kind of reflect one another. So in my dissertation, I had three main in, uh, incidents which made me um, kind of think of Cairo then not as a global south context. And I try to deal with it more as a local, local yet global context and to move beyond this global north and global south divisions. Uh, the first incident was um, when I was attending in 2018 a workshop on research methodology in the field of planning and urban studies in Florence University. And um, it was super interesting. I had a uh, discussion, one-to-one -one discussion with uh, Professor Stefano Morini, and we were, I was discussing uh, the need to theorize from the global south. And at this point in my research, I was still looking at Cairo as a global south uh, context, and I was very much interested in um, knowledge production from uh, Cairo uh, as a southern planning context. And um, Professor Morini at this time actually shifted my attention that maybe we need to um, look beyond the global north, global south, and think more like globally in a way. And this uh, kind of like when we had the discussion at first, I was still not sure um, if this is the way. And I was questioning even uh, his positionality being a global north at the end of the day scholar. But by the time uh, I started to see uh, a kind of connect the dots in my dissertation by uh, trying to look at this kind of, uh, by questioning, do I need to, to move beyond considering Cairo as a global south or not? And um, I found this super interesting billboard in um, which is spread uh, all over the streets of Cairo, which speaks about one of the uh, uh, promoted compounds in the new capital city, uh, which is a state uh, funded and managed pro urban project, mega urban project in the country. And um, it, it calls Catalan. So the new compound is called Catalan, and they are trying to situate it from kind of narrated from a Spanish, uh, like the slogan is live Spanish. So I thought then, aha, uh -huh, maybe this um, this could work out that maybe we need really to, uh, to move beyond the global north, global south divisions and to think about local context more in uh, an interconnected uh, global world. The second incident, which was also um, a kind of um, uh, provoked me to also uh, try to move beyond the Global South, Global North Division, is this poster by one of the students. It's a graduation project, um, which one of the students volunteered to share in my first paper on planning education. And it again, you can see how far it's kind of, it's, um, it's a project in, a, in an Egyptian university, but you can see how it is situated within the popular culture, American popular culture of Hollywood. So accordingly, in, in my research, uh, I try to look at the research context um, as a conceptual context. I try to move beyond having a geographical con context. And I argued that the mediatized digital world that we currently live in can be viewed in as a highly localized world. In that sense, I, I try to link media studies and uh, the work in urban studies on internationalization and uh, transnationalization of planning in intersection with the work in media and communication studies on mediatization of societies. Mediatization is basically about um, it's basically based on the work of Andreas Hepp uh, and other scholars on mediatization in media studies, which it is about how the society changes with the use of media and how this is a kind of an interrelationship and interdependent uh, network. So I, I wanted to, um, like digging deeper in media and communication studies, I wanted to uh, echo McLuhan's work on the global village, which is a concept in which he asserted that the new electronic inter interdependence recreates the world in the image of a global a village. And accordingly, mm -hmm. Uh, I moved further to look at so what other scholars are speaking about this kind of local and global occurrences. And I found that there are several scholars who have previously referred to the importance of studying local issues as global occurrences. At the same time, I found that um, there is a kind of a 
uh, I would say, it's a theoretical or philosophical understanding of trying to look at the world, not from a developing, developed world perspective, but rather from a macro scale perspective. And I found that also the Egyptian feminist and psychiatrist Noel Sade would use local issues as main representation and productions of wider global context. Uh, I will come back later again to this quote that she is saying that if I speak, for example, about Egypt, I have to speak about the world. And if I speak about women issues, I have to speak about global politics. And in effect, I, I situated my, I continued to situate my um, context in my dissertation to study Egypt uh, from a global perspective. And I mentioned that if I speak about planning visualizations, at the end, I speak about the local and global politics of justice and power. Uh, the other division that I also tried to move beyond, uh, not only the global north division, but also the developing developed, the local global. So I, I tried to somehow um, uh, break the vertical and like look at the network vertically and horizontally in a way. And I tried to reject uh, um, in this sense, the implicit connotations of hierarchy that are implied by these terms. So adapting a global perspective or trying to answer actually the conference question, how to plan in a world of uncertainty, I try to, um, like my proposal is actually to adapt a global perspective, which entails breaking the dichotomies in order to move uh, away from reinforcing the divisions of global north, global south, developing, developed, local, global, and so on, and to move towards a new forms of knowledge production. And consequently, I, uh, I see that uh, urbanism can be positioned within a wider transnational school of thought on neoliberal uh, economics and urbanism, global planning, mediatization, visualization, uh, maybe semiotics, new planned cities, urban imaginary, social, spatial media representations, and science and technology studies. So um, uh, what I propose is that maybe we need to think about if we speak about X, which is whatever context we're speaking about, uh, we have to speak about the world. And for that, we are. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually currently founding a network on a global world. And if you're interested to join or would like to share any incidents like these ones, which make when you see it pops in your mind that, oh, oh this is actually uh, a local and global incident at the same time, please feel free to share it to, uh, to my email. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Menadula, also for sticking perfectly to uh, the schedule. Uh, we now move to um, the next presentation. Uh, apparently, this will be the last presentation since we don't see uh, the presenter of the last paper in the program. So I now leave the floor to our uh, presenters from Indonesia, Diana, Zelina, and uh, Cynthia Rati Susilo. Uh, they both um, uh, studied urbanism in Leuven in Belgium, and uh, Diana is a practitioner, while Cynthia is a senior researcher in the Resilience uh, Development uh, Initiative. I give the floor to them with a presentation that uh, focuses more on uh, everyday mobility, uh, on urban spaces, and on the impacts that the pandemic had on them. Okay, thank you, Giovanni. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll try to share my um, screen. Is this can be seen? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Diana Zelina. I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, today, I will present my collaboration, uh, Small Research and Thoughts, uh, entitled uh, Unfolding the Potential Form of Post-COVID Public Space in a Highly Stratified City, the Case of Jakarta's Weekly Temporary Car-Free Day. So our case is located in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. The research was reflecting on uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, where the public space are challenged uh, as a place where people are suggested not, suggested not to be, since it is considered to transmit the virus easily. However, at the same time, the needs of being in the public space is still exist, where people could not uh, resist to be outside, and it makes the cities uh, are struggle to keep the citizens safe and sustain their mental health. Uh, we also try to collaborate this uh, and see how this uh, the initiative like Car Free Day event, uh, which is considered as a temporary public space could uh, compensate the lack of inclusive uh, and non-discriminative public space for Jakarta citizens. 
uh, who naturally socially segregated. So I'll move forward with the research questions. Uh, we came up with some problem statements about the public space discourse and how the pandemic conditions affect it. Uh, public space provisions in Indonesian cities is basically undermined uh, by the escalating of space uh, privatization and commercialization for the There was uh, common thoughts that the physical constructions of a project of public space by employing uh, the, the good uh, physical and architectural approaches as solutions. But unfortunately, in most cases, they are failed to uh, grasp the recognition by the citizens. And meanwhile, uh, a temporary program uh, called Car Free Day, or I will just say CFD, received great appreciations by the public. And later on, the pandemic uh, juggled and brought the interruption to it. The restrictions in response to the pandemic have further uh, stratified the existing uh, social conditions. So our research questions is to what extent the relevance of the CFP as a temporary public space for the future post-COVID cities and how the CFP shall be continued uh, in the post-COVID since the program had successfully become a place for all become uh, before the pandemic. Uh, so we also believe that the trajectories of public space discourse in Jakarta uh, is essential to be understand first. The history of Jakarta's public space could not be separated from the inherited uh, perception from generations. Uh, the traditional Indonesian cities and societies actually didn't recognize this conception of public space as a place for all. Uh, the public space was always deeply associated uh, with the authority symbolism. And even after the independence time, the modernization is directing a uh, massive developments in the city and left the cities with a lack of uh, open public space. Uh, but the social condition, uh, the society is still segregated. Uh, the uh, and then the CFD came as a solution that offered by the government, which uh, flows from the environmental initiatives into a comprehensive um, big public space program. And at the same time, the government do revitalization and developing green open space in the cities. So the above conditions uh, has resulting a distinct formulation to the public misconception in the city. And then in 2020, the COVID-19 came uh, and all the public space and also the CFD uh, are restricted for to be used. Uh, and, but in the other hand, people still try to find a way to be outdoor. So if we look uh, at the CFD program itself, the program has been run for uh, 13 years until today and gradually extended in uh, capacity. However, the pandemic uh, made it discontinued, although the government has tried at the first place to find solutions to uh, keep the programs to keep going. The facts show that the enthusiasts uh, for the program to keep continuing, uh, even at the coffee time, uh, the CFD demonstrated that there is a uh, social construction which generated enormous public life and interaction in the temporary public realm. Jakarta CFD uh, developed new engagement among the diverse sister socio uh, with socioeconomic backgrounds. So during uh, the COVID and uh, the COVID time, the applied restriction could not be followed by every group uh, of city society. The pandemic responses applied by restrictions to the city and its citizens. It was shown that the people's uh, uh, people's obedience in pandemic response protocol is diverse. It depends on their social economic conditions because most of people who rely on their daily income for a basic life uh, from the informal sectors who earn the daily living from the streets could not follow the protocols. So this uh, phenomenon create a more uh, stratified uh, social conditions. So uh, despite the official uh, closure of CFD event, uh, people remain acknowledged the main location of uh, the CFD as a public open space belong to them by, uh, so they keep visiting uh, the main location of the CFD every Sunday and taking outdoor activities. Uh, at one hand, uh, the number of activities uh, decreases, but on the other hand, it led to the new trend of uh, dominant uh, cycling activities. Uh, the pandemic has made social interactions reduce as well the chances of social encounters among different socioeconomic status. So we come up with the conclusion uh, by reflect on the case uh, that the Jakarta CFD denotes the flexibility as the key uh, feature to create a public space uh, is public. And then it could appreciate it as an alternative solutions of public space issue 
where the space become a natural ground for society to convey particular meaning of social appropriations. But in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the uncertain situations uh, demands planning that should be endured the crisis with adaptation and we think how to value our public space in different ways. We also believe that the context story holds uh, an important role to this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Diana, for the very concise uh, presentation. Uh, we are now supposed to have one last presentation, but um, I do not see the presenter. So I just uh, for confirmation that Mr. Lopez Morales, Daniela Villuta, and Ramarin Marin are not here. Uh, so that we can open, uh, we can open a space for questions to the authors. We have already received some in the chat, and we also invite other eventual uh, questions that uh, you have for, for to to share them in the chat so that we can have a, a more enriching debate. Um, I think we can start with uh, the first question that were shared. Um, they say to Maria, even if I, uh, considering the topic, probably these are uh, referred to uh, Martina. And uh, there is a first question by uh, Shaharin uh, asking if um, there are any ongoing processes at the civic level which gathers a response to uh, this issue. I think referring to uh, the, the arrival of uh, migrants and the response in, in the pandemic. Um, okay, I, I will try to answer. I, I was just wondering because Maria was the name of uh, the first... Uh, I'm not sure Exactly, if it was... sorry, it was a yeah. question <laughs> related to <laughs> okay. um, Bangladesh, if I got it right. So uh, Yeah, uh, I think I got Sharon's question. Uh, I think she is mentioning about any civil society organizations movement uh, regarding the deindustrialization and jobless issue in the industrial state of Kulna. Uh, for, for us, when we investigated the scenario in Kulna, we found that uh, the trade union uh, was uh, really functional back in 1970s and 80s, and still there are for some former trade union leaders that uh, the local term is CBA leaders. I mean, so this sort of CBA leaders, they are somehow arranging some sort of protest in front of the laid off industries. And few industries, at least two of them are still in function. So the laborers and the trade union leaders, they are actually doing some protest activities uh, under the form of trade unions. So this is the only civil society movement or civic movement, uh, not civil society movement, we would like to mention it as civic movement that is happening. But unfortunately, the government is not uh, uh, very uh, responsive to these movements. So they are trying to pay off uh, the laborers one time, and they are trying to, uh, I mean, manage the protest in that particular way. But in the long run, they don't have any particular policy that how these uh, jobless workers will be re-employed again. So we do not see any particular comprehensive policy uh, right now, but uh, there are some movements by the trade unions. Thanks a lot. And there is also a second question related to you. No, no, actually, this was my mistake. Uh, perhaps uh, two days of a conference. <laughs> okay, so your but, question is... Yes, uh, this is for Martina. So maybe I can rephrase it because I, I kind of uh, treated the first question related also to her presentation. So we've seen about that surely there is some public sector and uh, civil society uh, support system for, for, for refugees coming in. But I, 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 at least from, from other presentations from, from Italy, I remember uh, work by, uh, I think, Emanuele Bellotti, who, who observed public housing sort of squatting or occupations, which, you know, they were driven by civil society, but in the end, it was the criminal structures which kind of overtook the function of public sector by providing services, but also uh, extorting uh, something afterwards. So I'm very interested how, uh, did, did, did you observe anything like that also uh, 
in terms of not even even arrival of refugees, but COVID, COVID emergency specifically. That's a, that's a, something which was was I wanted to ask you. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I uh, I did observe something like that, um, and. Uh, so, um, of course, in arrival and arrival spaces, this is a major question also in southern Italy with all the work related to like agricultural work and, uh, of course, where migrants end up even sometimes without passing through the reception system. But um, as you said, with the COVID-19, um, this happened a lot. Uh, especially in the poorest area of Palermo. And this was not only uh, helping migrants, uh, but all uh, people. And uh, what uh, the, the feeling I had is that in Palermo, the sanitary crisis was not the first <laughs> to arrive, but there was a really um, dramatic social uh, crisis because, of course, there are a lot of people that really... Uh, ne needed help to eat like <laughs> it wasn't only about uh, losing uh, some income but it was really basic basic needs uh, in the very center of the city also and now uh, they are um, discovering how uh, criminal organizations that of course are also very much rooted uh, there um, gave a lot of uh, for instance food aids and uh, other kind of aids uh, during the pandemic uh, and uh, and this of course then creates this dependency you were you were mentioning. Um, what is interesting in the sen in the case of Palermo uh, is that third sector associations are very 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 present, and they uh, did this huge um, effort to sort of uh, um, where there is a lack of a sort of public actor. They were trying to em to empty that uh, that void in order not to leave it em empty for others. However, there are a lot of stories of uh, criminal organization who uh, provided these aids uh, and they they did it uh, a lot. And now there are a lot of uh, also um, um, articles that are coming up that are looking back at March and April uh, that are um, showing this very, very clearly. Thank you, Martina. We have another question from Umu to uh, Menatula uh, asking about the intertwined imaginations about the global and local urban development and ask uh, how you interpret if there is a reciprocity of the interactions, like uh, for example, there are, are there a uh, use of images coming, uh, for example, contemporary Egyptian context that find place somewhere else globally, or this one way learning of images, which might be even not existing reality. For example, the housing sector in Spain was rather also uh, characterized by a speculative real estate bubble. So this question for you, Menatullah. Yes, thank you, uh, Umut, for the question, and, and thank you, Giovanni, for elaborating. Um, actually, I see it, yes, as a, as a two-way reciprocal process, and I, I'm, I'm not really concerned only about Egypt. So what I'm trying to do in my postdoc is to actually move beyond uh, focusing on Cairo and to try to look at this kind of global local networks, in a way, and how this lending or this transferring maybe not only of images, of ideas, of uh, theories and so on, is something that's more networked. So uh, it's not only about how the global north finds a place in the public sphere in the global south, but rather also the other way around. So how, for example, questions like how informality is at the same time present in Germany is a question that's interesting for me to explore. So, uh, so yes, I, I think I answered your question, but please let me know if it is not clear. So maybe a question back to, to Unmut, whether, because it was a quite complex question with three questions in one. Um, Unmut, can you hear us? No? Hi, hello. Hi. Sorry, I need to just uh, rush uh, to put my, uh, do you mind repeating Wolfgang? Sorry. Okay. Um, Minatula, answer to your questions. Yes. And the, the, um, are you fine with this? Or because maybe the, the questions were not so easy to answer. Yes, that's true. I mean, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, she already answered, uh, actually. But I, I found very interesting that will be, uh, I'm hoping that will be kind of, uh, I'm also not expecting her to answer all the 
let's say aspects of the same question now, but I ho I'm hoping that that will be maybe opportunity to get in connection and discuss about it because I also find very interesting the uh, on, like this uh, uh, reciprocity of the relations and uh, and then informality in the and then uh, in the uh, let's say uh, global north. And uh, maybe we, we should really, this, this is also a topic I was thinking about for, for some time now, maybe we shouldn't uh, really talk uh, in, in this uh, uh, polarized manners and the dichotomies, but uh, talk about the periphery and uh, center and then how the periphery in, let's say, in a German context exists and so on. Uh, as you, I was just also just typing to her, uh, thanking and then uh, want to be uh, keep in touch. Yes. Thank you so much. I would love to, of course, I will write you back. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So in the moment, there are no more questions in the chat. So you still have time to write questions, maybe also to, to, to Eva and uh, some more questions to Martina and Maria and so on. So feel free. Luckily, we had one uh, presentation less, so we have more space for the, for all of us. I think I start taking advantage of these uh, few more minutes that we gained, asking a question to uh, Diana, uh, your experience from Indonesia, asking her about um, the politics, let's say, of this uh, public space transformation, the pandemic has, uh, in many cases, operated as a catalyzer of uh, political consensus around transformation that often uh, were not possible before, while in the case of Jakarta, apparently, uh, there was already an ongoing temporary transformation of uh, street space as uh, public space for people. So I would like to ask you if, um, the pandemic has changed somehow the perception of these uh, spaces. If the space during the pandemic now uh, are more appreciated or on the contrary, if uh, people are somehow, let's say, scared of um, interacting and sharing uh, space with other people. So how has the perception uh, from the general public and also from the institution changed around these uh, temporary transformations of uh, public spaces? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, well, actually what happened in here in uh, Jakarta, the, the government uh, tried to, uh, they close all the uh, public space here, all the parks, all the, um, the plazas and et cetera. And also uh, the car free day as well. The, they, uh, as you've seen on the presentation that they, uh, at one hand, uh, they, there's still a need of the people that want to be outside. But uh, the pandemic situation in here, it's unfortunately, it's uh, until now, it's the, the case is growing and keep go growing. And then the, so the, the government tried to uh, still uh, close, close the public space, but uh, it, it, it's become like, um, on off uh, and then uh, the car free day event as well uh, like in at the first case that happened in Jakarta in March they they close all this uh, this public space including the CFD and then on the uh, around uh, mid of mid of June the they try to open the CFD again because there's a need of people to be outside and when the government uh, close all the public space people people still go going outside so they're not so like they're not afraid of uh, the the pandemic situation in here so it, it's kind of funny because in here uh, the the highly the social condition the highly stratified the gaps uh, the the social gaps in here is uh, very uh, is very high and then so it's it's the it's really depends on each individuals how they 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 respond to these pandemic situations for those who scared to be uh uh to uh to be outside so they just stay inside but 
the other they still going out just like uh not not afraid with the 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 situation so that's that's why the government closed again uh all the public spaces including the the uh the cfd even though they they also try to find solutions like disperse the location into 32 location uh differently in five uh, administrative area but it's also not resulted with a a good result because there are many violations. So until now, all the public space are closed and uh, people, uh, the people now turn into uh, into the outer space. And there's a new trend here that people cycling uh, to get uh, the outdoor activities. So now, like if you going outside in the city, there are many people go uh, cycling. Uh, even in the main um, boulevard uh, in the city, so it's it's really kind of uh, uh, I should say it's like kind of unique situations in here because of that uh, social conditions that uh, makes people um, really it it really depends on individuals thing. So uh, here we're still struggled with. Uh, how to deal with this condition, actually. A little bit answer. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. thank you Any more questions? Last chance. One, will we still have time for one? Okay. Yeah, it was a very interesting session, very diverse. Actually, Giovanni and me, we discussed it before, how to bring all these different topics together. Actually, they are two totally different. So therefore, um, therefore it's uh, not so easy. But we've seen um, a very diverse uh, landscape of uh, very interesting is the case of Bangladesh, which has nothing to do with the pandemic. However, we see that there are other uh, forces which cause uh, usual, uh, huge uh, spatial segregation, economic downturn, and so on. And then we had two uh, cases which are really dealing with refugees in a totally different environment. And the current updated um, um, impacts of, of the pandemic and it was very interesting to go so close and, 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 and so deep into the topic also with a, a lot of pictures which helped us a lot to understand the situation. Yeah, and then Giovanni, we went to Lebanon and Indonesia. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the opportunity of seeing how, well, we had a challenge basically in this session of uh, uh, grouping uh, under just one word, one concept, so many different forms of mobility with different scales, with different uh, kind of reversibility or reversibility involving not only uh, people, but also concepts, ideas, models, as we saw, for example, in the case of Cairo, uh, also involving uh, very material uh, dimensions, such as, for example, the transformation of uh, public space. So um, I'm very glad of um, in participating in this session because it uh, really gave us the opportunity of reflecting on the relevance of such a widespread concept like mobility and also the complexity of, uh, uh, of of the concept and of the many meanings that it can acquire also for uh, research and the many perspectives that it can open. So again, thank you very much to all the presenters, to all the participants in the session. And now I uh, leave the floor to Paula for some last communication. Yes, thank you for this afternoon uh, starting question. And uh, my only communication is that we have five minutes of break. And then we can be back at 3.35 for the second round table. Thank you very much. See you later. Thanks for organizing. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all of you. Thanks all.
Thanks, Rufgang. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Ashik. <laughs> nice to see you all again. <laughs> yeah, good to see you as well. I, yeah. I was missing uh, the conference in person, but uh, it's good to see you in Zoom again. Yeah. Uh, Great. Yeah. Hope to see you again yeah. tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Are you there? Yes, Marco. Hi, Paula. How are you? Fine, thanks.
here we go back to the round table five minutes that became three and two are over i'm very happy to uh, invite uh, the speakers uh, for the, the, the second round table how to plan in a world of uncertainty proposal for research and policies which is quite interdisciplinary because uh, besides the architect Stephanie Howdy and the urban scholars Warren Smith and the urban planner Sandro Balducci, we also have the political scientists like Lauren Landau and the environmental historian Marco Armieri, Armiero. So I will ask you to switch your camera on uh, to start the, the round table. So, um, as said and also has uh, done yesterday, the idea of this roundtable is that of wrapping up what we have learned uh, during the day in the other panels. And in particular, in this roundtable, that of um, uh, kind of set new words or proposal for a research and a policy agenda uh, in a time and in next times of uncertainty. So I, I, I will uh, start introducing uh, uh, each of you according to um, the list of the program. So I will start from Marco Armiero, who is um, um, the director of the KTH, Environmental Humanities Laboratory in Stockholm. Can you hear us, Marco? Yeah. Okay, so Marco Armiero, as I said, is an environmental historian with a PhD in economic history. And before moving to Stockholm, he was a postdoctoral fellow and visiting scholar at Yale University, UC Berkeley, Stanford, and the Autonomous University in Barcelona, and at the Center of Social Sciences at University of Coimbra in Portugal. He's also a senior researcher at the National Research Council in Italy and of the environmental history field in Italy, authoring, among other works, the first Italian textbook on the subject. His main topics of study has been, have been environmental conflicts, uses of natural resources, politicization of nature and landscape, and environmental effects of mass migration. Among his publications there are the book Raj Nation, Mountains and the Making of Modern Italy, and several articles and special issues on, in environmental and history, left history, radical history review, and capitalist nature, nature socialism. So, Marco, uh, the question that I would like to ask you, also uh, somehow uh, taking back uh, Professor Barbo's provocative remark about how does resilience look like? <laughs> uh, yesterday, uh, he said this at a certain point of his speech, is um, how would you express your critical perspective on the resilient concept from your point of view, uh, the point of view of an environmental historian, and especially why with reference to what you call the lost cases? So, so what you mean by that? What they in the present crisis? And is the concept of resilience enough for them to, 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 protect, to protect them? How can it be outdone if it's possible? Okay, <clears throat> so I hope that you can hear me pretty well, right? Right. And very good. Thank you, Paola, for the introduction and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to this round table. I, I must say that I feel very honored and a little bit intimidated because it's not, how can I say, really my field, even if I am not completely sure about what my field actually is. I think that I'm talking today, especially from the point of view of a political ecologist and an environmental humanities scholars. So just to answer very briefly and directly to your question, I think I am among the people, the scholars who have been a little bit, how can I say, not so at easy with the concept of resilience and to be resilient. I remember a few years ago, I think that Maria Kaika published a very powerful article with the specific and direct title, Don't Call, don't call Me Resilient Again. 
So I, if I am not mistaken, in uh, the general definition for resilience uh, is the ability of a system of something to go back to the place, to the situation in which this uh, subject was before the stress hit uh, the system. No? So in a sense, we can say that, I mean, if we are thinking about the present, a pandemic crisis, uh, the objective of a resilient society would be to go back to the normal before uh, the pandemic. Well, this is a matter of this, this is something that it's very questionable, right? I mean, I personally, I prefer to align myself with those who are saying that the normality was the problem rather than saying that we need to go back to the normal. If um, uh, a shanty town, a favelas, or you know, a poor neighborhood is pretty much affected by periodical floods. Of course, they can be resilient and build the favelas every time the flood arrived. But we can also say that we need to change the social structure in the first place, and we should not have uh, this kind of uh, you know so, um, social urbanization in the, in the city. But if I can say something also uh, more uh, in general, I think that, you know, for me, uh, one way to, to think about being more inclusive and to think about having the, um, a more inclusive understanding of uh, planning in times of uncertainty would be, I think, participation. No? But uh, I, will, I would like to say a few things about participation, starting from three cornerstones. What I would define three cornerstones uh, for any kind of uh, planning with uncertainties. And for me, the three cornerstones are the issue of power inequalities, uh, the issue of narrative infrastructures, and the issue of revolutionary imagination. If I should try very briefly, in a nutshell, to explain what I mean with these three cornerstones for planning in, with uncertainties, I would say that. First of all, placing power, power relationships and, in, and inequalities at the center implies that even the most advanced strategies, including participation, cannot be understood outside those power structures. Second, planning designs space and ways of inhabiting it, but it also intersects with the narrative infrastructures which equally design and give identity to those spaces. One of these uh, I would say narrative infrastructure is precisely that of resilience, no? to be resilient and, and so on and so forth. And by the way, it's also interesting that uh, the, 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 the narrative infrastructure about, res about resilience goes hand in hand with the idea of you know, the neoliberal state, a state that is actually going away any um, responsibilities in taking you know, care of uh, citizens. So uh, the issue of narrative infrastructures. Uh, and finally, I would like to interrogate the relationship between planning and revolutionary imagination. No? The other corner of this discussion is the reflection about the uncertainty. And indeed, we live in uncertain times. The pandemic has, of course, exacerbated this sense of uncertainty in a very existential sense, but also in a very material, almost trivial sense. No? Uh, climate change is also bringing a lot of uncertainties in our lives. Uh, when I was uh, growing up in Naples in the 1970s, there was no way that you know a meteor alarm could close our schools or the parks where we were playing soccer. And this is what is happening today. But there are also uh, growing uncertainty that we need to consider, as for instance, the uncertainties connected to toxicity and contamination. You know, the uncertainty that you know we can ask. Are we getting sick because we live in a contaminated area or, or, so, or something like that? But there is also the uncertainty connected with the disruption of global capitalism. Somebody can ask herself, will my home to be transformed in, a, in an Airbnb apartment for tourists in the next few months or years? Will my employer externalize my job somehow and leaving me without a job, no, without a salary? So this is the kind of uncertainty that we are also facing every day. Now, as much as I understand, and I, I, I do agree that we live 
through uncertain times, I would like to make a different uh, <laughs> argument here, maybe a bit controversial. But my impression is that too often our planning, and uh, with it, with this I mean our vision of the future, is not uncertain at all. Actually, it's pretty certain, I would say. Uh, of course, you know, when we speak about uncertainty, generally we are speaking about something bad, something pre you know precarious, not secure. Uh, but we should also recognize that uncertainty also opens a space for the possible, for what is not yet decided, for what is uh, not what we would expect. From this point of view, I have the impression that our planning, our looking into the future is rather, uh, you know, stuck with what is certain, no? If I use the three cornerstones that I mentioned before, I would say that uh, basically our planning does not challenge power relations. It either moves comfortably, comfortably through the given narrative infrastructure or it ignores this narrative infrastructure. And of course, it does not dare even to try any revolutionary imagination. So I am not saying that there is no consideration for uncertainties. Of course, we are planning with uncertainties, but uh, our planning of the uncertain is framed within what is certain and what must be certain, fixed, even unchangeable. If the uncertainty is the possibility of a flood to hit an area of the city, we plan accordingly in a certain way However, we leave the very frame, the very infrastructure, more or less, you know, uh, untouched. Arundhati Roy has written very recently that, for instance, the COVID pandemic is a, is a portal, a door opening into another possible world. Now, of course, a world that can be a progressive one only if activists will be, you know, pushing towards this kind of result. And, you know, I can also refer here to Mark Fisher's capitalist realism. Even what is uncertain is actually framed within a very narrow and not questionable certain what is uh, sure, no? In a sense, we are repeating the old neoliberal ad adagio, I think. So there is no alternative. And I guess I think that what is needed is actually to push back to uh, to this so uh, sometimes we say that we need to stay with the troubles no uh, quoting donna arway i i wonder if we need to be the trouble sometimes i see no trouble around me and i think that what is really the challenge here it is, is to be the trouble to trouble what is uh, certain and i don't know if i should stop here what is the idea if it's more like a you know I can come back or I should maybe go ahead and close my um, thinking about this. Maybe we, we can stop for now and because you already raised the uh, radical critical remarks and uh, big issues and I would continue our, um, uh, let's say, golden track with uh, Alessandro Balducci. So words to the panel. <laughs> Alessandro Balducci is a full professor of planning and urban policies at the Polytechnic of Milan. He also served as vice, vice rector uh, of Polytechnico from 2010-2015. He was head of the Department of Architecture and Planning. He's also president, was also president of ISO for the Association of European Schools of Planning. Uh, chair of the Italian Society of Urbanists and among the founding members of the European Urban Research Association. So, Paul Eura. He has been founder and first president of Urbanit, the National Center for Urban Policy Studies uh, in Italy. He has been deputy mayor for planning, uh, urban planning and agriculture of the city of Milan in 2015-2016. So Sandro Balducci teaches in the first Italian region to be affected by the pandemic. The senior south got dramatically uncovered in, uh, in the last month. And he has reason and written about the preparedness concept, which was already uh, somehow raised uh, in the previous presentations. Uh, very interestingly, I would say by Martina Bova, if I'm not wrong, who, who stated uh, the difference between those who were prepared and those who were not. 
So I would like to invite you, Sandro, to unpack it uh, in the present context, context and especially to say how to make it an inclusive tool to get prepared to the crisis that are waiting for us as we discover future crises. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Paola. Um, I, I also don't feel completely adequate to participate in this uh, discussion, but uh, I try to, to give some thought. Um, and, and, and I would like to start from, uh, from a book that has been published in 1971 by Donald Schoen, which was titled The Loss of a Stable State, Beyond a Stable State, because he said uh, uh, planning has been uh, conceived uh, uh, as something that is uh, for, for uh, uh, periods of stability and, uh, and then uh, we are losing this uh, stability. But now it is uh, even uh, much more unstable the world. If we think that in the last 20 years uh, we have had uh, three global shocks uh, which were uh, unexpected, so September 11, when then the spread of terrorist attacks in many places in the world, the financial crisis, uh, and then uh, COVID-19. Uh, and, and of course, as uh, it has been already said, that this is also uh, intertwined with the destabilization of uh, the institutional architecture of Europe, for example, with Brexit. The migration crisis yesterday, it was said that it was a boomerang effect of development to, by dispossession by, by Jimena and uh, the growth of social inequality, climate change, it has been just uh, cited. So all the, the combination of all these elements makes uh, the loss of the stable state, I think, almost completely. Milan, as you said, uh, Lombardy has been the first uh, place uh, hit, uh, but that, then the pandemic uh, spread uh, from, to all over the world. Uh, fortunately, a little bit less in Africa, but. Uh, but in Latin America, Europe, uh, 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 United States, Russia, etc. And the second wave has been much worse than, uh, than the first wave. And the means of consciousness has been uh, dealing with space. So to put space uh, among ourselves, uh, to cancel any kind of a collective event, uh, uh, and and uh, many countries have been uh, uh, under partial of uh, total lockdown, and we have heard in the presentations today many of these situations. So the first uh, consideration is that we were unprepared. So we, uh, the only means, uh, with few few exceptions, have been a closure, uh, and uh, and now after uh, almost one year of blockage and loss. Uh, we have a vaccine and we hope to overcome the pandemic during the next, uh, uh, this year. Uh, but in this perspective, we, were, we must uh, try to reflect upon what we have learned about that. Huh? And what we can learn uh, in, in this situation, which was completely unexpected and un unprecedented. And uh, cities, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, have in the past, it was uh, rem uh, remembered also yesterday, used the pandemic uh, to build uh, building regulations, uh, hygiene norms, uh, sewage system, and so on and so forth. But now the situation is quite different. There have been uh, newspaper art articles saying that uh, some cities are abandoned, some are evicted, like in, in India, some, uh, as I heard. Uh, and, uh, but, but we, we, we know that it is not density itself, uh, even if, uh, the most hit uh, areas have been, some of the most hit areas have been uh, hit uh, uh, in, in large cities, in dense cities. But it is density associated with uh, social distress and poverty, and uh, where dwelling are uh, cramped, uh, there is no possibility of physical distancing. Uh, uh, but, but we know that in areas uh, which are also dense, but, uh, but not so poor, uh, where there is easy access to outside, uh, uh, it is, the contagion has spread much less than in other areas. In, in Italy, for example, the first heat areas have been valleys, not dense at all. And, uh, and we know that uh, from many uh, studies that uh, uh, there is not a this, uh, uh, direct relation. The relation is much more with, uh, with, uh, with poverty. And of course, dense cities offer the opportunity of uh, 
having access to uh, to services, having the opportunity of uh, starting some kind of solidarity and uh, and, and uh, mutual uh, mutual help. Uh, of course, uh, the difference with the past is uh, the, the vertical increase in teleworking and in telecommunication. And it has, said, it has been said that, that people can leave the city because they, they, they can work uh, from everywhere. But only those uh, who have a steady job uh, uh, can do that. Uh, not for those who have a precarious position, not for those who still uh, must build a professional network, not for those who make their life in informal commerce, as it has been said uh, today, not for all those who make the city work. So and make uh, the city function. And uh, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, a kind of discovery. So the discovery of the essential workers that also bring back to the idea of the power structure. And also in a number of workers in medical assistance, food production, logistics, telecommunication, energy, the maintenance of all the infrastructure that were considered uh, not important and they uh, have been uh, uh, have, have been discovered as essential, really, for, for the function. And of course, this is a big, a, big, a big problem to be dealt with. So the city is not over. Uh, it will not be abandoned, as never happened in the past, but it may change a lot and uh, must need a strategy uh, uh, in order to, to deal with this. Uh, strategy that deals with the poverty, uh, issue of poverty and spatial inequalities, uh, uh, with uh, the problem of valuing the essential workers uh, that allow the flexibility in functions and activity, and that is able to develop a housing policy because housing in all this is quite uh, is quite uh, uh, relevant and central. And what what cities have done in practice, uh, uh, we have heard. Uh, to boost the slow mobility, bikes, uh, expand in pedestrian, uh, pedestrian areas, uh, uh, granting public uh, space for commerce and private uh, businesses. Uh, and, uh, and this has been a temporary adaptation with some interesting uh, uh, implication for the future. But uh, one of the ideas that have been traveling all over the world very quickly has been this idea of the 15 minutes uh, neighborhoods. Uh, see, 15 minutes uh, uh, city, but we know that this is possible, as Marcello Balbo said yesterday, this is possible in situations in where services are there and uh, not in peripheral areas, uh, uh, because it requires uh, to dismantle an urban organization which has been based upon different forms of specialization and the rationalization. So everything has been centralized, schools, medical services, uh, uh, municipal services and so on and so forth. So this, uh, which is evident for commerce and hospitals, uh, one of the big problem in Italy has been that uh, the local uh, territorial uh, health system has been dismantled in favor of uh, the concentration of everything in big hospitals. But the, we could say the same for commerce, we could say the same for, for uh, uh, education and all the urban activities uh, uh, in, in all these urban activities, uh, uh, the, the relations between uh, uh, the, the capacity to be decentralized and to recreate some, some kind of urbanity has been completely uh, cancelled by a process of rationalization of neoliberal uh, kind of, of approach. And at the same time, another, uh, another obstacle is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, specialization of functions. So now, during the pandemic, uh, we have discovered that we need much more open spaces, much more uh, 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 flexibility in the functions. And, uh, uh, and we have seen that every element in the city has been hit by the need to, uh, to break the regional uh, rigid zoning and functional rigidities and the need uh, to restart from the space of everyday life if we wanted to do something. So these are, in a way, um, yeah, object for, for, uh, for research and for the, the construction of policies. And finally, this, uh, this issue of uh, preparedness that has, that has been already discussed uh, uh, quite extensively uh, today. So if we are in a situation of radical uncertainty, situations that we know that we don't know, uh, 
we think that uh, the normal planning, uh, so the planning uh, uh, for, the, for the situation of calculable risk is not enough. And so we need uh, to, uh, to embrace some, some different kind of, uh, of planning. Uh, and, and these ideas that have been put forward by sociologists of medicine like uh, Andrew Lakoff uh, uh, is uh, the idea not to try to avoid the, uh, the uh, catastrophe, but uh, to seek to, 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 to try to assume that the, this event may happen and if we need to, uh, to prepare ourselves in somehow, somehow. And this means uh, to create, to build the scenarios and simulations uh, to protect the critical infrastructure, uh, to uh, establish uh, warning systems, uh, effective warning system, to stockpile uh, relief and supply of, uh, of relief supplies, uh, to plan for coordinating responses among uh, different uh, entities, uh, uh, to maintain and, and plan communication system, uh, and to build indicators for readiness uh, assessment. All these elements, if you go through them, I, I stop here, are things that have been uh, lacking in, the, in this situation, particularly in my country, but in many other countries. And so um, I think that uh, uh, this is uh, something interesting in terms of an agenda for a form of planning uh, that uh, has to be uh, changed. And so my final conclusion is that uh, uh, we, we shouldn't uh, uh, waste this opportunity of crisis. Uh, uh, we have a lot to learn about uh, the role uh, and the changes that uh, densities uh, must have about uh, the need, need to streamline some of the temporary adaptation that are interesting, uh, about uh, the need uh, to abandon the rigid relation between forms and functions and to allow open forms in the city, and the need uh, to address uh, directly urban inequalities and urban poverty if you want to address public health, because of this is uh, what uh, we have been discovering. So this is just a first thought for, for, for my uh, reflections. Thank you, Sandro. Thank you very much for already uh, pointing out some objects for policies and uh, also for your invitation to look at the cracks of the system as opportunities to reimagine it. Uh, I would now uh, give the words to uh, Stephanie Haudiu who is uh, an English architect at the Federal Institute for Research on Building, sorry, uh, uh, um, an architect at the Federal Institute for Research uh, on Building Urban Affairs and Spatial Development in Bonn. So that was the translation of the German affiliation. Uh, she studied architecture and urbanism uh, at the University of Calcrue in Barcelona, planning practice in architectural offices in Amsterdam, uh, teaching and research practices in urban design at the University of Siegen. And since, since 2009, uh, she was researcher at the Federal Institute for Research on Building, Urban Affairs and Spatial Development in Bonn. Um, she is a, a, worked as project manager on several projects in the research program, Experimental Housing and Urban Development. And her area of expertise covers bottom-up initiatives, interim uses, green infrastructure, and urban development. St Stephanie, together with Stefan Willinger, you drafted a scenario for 2025, uh, keeping up uh, fuzziness and improvisation as important parameters for urban development processes. Um, in your view, civil society commitment and social creativity become a central resource in order to support the cohesion of the urban society and new forms of local economy. I would say that during the last lockdowns, uh, we saw many um, uh, cases of uh, collective intelligence, uh, and many of them were also uh, presented in the presentation in these two days. I have uh, on my mind cases from, from, from neighbors where I'm staying and where uh, uh, closes, uh, school clo closed, as uh, Marco Armiero was saying before, but there were like teachers uh, teaching from the streets to kids on the balconies, for example. Uh, my question is, is this the way uh, for you and is it enough to cope with the present scenario of uncertainty? So is it uh, fuzziness, improvisation, a way forward? Thank you very much for the nice um, introduction. Um, 
primarily I have to say um, where I'm working because it's a little bit strange institution. <laughs> We give um, political advice to the ministry by research project. So I can, yeah, um, so I'm a little transmitter. We, uh, we discussed yesterday you know, what, what, are, what is the link in between policy making and research. So we try it. You know? we, um, we did a lot of um, research projects in the last 15 years about co-creative uh, projects, about the role of citizen and how they can influence um, cities and also local governments. And um, they, we had amazing results um, and it was very, the importance you know, of the role of citizens um, um, was very clear. Um, is, it is not easy to, um, to combine it with the rules we have because we spoke about uh, it in this morning. Planning is um, directed to a long-term use. We have this kind of land use plans um, which, uh, yeah, have, um, which have aspects uh, for the uh, following 15 years. And then we have um, this citizen wishes and also um, wishes of creative people um, also in the in informal sector which would like to realize their own projects they would like to give inputs to what happened in society and in the last um, time of crisis we saw how important um, are these ideas from yeah from the informal sector i don't like that word uh, informal but it is an informal sector um, from citizens uh, for instance in germany we had a big uh, hackathon um, in the beginning uh, last year in the crisis where the government uh, collected ideas from citizens uh, how to deal with this new situation of crisis and um, they they collected a lot of good ideas, um, um, projects and methods, instruments, where neighborhood you know, helped neighborhood, where um, young people dealt with elderly uh, people. And um, we could see how important are this, um, yeah, these energies from the civil sector. In the last years, we um, um, we uh, uh, yeah we tried out also how is it possible to yeah to to give um, citizens um, empty spaces, empty building. Um, for instance, we worked with younger people, and we tried out how can the cities um, are more colorful, colored or more um, now, yeah, um, to have alternative um, uses also of space in spaces. And um, the question is um, how um, can be those uses accepted by the government? And we spoke yesterday by trust and distrust. How can government trust these people? Um, how can trust people, the government, because we heard also about this, the big uh, gap between government and um, citizens. Um, we um, have uh, produced a lot of guidelines for those um, adaptions of uh, spaces, because we saw the uh, government, local government, have to learn how to deal with those creatives and also creatives have learned how is government um, is managed or how does does it work with this kind of system. So I think um, we can um, produce a kind of openness and also trust if there is uh, there's more information about it. Yes. Um, also, um, there was the question yesterday, how we can um, bring together the research um, and the local government me as, as a transmitter, I can say, we have to know more about each other. Yeah? Um, if, we, if we open spaces for citizens, um, they have to know more about the rules and also the possibilities there are. And the people in the local governments have uh, more to be brave, braver and to, 
to work more with scopes because there are scopes and the rules, but mostly they are unknown. Um, so I wanted to, to end my short um, speech with, we always deal with uncertainty. Yeah? And this uncertainty in the last, year, last period um, of crisis give us pushes, also push and um, give us the possibility to work um, with um, instruments and methods we had. And um, the, now we have the possibility to, to, yeah, the, to, um, yeah, to change the experiments we had in real life. That means to integrate no, the um, project of citizens and um, to help um, the government to resolve this uh, difficult situation now. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, this was shorter, but very interesting. Also, this uh, idea and uh, the, um, I would say the, 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 the direct ex experience of a transmitter. <laughs> yeah. uh, which means a bubble of work of translation, I would say, and of communication between different stakeholders. So, uh, I would go on with, uh, with Lauren Landau, who is um, a political scientist, professor uh, at, of migration and development at the University of Oxford and research professor at the University of the Witwatersrands, the African Center for Migration and Societies that he led. His interdisciplinary scholarship explores mobility, multi-scale governance, and the transformation of social political community across the global south. And he is currently overseeing a multi-year project examining urban mobility and Africa's future politics in uh, Johannesburg, Nairobi, and Accra, right? So uh, I would like to ask Lauren, uh, what happens when people's survival draws and mobility get stuck and forced to confinement? What happens when uh, in cities, uh, mm, that, that for sure happen in Northern Italy and in Italy, those who move uh, actually keep feeding those who cannot move. So we have this uh, explosion, for example, of food deliver, uh, the, uh, people delivering food, and how this should shape policy making for future. All right, thank you, thank you, Paula, and, and thank you to everyone. We right don't here. hear you well, Lauren. It's very... Is that better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I was just going to say, thank you for including me in this. Um, I haven't been able to be at the whole uh, workshop because I'm now speaking of mobility and being stuck. I've been stuck in the United States thanks to the lockdown in the UK. Uh, so I am one of the migrants that has not been able to move, although a, a very privileged one, um, staying with my, my, my in-laws in, in Atlanta. So I'm joining you from there. I just want to say, I think when, we, when we're talking about some of the insecurity and the sense of stuckness and of people not being able to move, uh, this might be something that, that's kind of, and the kind of precarity associated with it. That is a, it's something that we now see as a crisis in, in Europe or elsewhere, but to some extent, this has been part of the nature of, of cities in the global South, I think for the last few decades where people have come in with a life project. They've come in trying to get somewhere else. Um, they've come in trying to, to make a life and been stuck, if not physically in a, in a kind of geographic sense. They're stuck by social boundaries. Um, they can't go home because they haven't succeeded in their, in their mission. Uh, they don't want to go home because they're trying to get somewhere else, but they're also not able to move forward with their lives because economic conditions are, are so are what they are. It's, it's very difficult to start uh, building a, a future, right? And I think we, the way in which we're, we're seeing that and the way in which people being unable to kind of imagine their future or being able to control their future means that they become much more vulnerable. They're unable to deal with some of the precarity and uh, mobility is, as we've heard in some of the presentations earlier, being able to move and being able to move continuously is a way of 
overcoming certain types of risk, a way of, of joining multiple social networks, of, of having lives in multiple places, of being multiple people. And being stuck forces you into a, a very different kind of world in which you're kind of both fully part of the city in a geographic sense, but also can't participate fully in it because you can't move and you can't maintain the kinds of uh, widespread social relationships that you need. I think that this kind of stuckness, whether it's related to COVID or whether it's, um, whether it's related to people not being able to move forward with their economic projects, also raises some real questions for how we think about uh, planning and, and engagement and public participation. Because much of the models that we have build on this idea of the right to the city, of a comics, common kind of civic identity of participation. And all of this is about building a, a common future and trying to build it for everybody in the place. And of course, those processes have always been unequal. But I think that that has retained in the recent years the whole language of the inclusive city of the of, of urban inclusion makes the presumption that everyone is there, everyone is moving forward, everyone feels that they want to be part of the city and they're prepared to invest institutionally, financially, et cetera, and that it is the people who are privileged, it's their responsibility to bring everybody else along and into the city. And I think what we start to see with, with this stuckness, and, and we've just heard it in some of the other presentations, is that the cities now are working on these multiple, maybe they always have, but very different kind of spatial temporal scales, right? So those people who are able to work remotely can be part of the city, but not there. Those who are stuck are physically part of the city, but don't want to be. They often want to go, they want to be somewhere else, right? And so we're having, and their future is, is not imagined as, as part of building this city. They don't know if they can be there. They don't know, like we've heard in the presentations this morning from Milan or elsewhere, they, their legal status may not allow them to stay, but the conditions do not allow them to leave. Right. And so they are in this plan. And when you have huge numbers of people, these essential workers, whole neighborhoods that are migrants, I think it, it raises real questions for how we think about planning, how we think about engagement, the kind of uh, places that the processes that Eva were describing. And this is not just in, you know, the big cities. We've talked a lot about those. I, I spoke yesterday to a, a colleague in, in Jiga, which is a small, relatively small town in Ethiopia on the border with Somaliland, Somalia, and Djibouti. This is what their city is. It's people who are trying to get through, hundreds of migrants trying to go to the Middle East, but who are now not able to go. They're living there. They don't know what to do with them. They don't want, but those people don't want to be part of the city. They don't really want to engage, right? And I think when we think about this, we do have to think, okay, how do we understand a public that is dispersed, is disconnected, is temporarily stuck? How do we think about participation? How do we think about planning? And one of the instincts has been to do what I think, what, what Fasson might call the kind of humanitarian governance, which is a very top-down emergency type of planning. And in some instances like this, that's fine. We need to provide relief. We need to provide food aid. We need to, to get, to make sure, as, as we've heard, that people are not dying, that they have basic medical care. But as an alternative to kind of modernist planning, is humanitarian planning the way to go? And, and I think a lot of the language of, of building cities that are resilient, et cetera, has this kind of humanitarian ethos, which in some ways is, is very technocratic, very top down, uh, and also not very inclusive, right? And so we're, we're stuck in this thing of, of we, we need people to be, to, to participate in a way, but they don't want to participate. There's a lot of other things that block them from participating. And we need to rethink how we plan. And I don't think that we have a great model for this, but I think, you know, if we, if we build on a little bit on, on um, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the name wrong. Um, one of the presentations from this, Menatula, who, who their presentation about rethinking some of these, these processes, I think we, we do need to think about cities and people not as just within the urban space. They themselves are glocalized, although I, I don't like that word very much, but you know that they're there, but they're also somewhere else. The cities and the, the ways in which the cities are regulated 
The city doesn't control immigration policy, but that has a real impact on, 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 on the spaces. So we need to start seeing the city as, as, at these multiple scales, but not just geographic scales, but also really to think about how we, we think about these sort of temporal scales. And I, I think urban planning and urban investment has tended to presume that we are all on the same sort of temporal trajectory, that we all want to move forward and we all want to move forward together. And what we're seeing is we are all now maybe not able to achieve that vision that kind of that Marco was talking about, this kind of common vision, whatever that is, but that some people are able to move forward and some are not. And we have to understand those kind of, of temporal divisions and, and how they relate to space, how they relate to the neighborhoods that people are in. And some of this is, is now recognizing that we need at this point, you know, if we're talking about research directions, I think, and it's part of what I'm trying to do in my own work, is this, you know, to use an old language, this kind of pedagogy of the commons in that we need to start not with the humanitarian planning of, we need to plan for these people, we need to plan for the emergencies, but also to understand how people are making sense of them, how it intersects with their life projects, how it intersects with how they understand urban space, what it means for them to be a, a part of an urban future. So let me just end there. And um, I hope that's something that we can continue in, in the discussion. Thanks, Paula, and everyone else. Thank you, Lauren, actually, for your remarkable insights and for this wonderful overview. And now I will leave the word to Warren Smith. Uh, you already raised the uh, Lauren uh, a very challenging question, how do we think about planning? Warren Smith uh, uh, is based at the African Center for Cities uh, so in Cape Town, to another uh, South African city. Uh, his main areas of research are urbanization, urbanism in Africa, urban policies and planning, housing and informal settlements and urban elf, which is particularly interesting, especially the relationship between the built environment and health. Uh, so quite a wide range of topics uh, that are all related to the two central themes, urban governance and urban policy discourses. So uh, my question for, for you, Warren, just to start your, your speech is what kind of co-produced knowledge, which is something that you have been working a lot in the last years and among which stakeholders do we need from now on? Okay, uh, thanks Paula. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Not very loud. Maybe you can come closer to the mic. Oh, okay. I don't know where the mic is, but I'll... <laughs> <laughs> no, but now it's better. <laughs> closer okay. is better. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so I think, I mean, to start off, I think the world has always been a very uncertain place and always will be a very uncertain place. So I think sometimes there's certain places and certain times where there's the illusion of certainty, but there's always like a, a real element of uncertainty. So, so kind of policy making and planning always happens in a context of uncertainty. I think COVID has just kind of highlighted this and reminded us again um, for example, the city of Cape Town's disaster management plan of 2015, it has a list of 52 different types of disaster that could happen to Cape Town, um, some of which do happen every year, like flooding and fires. Um, it included a drought, which did actually happen in 2018, and it included a global infectious disease pandemic, which of course did happen last year. So I think, I mean, there needs to be a recognition that there always are many uncertain things that, that could happen. And, and often do. And I think the reason why co-production emerged because it's a response to kind of the do dominant way that planning and policy making happens, which has been always to be very much to rely on technocratic expert knowledge and on, often on con very quantitative data. Uh, things like demographic projections of, of increasing population and so on. Um, and then using this technocratic expert knowledge and this quantitative data to come up with policies and plans. Um, so often in South Africa and many other countries, city level or provincial policy plans are often drawn up by officials or by consultants, often in a very inward looking way without any real engagement with other stakeholders. If there is a public participation process is often a token one that doesn't really affect what kind of policy or plan comes up with. Um, and, and our experience in our research has also shown that, very that different government departments often 
think about issues in very different ways, um, often based on their disciplinary background. Um, so for example, when we did work on flooding in Cape Town, we found that the urban planning department and the stormwater engineers and the housing officials and the disaster risk management officials actually all saw the problem of flooding in very different ways, understood it in different ways, and this had very different solutions to it. And that's actually a major obstacle to collaboration because everybody's trying to do this conflicting and, and contradictory interventions. Uh, so the net result is that nothing really happens and the system stays the same. And every year there continues to be flooding, um, which is kind of responded to in some ad hoc ways, but the real problem isn't ever um, tackled. Uh, so I think as many sessions in this conference, especially earlier today, have highlighted co-production is really important and should be part of policy making and planning processes to try and overcome all those weaknesses of traditional policy making. And traditional policy making also doesn't respond very well to, to crises as COVID has highlighted. Um, a lot of the response to that has been very ineffective. Um, so I think, so through co-production, it's important to bring together these different types of knowledge from different disciplines and different sectors and different perspectives, including local knowledge, in order to have a much more holistic understanding of what a particular problem is and how it can be addressed in a much more holistic and sustainable way that, that increases social justice and equality and reduces existing injustices and inequalities. Uh, so it's particularly important to bring in the perspectives of civil society, to bring in social cultural perspectives, and also to bring in the long-term historical perspective that's often ignored. And through co-production, you can do that. Um, it's important to note that co-production isn't a substitute for public participation, which sometimes government agencies think it is, um, because public participation is still obviously essential, but co-production is important for, for very many reasons. So the net network I'm associated with, the African Urban Research Initiative, or ARI, uh, that has a focus on doing co-production to deal with urban challenges in a number of countries across Africa. So it's got 21 members from all across Africa, from, from South Africa to Egypt. Um, we, just co we just produced a book called Reframing the Urban Challenge in Africa, Knowledge Co-Production from the South. That has a whole number of different chapters looking at examples of co-production in Egypt and Kenya and Ghana and Zambia and South Africa showing how it can make a real difference on changing the way that urban policy, that urban problems are understood and addressed. Um, the organization I work for, the African Center for Cities in Cape Town, we've been doing co-production with government and other stakeholders for 12 years. So we started our co-production program in Cape Town in 2008, the City Lab program. So we've been working with the provincial government of the Western Cape, which is a a regional authority yeah, with the city government, the city of Cape Town, and with a whole lot of other stakeholders like civil society to address the very many problems that Cape Town faces. It's a city with a population of more than 4 million, very high levels of poverty and inequality, um, more than 150,000 households living in informal settlements and very severe sustainability challenges. For example, the city almost ran out of water in 2018. And that's like a real problem that might happen again. So the city labs were essentially about bringing together the relevant stakeholders to co-produce knowledge on the key urban challenges facing Cape Town. Um, so in all, there've been nine city labs dealing with a whole range of, of topics. So two of them were focused on specific geographic areas in Cape Town and seven were thematic, for example, climate change and urban flooding and crime and violence and so on. And these city labs brought together these different stakeholders, got a whole lot of different perspectives together um, and try and build up a much more holistic picture of what the problem was and potential ways of trying to address it. Um, and they all had a clear normative agenda that we were very clear from, from the start, that it was essentially about reducing urban in, in injustices and creating a more fair and equitable city that's more sustainable. Um, so, also, so all the study labs basically brought together different types of knowledge through a range of mechanisms. For example, we had seminar series and joint publications. Um, and then we also were involved in things like undertaking collaborative research. 
like an urban flooding study lab. We worked with civil society and government to look at the flooding of informal settlements in Cape Town. Things like co-producing new policies. So a human settlement city lab worked with the provincial government um, and municipality and a range of other stakeholders to come up with a new human settlements policy framework for the region. We're focusing on things like informal settlement upgrading and access to land and using underutilized land, trying to create more job opportunities through the use of small builders in, in housing delivery. Uh, Multi-stakeholder integrated planning, that's, that is still a challenge. And, trying to, and then trying to institutionalize experimentation and, and innovation within government. Um, and then we also were involved in co-designing and implementing participatory projects, like public space projects to do public art and so on. Um, and then we started another program in 2012 to try and build on that, the knowledge transfer program, which involved embedding researchers within the local government to work on actual policy issues while doing academic research. So we embedded a total of seven researchers for two to three years each within the local government. And so they actually contributed to policy processes while doing academic research on those on those same topics. And we also had an exchange program for government officials to come to the university every year for six weeks each. We had about six every year to kind of to work together with academic writing partners to document their experiences in government so that we have more critical reflections on, on local government practice. And, and for the past 10 years, you we were part of the International Most Urban Futures Co-Production Network. Um, and we are busy in the process of launching a manual on doing co-production based on our experiences over the past decade or so. Um, and I think through co-production, we were able to produce policies or contribute to production policies that reflect a much wider range of perspectives, are much more innovative than they would have been, and they go beyond the technocratic planning and policymaking processes that are usual. Uh, so obviously co-production is very difficult to do. It's very time consuming. There may be lots of conflict. Um, not all policymakers want to be involved in co-production, although many do. Um, but I think through co-production processes, you can end up with policies and plans that are much more robust, that meet actual people's, people's actual current needs, long-term long needs of sustainability and equity. Um, and then equally important, it's not just about the product, it's also about the process of through these processes, you broaden the mindset and the, and the knowledges of policymakers and practitioners and other stakeholders involved in co-production. And then co-production also opens up possibilities for further collaboration because through the through engagement and through knowing more about other people's perspective, it does open up possibilities for more collaboration on, on further projects and processes. Um, so I think the key challenge for co-production is to try to go beyond ad hoc experiments and try and make it an integrable part of governance. So it's something that happens normally in policy making and planning processes. Uh, thanks. That's all I had to say. Okay, thank you, Warren. I was still taking notes because you all said many remarkable things. Uh, and uh, so I, I learned a lot. So I learned, for example, that um, also continuing with what was said yesterday, uh, somehow we have the same uncertainties of the past, just more visible, and we have, uh, and the same can be said about certainties, uh, the same certainties that were um, um, quoted by uh, Jimena yesterday. And in, in this, this is the bad news. The good news is that uh, uh, the space was open for not expected things, and so maybe the question can be how to grasp on what new things happened and uh, we all had to be vigilant to uh, using incremental approaches drawn on our past experiences in order to make them real now that we really have also in order to foster that um, revolutionary, revolutionary imagination that uh, Marco Armiero talked about, which also means to question and deconstruct uh, uh, fuzzy words uh, and narrative infrastructure. We as planner in particular, I would say, uh, tend have to, to do with. Uh, Mm, another inter interesting thing is that, okay, this is an area, so it's, uh, it's a network interested in planning and um, um, 
in in the south uh, but uh, now i mean i mean in the present situation what's happening especially in the many south of the world i remember that maybe three years ago in milan we organized the naris conference and it was particularly uh, uh, attentive to the many south of the world even, even in the uh, north so behind uh, and beyond any uh, geographical uh, approach uh, but still the south can mm, teach us a lot there was an article by carolini planners go south so this is something that we we should uh, uh, invite everybody besides any networks to do uh, it seems also that our new words coming up, I, I uh, list some, like vulnerability, multiple scales and times. We need to uh, take care and also um, 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 somehow uh, approach in, 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 a, in an interesting and also in, a, in an intelligent way. Uh, I would like you to help in the last, there are like uh, 25 minutes left uh, to uh, construct this uh, these, uh, little uh, uh, dictionary of the new words that we learned over the last few days. Uh, so I would say like three minutes for each of you uh, and then time for questions because it would be nice to to open it to the to the rest of the audience. I already have, can read a very long comment from Professor Balbo, uh, but then we can leave it for the last 10 minutes. But a new round, maybe uh, freely, not following the list this time, uh, about new words for you that we learned in these two days. Who wants to start? <laughs> Silence. I can start. Um, for me, the big question is how we can yeah, implement flexibility in our rules. Um, I know that's my aspect because uh, I, uh, I studied a lot of uh, planning rules and also the the yeah the possibilities we we have uh, with that and also like um, like an institution to give political um, advice to the ministry we think a lot which um, methods and instruments we have and perhaps we have some instrument we, we don't use it or they are unknown so my big question is um, if crisis overcome. Né? We heard a lot of methods and instruments yesterday about multi-coding, for instance. Multi-coding spaces are, or multifunctional spaces are um, a good um, and um, yeah, a future-orientated instrument to be flexible in a way, to, to have uh, more codes um, on one space. But I know um, with, my, uh, yeah, with my experience and a lot of um, discussions with local governments that in the reality, it's not easy to realize because you have a lot of different rules to combine. And so the, the wish no, to, to be flexible, to be multifunctional, to be open, to have perhaps voids in, um, in our plans, where we can um, install um, things, we, um, th they came up by crisis, for instance. That's not easy, but um, I think we have to work together on this. I mean, we have to think about voids and openness in planning. We have to uh, think about how we can um, install more trust and um, transfer for responsibilities. And um, that's, that's not an answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> These are my question and my uh, yeah my aspects. Um, I will further um, yeah uh, give my view of research. <laughs> no. Also, having new questions is fundamental. Marco, are you about to say something? Yeah. Well, maybe I I think that this issue. I mean. 
as you may imagine, I think I am struggling a little bit with the rules and regulation because if we, you know, sometimes when you need and you wish to innovate, one thing is actually to break the rules. A very famous uh, radical historian, our Zin, said that the very basic of democracy was going beyond the, lo the law. I mean, if you know, if we would stay in the law, probably we would uh, wait for somebody to in Versailles to decide what to do. Or I don't know, uh, you, you said that, Lauren, that you are in the United States, I guess that you mean that you are in the colony overseas. So you, we need to go beyond the law. And I, I wonder when, you know, we invite people to participate, there is maybe there is there a problem that, you know, we don't need an invitation, that you appropriate what is needed. I can give just a very quick example. Uh, in Naples, in Italy, uh, there was a new, I, maybe you are familiar with this, there has been in the last maybe few years, this very innovative process, which is called the urban commons. It's called in Italian, Civici urbani, so some kind of urban commons. So, but, and it's now regulated by the municipal government. So it's institutionalized. So we see here a blending of these two approach. However, historically speaking, it didn't work in this way. It was not that, you know, there was somebody was invited and through some uh, common agenda, they established this. It was the other way around. People were squatting illegally places and then they found a common ground to eventually manage these things under some kind of you know, institutional umbrella. So I wonder if this can also be a, 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 an issue. And I mean, uh, the, I think that one, one word that I would be careful of is the, this agenda. <laughs> because uh, when we, I mean, there are several things that, that we need to plan. No? So my university, I work in Sweden. My university is, of course, very sensitive to the issue of climate change. And now we are working a lot on how to become uh, carbon neutral. So I have been invited in a lot of meetings with an agenda, right? And the agenda was to make me think about my flying habits. Uh, you know, there is this expression, it's a Swedish expression, to be ashamed of flying, no? Uh, and this is what has been convenient. Any times I, I have tried to raise another issue, like, you know, what about the fact that are, we are actually working with fossil fuel industries? What the fact that we are training engineers to do, you know, basically to extract uh, fossil fuel, uh, the answer has always been the same. Well, this is not on the agenda today. So sometimes I feel that, you know, actually participation and planning means, means to break the agenda, to break the rules, to take control of something that, or maybe it can be not to participate. I think that a good uh, possibility is also to refuse to participate. I don't see, you know, the tyranny of participating. Sometimes the most, uh, the best way to be heard is actually not to be in the room. Bordier, if you if you open a microphone, doesn't mean that you know everybody knows the same language. You are settling an environment which is settled for a certain kind of people. Lauren, I feel that you're gonna follow up. <laughs> yeah, well, I did, follow up might be a bit too strong, but I, I really enjoyed. Thank you, Marco. I enjoyed that, and I agree. And I think what you see is actually, I mean, uh, across much of the global south, is a kind of do-it-yourself urbanism, or, or you know, a kind of auto construction, if you want to use Caldera's terms, which which shows the the possibilities of liberation for not following the rules, but also, of course, the the very real risks of working against rules, especially when those rules can be arbitrarily enforced by quite authoritarian governments, <laughs> right? So, you know, there, there is a need to, to kind of celebrate that, but also recognize that it is not, um, you know, it opens the possibility, but the opening that possibility comes at, at risk. And I think to some extent, the idea of self-alienation or exclusion, as you say, can sometimes be the most powerful of remaining illegible to the state of, of what Deleuze and Guitar talk about, that nomadic power of not being able to be controlled, not being included in processes, is a way of actually, um, if not demonstrating a resistance, at least opening a different kind of possibility for yourself. And I think those kind of, of processes 
the, the, coming back to Paula to your question about terms, you know, of, of talking about urban inclusion or, or Eva used in her presentation questions of integration. I think we continue to use that language, which comes very much from a kind of Durkheimian sociology of the, of the city as this kind of unified machine that has all of its different parts that go together. And I think what we're talking about is, you know, with people who are in, want, is that a, a normative ideal? of everyone coming together, of everyone having their place. It sounds nice if we are machine parts, but you have all of these different people going in different directions. They're working at different speeds. And in that environment, questions of integration and inclusion can actually, well, it sounds like a progressive move, can actually be quite constraining, right? And, and so there is a, a normative question. And then I think there's also an empirical question as to, in many of these places, what are you becoming included into? What is it? What is the public? What is the host? What is the, you know, in, a, in the places that Eva was talking about? Who is, what system are you becoming part of? And, and it's, uh, it's not entirely clear that, that there is a dominant system in many of these places anymore. And there may be a city, but the city itself doesn't plan much of what's going on. So who is it that you're becoming part of? And I think those are, those are questions that we need to just continue asking. Lauren. Um, yeah, I think just to build on that point. So I used to work in civil society for 20 years. So worked for a range of NGOs and we always had a very complicated relationship with the state. Uh, sometimes partners with the state, uh, sometimes adversaries of the state. And I think that's the way it has to be. Cause I mean, sometimes you do need to participate because that's the only way to change things. Sometimes participation is just a way of co-opting or um, co-opting potential opposition or collusion with others. So sometimes that's something to be avoided. But yeah, I, I think it is a very, I think civil society has to kind of walk that tightrope of participation or not participation, use a whole range of different tactics to try and kind of engage with the state or get what it wants or experiment with trying to do new things outside of the state. Um, and I think just getting back to your your point about the key words that have come up over the conference, I just gone through my notes to look at some of the words that have popped up in my notes. So my notes are completely illegible, but a few words like popped up, like normality, I think came up quite a lot. Um, and I don't know what that means. Is there, is there such a thing as normality? Um, I think in Joseph's presentation today, she's so talking about boundary objects, which I thought was a really interesting term. So that's about where where different stakeholders like the state or civil society co-produce something that kind of sits at the boundary of different um, sectors. So I think that's, I think that's really an important thing to, to think about what can those boundary objects um, be. I think what came out quite a lot also was imagination and imag Im imaginaries and the, the power of those for, for trying to inspire change. And I think the one that was mentioned, particularly in one talk, was the idea of the 15-minute city. So that's kind of an imaginary of, of, what is, of a, what a more equitable and more efficient city could potentially look like. Because the city I live in at the moment, I, mean, I don't think it's even a one-hour city, let alone a 15-minute um, city. Um, yeah, so those are some of the words that kind of jumped out at me over the, the course of the last two days. Thank you, Warren. Sandro, you're the last, the least. I, um, I agree with this idea of uh, uh, leaving up empty spaces that uh, uh, has been uh, uh, raised by Stephanie. And also that these empty spaces can be boundary places where different strategies can, can encounter. And I think that this is a really uh, important to, to deal with the old issue of uh, organizing participation or self-organization, which has been uh, there for, for, for a very long time. And, and I think that, uh, of course, if you talk uh, to uh, those who have the responsibility of issuing policies, uh, uh, this idea not to plan everything, uh, particularly in a situation like that, uh, is really the opening up of the opportunity of developing this kind of uh, um, 
inclusion that it was also in the in the long question of uh, Marcello Balbo to everybody of, of us. And uh, I think that so, so the, the this year, so 2020, uh, at, at the beginning, a lot of people said that it will last a very short time and we will return as soon uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the previous situation. But now I think that uh, from the point of view of the perspective, the situation has, has changed. So we know uh, now that we need to do something different uh, and this is becoming much more common and can open uh, this kind of uh, opportunity of uh, living gap in these spaces. For example, in terms of the opportunity of decentralization in different terms, so for, for giving the opportunity of places that were that didn't matter in the past and that now can matter a little bit more, or to 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 have something in in the peripheries in the south of the north or and also in the south. I I think it's a, it's really something that can can have the opportunity now uh, to to be developed. So I think that this is. Uh, Quite Thank you, Sandra. It's interesting also having a different perspective and also working on the boundary spaces between our different backgrounds, which was one of the reasons why we wanted to organize this um, roundtable and the conference itself in this way. I would. I think we have five more minutes. Uh, if there is any other question from the audience that you would like to openly ask, would be nice to get out of the box, constraining box of Zoom. <laughs> or maybe Professor Balbo wants to say something more about these long, super long comments. Silence. Okay. Hey, Daddy, he just talked too much already. <laughs> I, can, I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Are you Paula? Yes. <laughs> okay. Here you are. Okay. Gallery mint. Did you want to say something, Paula? Or? No, I'm completely fine. I was just um, reading uh, Marcello Balbo's comment on the invitation to talk. <laughs> ah, yes, right. Okay, so maybe we can end it up here and uh, uh, see you in 10 minutes for the, for the conference closure. Uh, I know there are some news about the people who participate into it, maybe Paula can tell us. And uh, before yeah. I would really like to thank you all. There, I mean, there are many issues that were raised and, and lots to work on. So thank you for being with us this afternoon. Yes, I would also like to thank you. And we try to keep it short and concentrated this um, round table so that we can speak more into uh, what your comments are on the conference. So thank you very much also from our side here, from my side and also from Kuba's side for your valuable comments and also uh, your suggestions how we should go on. And uh, we are now entering into the closer of the conference, which should not mean that please uh, abandon us. We have some news for you, some local news <laughs> that we would like to share with you. I mean, you all know that we Berliners like to have Keats live as our uh, one of our representative already said so we will give you some information on how you can still a little bit enjoy Berlin during this afternoon and um, we will also have the closer with uh, three different um, let's say keynote speakers one is uh, Professor Margarita Green from the Pontificia Universidad uh, de Chile Católica and then we will also have um, Philip, Professor uh, Philip Nisibitz from the Technical University, who's also our host here of the NAEDOS uh, network uh, conference that we have. And um, I, uh, Kuba, please correct me if uh, is the colleague also joining us. 
we hope so. I mean, he disconnected now for a little bit and uh, he will try to connect because he had some problems uh, before. So we, we hope that he will be able to, to join, but, but it will turn out in, in five minutes. Yeah. Yes, and then we also think that it might be with uh, Jimena de la Barra and uh, Marcello Balbo, who opened up this conference with us, uh, let us know what uh, they also learned with us now <laughs> during the two days. And um, yes, this will be the scenario for our closure. And uh, please stay with us. Thank you. In 10 minutes, you said, Paula, right? Yeah. According to the program. See you. Thanks. Ciao, grazie. <laughs>
the one we will be starting again now we'll try to get everybody uh, in the center of the of the screen maybe maybe just for the uh, for the start i i will tell you that over year old during the whole conference we always had between 60 110 people uh, watching us either in zoom or on youtube and it says also when i check youtube that uh, yesterday we had 364 openings we don't know if these are the same the same people or not but in any case it seems to be quite a, a substantial a substantial number of of uh, people so this is great and maybe this is the advantage of, of actually being being online um, so now what we wanted to to achieve is actually that you can see all of that all of us so 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 please uh, all of the participants that will 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 take part in the clo closing sessions you would need to open your cameras and then we'll be able to somehow put you put you in the middle of the of the screen uh, so uh, yes perfect uh, and i see see even 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 more of you that's that's really great um, and a small note uh, from the start, uh, Fana, I'm not sure if he achieved to join. Yes, maybe yes. So in case if Fana will be able to connect, uh, we will we will have a pleasure to listen to, to him. And uh, if, if the connection will break, uh, I will try to somehow deliver uh, his very, very uh, interesting uh, summary and his inputs to the conference. In okay. any case... So is with us at the moment. Yes, as for as for now, Fana is with with us, and let's hope it, it works like that. Um, so I think there's no no huge need again to to uh, introduce the ones that were introduced in the in the past. We we can see Marcello joined us, and we all listened to his great input during the the opening dialogue uh, philip also was present uh, present here uh Simena as well but uh, we didn't have a pleasure of of introducing uh, margarita so paola would uh, would do that uh, now briefly is that right paola yes margarita, she is with us i can see her already yes. So I would like to um, introduce Margarita Green. Uh, Professor Margarita Green is an architect and master of study from the Catholic University of Chile and a PhD from the University College of London. She began her professional architect yes, and continued to Chile. Since 1999, she has been full-time at the School of Architecture. The numerous and interdisciplinary research projects has conducted numerous consultancies at national and international level. Sorry, Sorry Paula. Paula. Uh, includes... We don't hear you very well. It seems in the evenings somehow every evening <laughs> uh, the connection gets uh, a little bit unstable. So if you have a possibility of going closer to to router or anything like that, that that maybe would help. Yes, I thought it was my problem. I can try to do this. Can you do that? No, that's my even problem, I think. Can you understand me? Yes. Yes, no. okay. So, well, I'll... okay. So, um, her area of work, um, vulnerable neighborhood, Space impacts heritage areas from educational education strategies. Since 2010, she is a full professor at the School of Architecture, Universidad Católica de Chile, and since 2013, she became part of the Center for Sustainable Urban Development, CDEOS, first as an associated researcher and since 2016 as main researcher and coordinator of the Bid Environment Cluster. She's also working with Naedos and Audi on uh, the recent project, uh, Cities Alliance on Equity Economic Growth in the Bid Environment. Thank you very much, Margarita, to have you with us. Lovely to be here. Thank, thanks a lot. So now the, the, the key, Key question. I mean, we wanted, of course, hear from all of you uh, concerning the take so takeaways from the from the whole conference and your impressions. Uh, but uh, uh, since we don't know if Fana is there, we, uh, we want to check first if uh, Fana can you try to 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 speak. I know we've, it won't it won't work with the video. 
Hello? No, probably it doesn't work. However, since it's a conference about uncertainties, uh, we firstly devised a solution and I will try to deliver FANA's input. Uh, right away, it's a, it's a, it's a very change, challenging task, but, uh, but uh, let me try to do that. And I think it will also allow us to uh, kickstart the discussion uh, because uh, FANA had, had some interesting points. I will not share the screen, but I will uh, try to copy paste his, his small, smaller points into the chat. So, uh, I mean, it, the, the, the small input that, that, that he achieved to send me right now is, uh, is concerning big takeaways and then the small, smaller ones uh, that I will copy into the chat. So the first one is that, that, uh, that we could declare, declare the, um, uh, this exact uh, uh, moment that we are uh, in as a moment of, of human transformation, multiply human transformations. And you, as you can see in the, in the chat, uh, he meant about that uh, urban transformation, digital, digital one, social one, and uh, also uh, the, the something that we discussed uh, yesterday. So the relationship between, between government, uh, university planning, economics, and uh, neoliberal policy, as well as, uh, as the issues uh, of migration. So I think it was uh, reappearing in our discussions that those issues are not, not entirely new, but, uh, but perhaps the accumulation and obviousity because of the, the media circulation makes us uh, perhaps understand it uh, fully those days. Uh, the second, uh, second input that, that Fana mentioned is, oh, and now my, I said that we were very well prepared for uncertainties, but now the PDF that, I'm, that I have open is also blocked. <laughs> Wait a second. He's back with us. And he's back with us? Oh, that's great. Because... I hope so. I mean, uh, uh, no. yes. He's back with us. I also see him. He's in the, I'm on the participants. Fana, can you hear us? Hello, I can hear you. Um, it's just been happening like that every, all, all, the whole day. Um, can I try and go through my comments? Um, I apologize profusely. Um, quickly and, and maybe um, then um, I'll try and listen wherever I can catch you. YouTube Please. Or otherwise. But, but Fana, I actually, actually okay. cannot even go now through um, your comments. Because my, oh, there you are. So you, you can go through your comments. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you see the human being? Yes, we can see human being, and we can hear you very well. So that's that's perfect. Okay, I'm going to put off the I'm going to put off the video so that I can maybe help this if it can. But if it fails, please Cuba carry on. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I really appreciate. Um, I'm just going to. Um, summarize a few points. I wish I could elaborate, but I'll try and just talk through heads of arguments. I think the first point that I want to say is that for me in the conference, I got the impression that there are a number of transitions or transformations that are, are occurring at this point in time. Not only is there an urban transition or urban transformation, um, there is a digital transformation but also a social transformation. And I think for lack of a word, I'm calling it, calling it social transformation, but I think um, the, the whole of humanity is trying to look much closer to what, who we are and how we can actually relate better um, uh, with each other, particularly after the COVID um, experience. These transformations, perhaps there are more, but these transformations seem to be going ahead and um, there is no structural transformation in as far as the nature of government or the structure of government um, planning itself and the way we think about um, economics, its institutions, policy and plans. It looks like to me there's so much that needs to be done in that space to transform structurally so that we can begin to really anticipate this new world of uncertainty or new norm, norm, normalcy. 
So I thought I should actually make that, that point, and that is one thing that came through to me. And it looks like the, the current um, nexus of crisis, whether you see a climate change, in a social inequalities, part, patriarchy, and as a number of these emerged from the different papers from all around the world, um, motivating us to look closer or act closer at, lo at, at in more immediate at local level. And many papers have actually been looking at how at local level uh, the response, particularly after the, uh, the COVID crisis, um, has been innovative at local level. There's so much emphasis on indigenous knowledge, resources at local, uh, at local level. The one session that I chaired looked at how, you know, food, how the kitchen is being reinvented to actually connect people and to actually challenge, you know, official um, narratives of, of, of government. And I thought that was very you know, innovative. Is it Feng Li? He, uh, Feng Li spoke of street government, the, the role of neighborhood planners. It looks like these crises are really forcing us to start looking at community level and explore indigenous knowledge, uh, knowledge systems. Barbara spoke, for example, of um, how the commons are coming back. She said, the commons are coming back. And um, um, these crises so are making us really look much closer at who we are and question humanity itself. You know, resources such as solidarity, connection, um, how can we support each other? Are we hopeful? Can we co-design? Um, can we collaborate? Can we co-produce? These are issues that are sort of emerging and they've got to do with the local level. And my next point is to say that we seem to, I spoke of human transformation, we seem also to be shifting away from individualism. At least we are questioning individualism and we're moving towards what they call, um, Cornel, well, Cornel West calls individuality. That is individualism is aligned with the market and affirmation of the self and so, so on, greed, et cetera. Individuality has got to do with the preciousness of humanity, who you are, who am I, how do I live with my people and so and so forth. And I think this is a trend that is actually emerging out of this crisis, even though we are not necessarily, you know, as squarely looking at that, but I think in terms, just in terms of humanity, society, is beginning to look at those things. Hence, we are also, it seems to me, um, looking at for new forms of collective engagement beyond the traditional stakeholders that we normally bring together, i.e. government, business, and civil society. But um, some papers were basically saying, let's go beyond that. Someone said, we need to go beyond co-production and cooperation and, and, and look at indigenous communities, traditional authorities, um, and traditional institutions that are actually at local level where there is richness of, of, of knowledge. And there was also this question of dialogue. How do we dialogue? Do we dialogue just taking advantage of the technology? or we and, and one thing that's emerging is that there's so much rich, richness in social interaction. There is so much innovation and elements of adaptation that are arising from people interacting with one another. Um, beside, beyond those that relate to a technology, for example, the immobile case of, uh, of Kenya. And the innovation is really the, the, key, the, key, word, the key word here. Um, and there's so much that was demonstrated that's arising from technology. But for me, most importantly, it was innovations that are arising from interactions, especially uh, uh, outside the traditional stakeholders that we normally bring together. And also there was the point on research that we need to do more innovative research, especially exploring non-traditional issues. I want to stop here so that I don't spend a lot of time. Thank you very much. I think we heard you all very well now. I would like to um, pass the word to Margarita Green so that she can start with her keynote.
Hi, I'm really happy to be here and, and, uh, and have enjoyed this session, you know, a lot. And, and also I want to make the best out of being here together. Are you listening to me well? Sorry. Yeah, fantastic. It, that's yes, supposed to be the, well. the, it's supposed to be the sentence of the year, of the past year. Every, every Zoom session starts with that. Am I being listened? No, but I just wanted to thank being here, to seeing you all, although it would have been much better to see you in Berlin. But it's been really enjoying, you know, I've been really enjoying the, the, the sessions. Uh, and I must say that I have enjoyed especially the round tables and the discussion generated. I really feel like, you know, like raising my hand and trying to, to, to give my opinion also for all the things that being, were being said. But considering the limited time that we have, I will try and concentrate on sort of the agreements and the more challenges questions that I see that are, that are present here in all that has been said. So first of thing, one thing that at the beginning when I started listening to all this, I was feeling that there was almost too much agreement. You know, everybody seemed to be agreeing on everything and everything was sort of said before. Just like, for example, things like what would be the, for me, the importance of local authority. Margarita, really? I'm afraid. Yes. Listening to me? We lost you for a bit. Am I? Yeah, there are some breaks. Uh, sorry. It's so sad because until we had this break, I was perfectly listening to you. And now I'm not listening to you so well. So probably you are not listening to me. Uh, just the last, the last idea, the most. Right. Well, the idea was that I will start by, the, by the, what we are all agreeing, let's say. One is the importance of local authorities that are, have been seen, you know, in all the last time as something absolutely vital. Uh, second is the sort of all this idea of the co-production of, of, uh, of uh, knowledge that uh, by far there's no argument that is a way to go on forward. And then there's sort of something about the multiple layers of the knowledge we need, you know, that it's, it has to be interscalar, you, that we're working in different scales, that we're working in, in intersectoriality, interdiscipline, all these different layers. I would, uh, and that was, I think, what I liked so much about the round tables, that you could see how everybody was looking at the same problems, but from a different perspective, from a different reality. Because these conferences is joining people from different continents, they're completely different realities. Nevertheless, there are certain things that you can sort of follow through. Another thing that you could see everywhere was this thing of uh, importance of data. Data seemed to be very important, you know, the scientific knowledge and the difficulty to transmit that to social policy. There are some other things, but I wanted to go into sort of be more into where I see the challenges to go on forward. Uh, I, I want to be a bit of the devil's advocate to see, if, you know, where we have discrepancies in certain things, how we're perceiving them. Uh, one thing, for example, is that there's a certain recognition of science as hard data, that, that, that we need that hard data, especially, you know, when COVID started, there was a lot of, you know, we, we were all waiting for the vaccine, for, for knowledge, how it was spreading, etc. Uh, but on the other hand, there has also been a recognition of the knowledge of uh, dreams, identity, or for example, in South America, of the of the inhabitants before pre-Columbian times, uh, of recognizing that that was very important to understand, that in many ways they had a certain wisdom that science was not collecting. Uh, but, and that's where I, I get a bit problematic and I want to leave it, we have these two, to a certain, say, to a certain state we say, you know, we, we have now a much open mind, but on the other hand, we have all this manipulation of data. We know that data is not uh, objective, that you can use it in many ways, that, you, that we have all this new way in which journalism isn't more like it was before. Social, social uh, networks are informing in a certain way. Uh, so I think there, the knowledge, the wisdom, the data, and the manipulation of all that, not even the manipulation, but the understanding it from different perspectives is something that is really a big challenge today. 
The second thing that I wanted to put again is this uh, going back to the co-production. Uh, definitely, as I said, I think co-production is sort of the way of the future to enrich our planning schemes, because we're talking about this planning in, in changing times. Uh, but we also, for example, I could sense on sometimes I would think that somebody even said it explicitly that uh, to a certain extent, sometimes it was the, the process overcame the results. Sometimes uh, the process became more important because of what it generated than the results. And that is something that to me, it worries me. It worries me because the problems we are facing today are not simple. You know, problems like climate change, ecologic crisis, etc., uh, are, you know, we need to face the results as well, not only the process. The process is terribly important. And if we don't have a proper process, the results won't, won't be right and they won't be able to implement, etc. But I still think that we cannot fall in love with the process without aiming at good results. Uh, the other thing, uh, and I'm reaching now to the planning in uncertainty, which is, you know, the final objective of the conference. Uh, I think that Marcelo and Jimena were really, I, I'm afraid I didn't listen to your first presentation because it was very early in the morning. It was at five o'clock in my country and, uh, and I'm on holiday. So you must say that, you know, waking up at five, before five o'clock in the morning was beyond my, my commitment to to knowledge. Anyway, I heard what all the other people said about you on, on the on the round tables. And I thought it was really interesting because uh, you would you were sort of putting the the, the uncertainty at a uh, at a conversation level, let's say not giving it for granted. I think that is something very important. And especially because I am talking of uncertainty not only because I am talking, I am thinking of the pandemic, you know, the COVID crisis, uh, and not even of the climate crisis and not even of the ecological crisis, let's say, but also of a social crisis that I think many of the things that have been said now, I, I you know, I could relate to them. What Fana was just saying, I, I deeply agree with him. What many people have said, I do agree. But on the other hand, I do feel, for example, Chile has a very special story. We started with a social crisis on... Uh, October 2019, and during one year, we faced the social crisis with a big social unrest, and then we faced the pandemic, which well, we all know it's global, it's around the world, lockdown and all that it has meant. Uh, and then we finished the year with a, a plebiscite at national level that will write a new constitution. I mean, come on, that's not, that's not an uncertainty that we were used to, you know, from in one year, we're having a new constitution, we've been in lockdown for the whole year, and we know all this is coming. So I do believe that planning has always been in uncertainty, but I do believe that now it is a special uncertainty. It is of another level. It is at another, and that the stakes we are playing, which I mentioned before, the climate change and the species, etc., cetera, uh, are beyond what we are used. So we need to, to face it, in a you know in a really efficient way on the i'm about to finish on the on the optimistic side i would say that we all i think we all think that crisis can be used for better i think our country's uh, crisis will be used for a better result uh, and i just wanted to uh, refer to a couple of little tips that I think are very important. One has to do, I think, what was Fana was saying. I think there's an important transition that, that we haven't mentioned here, and that it is the change of the housing unit, let's say, the family, the household. Uh, in countries like ours, for example, and I know in Europe also, the family has changed enormously. And it's a different thing what we, we are preparing today. We have, for example, with the pandemic, that was very clear. We had aged couples living together, one parent household with a child, uh, all sorts of, you know, it wasn't this sustainable unit. It was very difficult to be sustainable in those conditions. So we have to think what is the sustainable domestic unit? It's because what I'm meaning, I'm not saying that I'm going to change the household, but we do think to think, we do need to think of collaborative spaces, of 
maybe um, how do you call it collective spaces in in neighborhoods where people and it was done like that in many places that i know in in latin america people small families joined themselves and would share certain things so we have to think of the domestic unit not only as the family that's one thing the second of course is that digital gap digital gap today is even more important than it was uh, the poverty gap digital gap will leave whole groups of people out of the system third uh, I, I won't talk about the the 15 minute city i don't know but i do think that it's really important that we think of our cities as uh, with subcentralities we need to think them not as one you know center and a periphery but we do need to have this equipment all around if we want to be sustainable uh, fourth, I would say that the accessibility is basic in a city, in urban. Somebody was saying also that density isn't, you know, it's to be thought, it's to be rethought. It's not the end of density. And I do think, and that's my fifth point, that cities will go on. Cities will go on offering a set, several advantages for the innovation, for etc. But we need to have cities that promote and that house social interaction and in that sense we go back to the commons and i think the commons are really important we have to consider them so uh, i would also I, I think i'm out of time but i would also love to comment on the last thing that they were talking about this legal gap that you were talking about you know how to use the norms to enforce planification i think that's really an important part but i think i've talked too much so i may be in another in another round I didn't have a clock, so I don't know how much time I've been talking. Nice. Did you listen to me or not? Yes, yes we did. very we perfect. Thank you. Right, thank you. So, Shall we go on? Yes, please, okay. Paula. The, now, uh, the word to Philip, uh, head of Habitat Unit, who was with us also at the beginning, and actually also current head of the Institute of Architecture. Yeah, thank you, everybody. It was a great great last two days, very intensive, and I'm still digesting also the last um, round table, which I thought would have been a perfect way to end, um, but here you are. Um, um, I thought that um, my my remarks will complement very nicely to uh, Fana and uh, Margarita's. Um, I'm going to do it slightly differently because I think, well, my son is walking in. Okay. Um, every good academic exercise has um, ends with a disclaimer, right? Um, we know that we don't know, um, and uh, and there are some remarks on further research to be had. Um, I agree with everything that was being said uh, that draw general um, lessons and um, of crisis and also to frame uncertainty as a very urgent new, critical new contextual factor that we that we need to reckon with in the future more and more but I also think that the specificity of this crisis we are in right now the covid crisis um has very important insights and um lessons um, to offer that we shouldn't skip over um, there. And, and also we should be really, someone said it, you know, people expect us um, also to provide some certainties as much as we can um, in this moment of, of, of crisis. And I, I certainly do think that, um, you know, uh, medics, biologists, uh, politicians um, uh, cannot be trusted to do this work alone. And it requires in a sense, an interim transdisciplinary work program for research um, that this network uh, here is really suited to address um, on the relationship between public health, social natural disasters and cities. I know that COVID was not in the headline of uh, the conference. It was uncertainty, but COVID was the elephant in the room. So I think that this um, um, 
uh, research program. I, I took a lot of notes of the last uh, two days, and I think it's latently there. And maybe um, in my short rambling uh, towards the end, um, as the last speaker, which is also also always very unthankful, um, I, I would like to sharpen it a little bit more. First of all, I think um, following uh, Jimena's very first intervention, I think there is a lot um, uh, that we um, uh, we need to remember, you know, uh, epidemics and urbanism have been really intertwined. You know, epidemic urbanism, uh, the impact on social, spatial structures and materialities in cities is not new. Um, ev epidemics have always played a crucial role in the evolution also of modern urban planning and, um, and have been deeply uh, part of public health discourses, disease epidemiology and, and planning. These are all intertwined uh, discourses. We cannot think of um, spatial typologies that shape our cities, such as public parks, um, you know, without thinking about them being uh, lungs where urban residents can breathe clean and healthy air, as, as it was argued in the 19th century, or the ideal city paradigms of early modernity, uh, which were guided by paradigms of healthy, spacious, green garden cities, such as Ebenezer Howard's uh, garden city, uh, of course, um, uh, suburbanization processes, all kind of paradigms are somehow uh, latently uh, connected. And uh, I have a feeling that we as an urban community, or certainly I, um, had largely forgotten about that. And the crisis makes this very urgent. So we need to trace these historical genealogies and also current shifts, how they affect uh, green spaces, how they are intertwined in the way our cities are structured in terms of social spatial segregation, um, you know, I'm referring, of course, to urban segregation being very, very closely linked to epidemics. Quarantining, uh, separating the infectious from the healthy was an early practice of disease containment. Um, miasma theorists saw one solution to contain the spreading of noxious gases of industries of, by separating urban functions such as industry and housing, or colonial cities, of course, in Southeast Asia, Africa, were organized through cordon sanitaire. Um, hence combining hygienist ideas with racial, racial ideologies. So um, what type of responses um, now um, uh, begin to reshape our uh, cities, the urban structures, urban public spaces? I think there's a lot um, urgent, um, urgently to, to be observed, uh, to be vigilant. Um, and I'm talking here about very concrete architectural and planning responses that already take shape. So, this epidemic urbanism, I would call in maybe as one strand of this uh, work program, I think that we need to become much more experts on than we are at the moment. Second, um, the second strand I would call um, zoonotic um, urban zones. Um, zoonotic spillovers such as COVID are not a new phenomenon. We, you know, if you think of the plague in the Middle Ages, the cholera in the 19th century, but but we know that since the 1960s, the frequencies of such occurrences has dramatically risen. And uh, virologists and urbanists agree that a key factor driving this is the growing destruction of natural habitats and the, the forest exposure of wild animals uh, to human society caused by rapid urbanization and associated processes. And so we know about the interdependency of environmental conditions, biological dynamics, and cultural aspects of infectious disease transmission. Uh, but still, we have, I think, very little research on uh, urban aspects of epidemics, which seem to be central. We know that um, simply density is, is a vastly under complex um, model to explain the spread of diseases. We know that um, countryside often or uh, more loosely populated areas, peri urban zones have become much more uh, critical um, uh, centers for uh, the spread of the epidemic. And um, so this has challenged existing concepts of urban space and its governance, um, revealing that pathogens do not spread along pre-existing networks and orders. Um, and the multitude of other than human bodies and cities, especially animals and plants, play key roles in ecologies of disease. So, um, you know, these, uh, we need new ideas about living with nature and practices of conviviality. So we need to observe um, the city and the spaces um, um, as multi-species contact zones 
and really advance our understanding of cities and urban life as multi-species assemblages shaped by more than social forces and dynamics, by many other also non-human factors that we need to build in much more centrally into our research agendas. And the third strand, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm really saying that these were all latent um, in, in the many wonderful contributions that, that we, we listened to in the last two days. And the third um, point I think was mostly discussed, which relates to government and community responses to COVID. We know that um, cities are key arenas where medicines and microorganisms, modern and traditional values, scientific knowledge and popular beliefs are negotiated and um, articulated in various ways. And um, so we know that um, what is going on um, on one dimension is um, a vast uh, um, and, and, and uh, alarming amount of biosecurity interventions uh, but also uh, community responses. So um, Lauren Landau in his previous uh, response uh, or critique on the humanitarian ethos, the technocratic top-down ways in which things are um, implemented, securitization measures related to the epidemic are uh, implemented, lockdowns are organized. Um, and so we need to critique uh, these top-down forms of uh, government, uh, participatory governance geared towards educating, disciplining, and governing local populations. But also, um, secondly, I'm talking about these regimes of preparedness and policy circulation that were often referred to in, in many, many talks. And I think also there's a need to study historical genealogies and global circulations of these regimes of preparedness and response, um, unveiling all the idiosyncratic assumptions that are behind them. So let's bring to four these kind of historical continuities between the 19th century theories of warfare and current biosecurity measures. In the US context, for instance, the, the systems of preparedness were implemented during the Cold War in reaction to potential nuclear attacks. Uh, I myself growing up in East Germany, we had regular monthly um, uh, drills um, as school kids um, to prepare for such um, uh, disasters such as nuclear attacks as well. Or from the 1970s on in the Western world, the um, adapted to prepare and protect the population from natural disasters. In the meantime, this regime of preparedness has become a global paradigm shaping by security measures in many regions. Similarly, global urban policy institutions promote paradigms of instruments, paradigms and instruments to address the crises um, generated by epidemics. Since Ebola that uh, we witnessed recently, the World Bank has developed a pandemic emergency financing facility, while other multilateral institutions, um, some in, in cooperation with big corporates, develop finance instruments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But recently also other dwellers alliances, such as Habitat International Coalition or UCLG, enter the field promoting specific approaches to epidemic preparedness. And of course, all these local responses, the emergence of experimentation with new ideas and visions for the built environment, and public space and nature, et cetera. So these, I would argue, and I'll come to the conclusion very soon, these urban responses have not yet really undergone a systematic analysis and critical interrogation by professional academic fields um, actively engaged in the urban agena, uh, arena like this network. Uh, so we need to, document, systematize, contextualize more these responses currently taking shape in urban spaces across the world. Um, we need to analyze the ecological, social, infrastructural effects on urban life through a truly global comparative lens. And the key issue at stake is whether these urban responses are planned, built, and experienced as provisionary states of exception, I think, or whether they can form somehow a new post-pandemic urbanism and be part of a new thinking of critical preparedness for future uncertainties to come, of course. And there were many great concluding words by, by colleagues um, all afternoon on this. So which actor constellations, networks, and interest-driven alliances emerge at different scales through these responses? I, I think many people were asking, and what new paradigm disaster preparedness emerges from this COVID experience? And here, of course, in interrogating all this, um, the sensitizing concepts that this network and all of us have been discussed for, for years, such as 
co-production or decoloniality, um, also Marco's uh, rule breaking um, are very, very useful entry points to this work program. So Excellent. sorry, that was a bit uh, long and, and uh, intense, but I, I, I felt let's not generalize too much. Also, let's let's grab it by the by the balls. And, and COVID is new as a new experience. So let's really not forget to also really um, use that crisis to really um, update our knowledge and uh, interrogate it head on. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think. We could really continue along those lines. I also find it interesting how you know we we most of us works works qualitatively or, or, or works with spaces, but now the common discourse is about numbers, and it seems that uh, in an era when we we cannot believe media so much anymore, and when the scientists are not not very much respected, only the numbers in science are you know overtaking and, and dictating the the public health solutions. I mean, it's not not uncommon because this is public health. However, slowly people start to get get kind of experts by reading uh, what kind of vaccination works under which clinical trial. And I wonder where's the where's the space for the exactly the local knowledge that we are prizing and and uh, all the elements that we that we mentioned in this kind of not specialist and external look at, at the issues of science. But anyway, uh, that that uh, I, I'm not here to talk about that. I think it's it would be great still to have uh, input from. Uh, Marcelo and Ximena, uh, if if you would wish to add to the discussion or relate to to the whole conference, yes, please. Yeah, I think I will leave the last word to Ximena. It's much better than me to frame the whole thing. Um, well, first of all, I I really want. I already said something uh, con to congratulate with the three of you, most of all because you organized the whole thing. I think it was a really a great conference. Having said this, my dear friends, let's not panic, okay? Let's not panic. The city is there, has always been there, will always be there, thanks God. I've always been pro-urban, so let, remember, remember that. Um, what it's, it's of course everybody has its own perspectives and its approach. What I what I what I think we need to uh, think about is uh, uh, th this this pandemic. This pandemic has uh, uh, pushed. Uh, it seems to me. Well, no, it's not. It seems to me. It, it has raised a wave of, I would call, uh, localism. I think you understand what I mean. Uh, localism going, for instance, Margarita used a very interesting uh, wording, epidemic urbanism. The epidemic urbanism, I find it really good. The epidemic urbanism is goes hand in hand with, uh, if I understand it correctly, with community, you went all the way down to the family, if you want, but let's uh, the local. We have to rely much more on the uh, uh, small, the, the small space, the small community, uh, collaborative spaces, that, that kind of things. And this puts, it seems to me that this puts, um, raises, shows how there are uh, two horns of, of the issue, and, and the second horn will be taken up, I'm sure, by Jimena. But let's say the local and the interconnected, in a way. I wouldn't say the word, but in a way, we can go all the way up to the to the word. But let's let me stick for a while to the local. I'm, I'm really um, worried, in a way, by this. Uh, uh, again, I take it as a as a um, uh, key word, no, the 15 minutes city. Here in Milan, I already mentioned this uh, on the first yesterday, uh, and it's not only Milan, there's this policy, the 15 minutes city, meaning, you know, we all have to reach whatever it is, whatever it is within, uh, it must be within reaching in 15 minutes, which I understand perfectly well. 
understand perfectly well. The point is, from my point of view, is that the city is, uh, is something which works and is attractive, but works because it is an interconnect, it's a place of relationality, interconnectedness uh, uh, between differences, between diversity. If we stick to the 15 minute city to, 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 take, uh, to take it as, a, as an example, uh, this interconnectedness, this diversity, uh, which also means specialization, uh, uh, productivity, whatever you want to know, to, to, to say, you know, what I'm talking about uh, would, be, would be lost. Again, Margarita referred to subcentrality. And here comes the difference between uh, Europe, for instance, uh, and other parts of the world, uh, in, in Italy in particular, but in Europe, in Germany, in Spain, in France, uh, uh, we don't really have this problem of uh, huge, uh, very large cities uh, here where I live, I mean, even Milan, Milan is a, is a small city, it's not. Uh, so th this subcentrality already exists. But I'm worried about the idea of, you know, sort of looking at something more, more restricted, more closed, uh, even the um, mutual help. I understand it perfectly well, but I've been living in this building for 40 years now. I don't know anybody in the building, thanks God, I would say. And not everybody agrees with me, obviously, but I say thanks God. And I go out and, and, and um, you know, one, once I was walking outside and I saw one of these coffee machine uh, for, to, to make espresso coffee, you can buy uh, and make a fantastic espresso coffee at home. And I was about to buy it. And then I stopped and I said, hey, wait a minute. If I make espresso coffee at home, I don't go out any longer. I don't meet anybody else. Here in Milan, the new, some new um, expansions, very few, because the cities, uh, the cities in Italy are uh, shrinking in a way. But in some new, uh, but even, even uh, um, areas, um, compounds built uh, years ago, what are they doing with this? pandemic, they are putting some uh, condominium, um, how would I say, drug stores, meaning huge uh, fridge, freezers, uh, where they put uh, every morning they come and they put the, the food, even fresh food into this thing, so that people may not go out of the building itself buying the stuff with a card. Uh, it's, it's dramatic. For me, it's absolutely dramatic. So this, this local versus uh, um, uh, interconnectedness, if you want, uh, worries me uh, in a way. Um, so all these things which we have heard about very positively, uh, the, the, young, the young researchers who come to Nairo's conference and, and uh, uh, talk about their researches, um, almost all of them are in favor of community, local space, uh, local knowledge, that, that kind of things. Um, the 15 minutes, uh, um, I, I think this may, um, I am much more in favor of, of, of openness, uh, of uh, uh, you know, and not, not closing down. There's this trend, I see a trend of, of closing down. Uh, Philip was referring, it's different, but you are referring to what happened uh, after the previous, the past pandemics. And you mentioned, you mentioned uh, for instance, what happened in the colonial cities where, as you well know, uh, the, the French put the uh, uh, Ville Européenne in Abidjan on top of the plateau, 300 meters from the uh, indigenous city because the f malaria fly uh, could fly only 250 meters, I can't remember exactly, but that was the idea. And, uh, and, and the result of this was a terrible divide between 
spaces, right? So let's not panic, please. And 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 I I I understand, and I wouldn't oppose this 15-minute city, but I wouldn't spouse it. Uh, absolutely not. Cities, uh, cities, serendipity. City is, uh, you know, I move around and I uh, hit into Philippe I've never met before, and it's great to meet Philippe and not Mr. Rossi who lives next door to me and uh, who I see every every day. Uh, this is to make it a bit uh, anecdotic, but uh, you know, I hope you understand what I mean. In, and in all this, uh, but on that, I think there was a, a, quite a consensus. The role of government, of local government, as I as I wrote in the in the long post I, I put uh, during the, the round table, um, the local government has uh, has to to hold re the role of um, of steering, if you want, and steering to me means. Uh, and plan, urban planning to me means redistributing uh, resources. And by that, opening opportunities to as many people as possible. This is what uh, uh, urban planning has to do. And, and therefore, not really the 15 minute city. Yes, also, but not primarily, in my view. Thank you, Professor Largo. Ximena, would you like to conclude, please? Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, I need to say it's been a pleasure being with all of you today. And um, I'm quite impressed with the parts of the conference that I was able to follow. I do confess that I did not manage to follow the whole conference, because there are many conflicting um, demands on, on, on time these days. Um, and I just want to say um, a few words. I, I'm going to start by COVID. That seems to be the, the favorite subject uh, lately. Um, first of all, I would like to say that COVID has brought us as many uncertainties as um, all the other epidemics in history brought. Because what happens is when a new epidemic emerges for the first time, we, have, we don't have the faintest idea of how to deal with it. We don't have the faintest idea of what works and what doesn't work. Even today that we've had a whole year working with COVID or uh, stopping COVID, uh, the results are not uh, very uh, hardening. Um, there are places in Brazil where people after having COVID have become reinfected. So the fact that COVID, passing COVID provided an immunity is no longer so, which makes us also question the validity of uh, the vaccines, because if the vaccines were made for the first kind of immunity, then I don't know, I'm not a medical doctor, so um, I'm not uh, able to elaborate <laughs> much more on that. But there's one certainty about epidemics, uh, and uh, COVID uh, is no exception, is that the segregated city doesn't pay. As much as it makes some very rich uh, uh, and many suffer a lot, a segregated city does not pay. The, the part... Is that mine? Sorry, if it was mine, Sorry. Well, there's another meeting I should be uh, participating in right now, but I agreed with Paola that I would prefer to be here. Um, what was I saying? Well, this, about the segregated city. 
Um, take Madrid, for example. Uh, we do have squatter settlements in Madrid. Um, uh, for example, is the La Cañada Real, where babies have frozen to death this winter with this unusual cold spell. Um, and that um, congested uh, city hospitals because all babies of this quarter settlement were sick and had to go to, to hospital. Those that managed to get through the snow and the ice that the municipal government didn't know how to clear because we had never had such a big snowstorm in our lives. Um, so uh, not only did the squatter babies uh, congest the hospitals, but also because uh, squatter settlements, squatter families, because families squat on any available existing building possible, um, and uh, very low income uh, neighborhoods, uh, also um, impacted the whole of society with uh, contamination because contamination went rampant in these neighborhoods. And we, being a European country, have not managed to lower our rate ratios in our hospitals, in our, um, on our uh, UC beds, I don't know how you call them, um, uh, we have been the second worst country in Europe after Belgium. And right now it's Portugal that has become the second worst. So we do have terrible problems and terrible data that is worse than in many third world countries. Having said that, I think our worst uncertainties and our worst troubles are not coming from this little bug or virus called COVID, to simplify it because it has a lot larger uh, formula name. Uh, our worst problems are coming from the Davos gang, from the uh, European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, that are always devising ways on how to uh, benefit the trans transnational capital. And transnational capital in turn produces impacts in our cities so that we get the segregated cities. I elaborated on that a lot more in the inaugural uh, conference. So uh, COVID is not the worst source of uncertainty uh, right now. Um, another issue related to COVID is, mm -hmm. and also looking at my city, the city where I live, um, Madrid is a relatively young city. It expanded in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and um, everybody in Madrid has a hometown and it's a rural town. So first reaction of middle class was, I flee to the countryside, to my hometown. And there they were, they said, food is never going to uh, be missing. And um, I will have less opportunities of, uh, of uh, catching the virus. So I'll be happy there. All of a sudden, some of these rural towns started to have very high levels of contamination, very high levels of COVID contamination, and people didn't know what to do because they only had one little uh, sanitary office, maybe with an itinerary doctor that came around three times a week or maybe every morning if they were lucky and nothing else. So a, a COVID, um, a really sick COVID patient needs oxygen. And this little health office didn't have oxygen. 
So they all came running back to the city. And here they are um, desperate because they can't go out or they can't do what they want to do. So either way, whether in the city or whether in the countryside, people uh, cannot ex escape. And it's not, um, the issue is not supporting one or the other. It's both have to be supported. Why should country towns live with bad ill? And why should urban cities um, include or drive people into squatter settlements or into squatter flats? Okay, enough about COVID. I want to um, speak about something else. I want to speak about something that I heard in some of the uh, presentations of the students, which was this dichotomy between government action and local community action. And um, it tends to be that one takes the side of the weakest. So one tends to, to take the side of community action. I would say that government per se is not the bad guy in, in, in all this story. It all depends on the government's political project. Totally depends on the government's political project. Um, I spoke about my participation at the Allende government um, in, the, in the opening uh, conference. Uh, the Allende government believed in planning in a country who had never really planned. So we had planning at all levels, economic level, health level, and certainly urban level planning. And of course, being the Allende government, in the urban level planning was participatory planning when not even, when many other countries in the world, not even the advanced countries were doing it. That's where I learned to do participatory planning. That's where I learned how to work with communities. That's how I manage what is, uh, it's the other conference calling me. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't know how to put it off altogether. Anyway, um, that's how I managed to make a living when I first came in Spain, because I was an illegal worker. I was paid uh, exploitative salaries, but I was given jobs because I, was, I knew how to do participatory planning and I wanted to do participatory planning. For example, the first job I got was working with gypsies and no Spanish architect that were real gentlemen would even dream of getting near a gypsy. And I had no problem with the gypsy. I had a ball working with the gypsies. Anyway, so it depends absolutely with the political project of that government. Uh, later in Madrid, after I managed to legalize and, and, and to become a real architect, I even managed to um, revalidate my degree. I have a Spanish degree as well as a Chilean one now. Uh, it has been of totally of no use to me. But anyway, I did it because I thought it was my duty. Um, finally, in the early 80s, we managed to get in the first democratically elected socialist um, mayor in Madrid. And we did the, the, the most interesting urban planning project in the whole of Europe at that point. And we brought in advisors from all sorts of places. We brought in uh, Campos Benuti, uh, from Italy, we brought in Nuno Porta from uh, Portu Portugal. I and mean, people would have paid to work in that um, project. And of course, participatory planning. And there I was in the 
directive staff because I managed the subject so well. What we did was very interesting, guided by the mayor's objective that was to recover Madrid from its citizens, snatching it away from the real estate speculators. What a wonderful program to work with. Okay, so what we did, among many other things, is that um, the local government provided a fund that would fund communities to pay for any technical support they needed. So every community in Madrid had their own architect that would defend them or had their own consulting lawyer that would explain to them the limits of, um, of what they could do and the opportunities of what they could do. So that's, that was a, a very important uh, example, depending exclusively on the political orientation uh, of this uh, mayor. Um, then I went to New York also because of some other um, uncertainty and chaotic development outside of my control, I went to New York and there I worked with the first black mayor elected in New York City, Mayor Dinkins. And so what happened to me, I wound up by working in the uh, poor people's neighborhood, the South Bronx, um, um, Harlem, some parts of Brooklyn, and other parts of the city. And um, what we were doing is we, we were snatching the abandoned buildings away from their owners with very uh, interesting legal um, tools and um, giving them to their tenants. But at the same time, training the tenants on how to use a boiler, because New York can be very cold. Um, so boiler for the, water, for the water system, for the heating system. Um, how to um, call for um, their elevators to be repaired. Um, how to manage a building. So how to hold a democratic meeting, how to arrive in decisions, how to avoid conflict, how to have a bank account. We will, of course, wear the support behind each one of these bank accounts and how to handle a checkbook. So um, back to the origin of why I'm telling you all these stories is it all depends on the political orientation of the government. I mean, I, I think, sorry to interrupt, but I think we heard a gong. Yes, there's means a gong. that our technical, technical staff will also close the YouTube channel very oh, soon. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no problem. It's okay. Okay. Sorry. I also hear this. It's a very, very uh, interesting uh, input, but... Uh, I don't know if I have a few more words or not. I, I wanted to um, highlight what Ernesto Lopez said and what Horacio Torrent said, because in the case the government is against us, there are always cracks in the system. What was that? Okay. There are always cracks in the system. So our duty is to, to understand the system in order to be able to find those cracks. In the case of Lopez, um, they found, um, um, what was the crack they found? Uh, anyway, the, in the case of Torrent, they discovered that they could use um, building heritage laws to defend social housing, which is something uh, really crazy to, to imagine. Uh, okay. I, I can leave it at that and thank you a lot. It's been wonderful to be with you.
Thank you very much, Jimena. It was a pleasure to have you with us. And before that you leave, we would like to take a picture of all of us together. Exactly. Possible. So please, uh, comrades, uh, turn your camera on. Everybody. Uh, I will take, I will wait for these and take a screenshot. Yeah, I can see you coming up. Is everybody? Not yet. Yeah. Perfect. But while we, while we wait, let's, let's announce that, well, this is the kind of finish of the, of the main part of the conference, but we're still meeting tomorrow for the, for the book launch, for the presentation of research re report and research project, and then the annual meeting of Nairus. We start a bit later than we planned, so 9.20. And of course, everybody is welcomed and we hope, hope to, 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 to see you uh, there. And we will not be streaming the, the presentations on YouTube because it's uh, Saturday, so, so it will not work, but we will be here on, on, on Zoom at 9.20 tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Jakub. Say uncertainty. Uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. Green cheese. No, uncertainty is better. <laughs> I also promised you to, to send you some information that you can see today in the night to get a little bit closer to Berlin. So we found a, a webcam in different parts, which are installed in different parts in Berlin. So you can have a view to this. You can also stream our pop culture ex Berliner magazine, which is in English, so that you can see what we usually do <laughs> in Berlin with our kids uh, live that uh, one uh, Mr. Lübner opened up this uh, conference also. And somehow I hope, um, or that I see you once in Berlin, please. So we have somehow to repeat this and it might be marvelous to have you with us. So thank you very much. But the good thing about this pandemic situation is that we had people from, I don't know, so much different parts of the world. So we had 12 hours spent here in the sessions itself. And I think this is also a unique uh, opportunity to get so much knowledge here on board and um, yes, international knowledge, but also um, I would say knowledge, which um, I think it's, it's, we are very sensitive, I would say actually to, to, and very keen, how does it develop? And I think this is an, a beautiful moment to have this kind of opportunity, opportunity to have this exchange with you. So thank you very much. I am very thankful for this today. Thank you. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you, the organizers you. and also those who attended, but the organizers in particular. Great job. Thanks a lot. Behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, we also have to thank the whole team which is behind us. Absolutely. Yes, we, we have here a constant Skype mice saying something. So these are 10 people behind us from uh, from uh, the research project, uh, Kupu, DFK Kupu Ind, who's working with us. It's also uh, help us from the university, Peter Fischer, Arthur Schmock, who put this together, who are, is running also the YouTube. So there's a lot of people behind us and thank you very much for them. So I hope we can, I hope you also put you on screen, please. So maybe you can also present yourself so that we can also see you guys. With a conference behind the conference. <laughs> exactly. And I think we have to rescue this chat because this is also very lovely. <laughs> I will miss you. <laughs> I'm sending you the peak of that time. So thank you and see you tomorrow at the annual meeting of Nairis. Thank really you. wait you all there. Okay. Thank Later. you very much. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Become member. <laughs> Bye. Bye.